which just underlines the importance of the best possible utilization of time and resources we have in our hands. In the program today, we'll have a series of enlightening discussions from the esteemed, distinguished, revered personalities in the field of rheumatology, covering a wide range of topics from this ever-changing superspeciality. It is on occasion like this we get to learn and grow together. We look forward to get an exposure about what the best of brains think about various important and relevant topics in this very dynamic branch. I hope that all of you will have the eight most productive hours of interesting and stimulating discussions. I would like to extend my gratitude to Professor and Head of Department of Rheumatology, Dr. Uma Kumar, ma'am, who has been a key person in helping throughout to organize this event and for bringing together such great minds at one place. And as they say, great things happen when there is gathering of great minds. Despite all her commitments and engagements, Dr. Uma Ma'am has been able to bring the Department of Rheumatology at Ames Delhi to great heights with her undaunted and unwavering efforts. All her achievements are the result of high intention, sincere efforts, intelligent direction, skillful execution, and the vision to see obstacles as opportunities. The list of laurels is indeed endless that ma'am has achieved in such a short span of time, which is truly inspiring and influential. I would also especially like to thank all the distinguished rheumatolo rheumatologists who are on the faculty for today's update, for taking out time from their busy schedules, and for sharing their knowledge and wisdom. As we are celebrating April 2022, as Rheumatic Diseases Awareness Month, would like to kickstart the program with the first session on management of rheumatic diseases. May I please in, invite on stage Dr. Rohini Handa, sir, as a chairperson for the first session. Dr. Rohini Handa is a distinguished rheumatologist at Indraprastha Apollo Hospitals, New Delhi. He has 35 years of experience in rheumatology with him former uh, professor at Ames Delhi. He has published more than 330 review articles, book chapters, papers, and abstracts. Vice Dean of Indian College of Physicians and a life member of IRA Delhi and many more. He has received several awards, J.C. Patel and B.C. Mehta Prize, Dr. J.N. Berry Award, IRA Oration by IRA, etc. I would also like to invite Dr. Vaibhav Ingle, sir, Assistant Professor, Department of General Medicine at Ames, on the dais. Please take a seat. Uh, may I request Dr. Rahul Jain, sir, uh, also to kindly come and join the chairpersons on stage. He has been a member of EPLAR RA Treatment Recommendation Steering Committee 2013 for the management of RA. His areas of interest are systemic connective tissue disorders and very early spondyloarthritis. I would now like to request the first speaker of this session, Dr. MPS Shavla, sir, to please come on the stage. And would request the respective chairpersons on stage to introduce him. Thank you. Morning, friends and colleagues, and welcome to this opening session of the annual DRA Rheumatology Update. I think after a long spell of webinars, physical meetings such as this one go a long way in promoting not only the speciality but the camaraderie that we all missed with virtual meetings. Now, kick-starting this meeting is a stalwart, Dr. M.P.S. Chabla, who heads the Department of Medicine at RML Hospital. Without further ado, may I request Dr. Chabla to <coughs> start with his very apt lecture on the interface between rheumatology and physician. Over to you. Thank you, sir, for these kind words. And... Uh... When I first got this topic from Uma, 
I was not sure what I would speak. Basically, I am an internist, I am not a rheumatologist. And even I don't have a special interest in rheumatology. Right from COVID, everything, you know, as an internist, we have to face. So, but when I read the program and then I saw that uh, Professor Rohini Handa is one of the chairpersons, so I was relaxed. So, all the audience, if there is any question, ask him, not me. I have no conflict of interest to declare. So what is the importance of this topic? Why this has been chosen? You know, there is change in demographics because of the aging of the population, ever increasing environmental triggers of autoimmunity and dominance of non-communicable diseases over communicable diseases. Recently, there have been path-breaking discoveries and game-changing treatments. Cheating of rheumatology, I feel, is often marginalized in undergraduate and postgraduate medical curricula. So when these young doctors, they come out, you know, they are not trained, they are poorly uh, prepared to handle the cases with musculoskeletal problems, which are very common. A study carried out from 2004 to 2010 in India revealed that musculoskeletal pain was prevalent in 6.4 to 23.6% of the Indian population. The most prevalent rheumatic problems are non-specific musculoskeletal complaints, followed by soft tissue rheumatism. Inflammatory rheumatic diseases, they had a prevalence of less than 1% each. Rheumatoid arthritis, 0.34% to 0.67%. Undifferentiated inflammatory arthritis from 0.22 to 0.7. Spawned arthritis from 0.23 to 0.3%. And gout from 0.04% to 0.13%. Though so there is positive of data from our country, but still this is the latest one that we have showing that musculoskeletal complaints are very common in general population. So goals in rheumatology, they have changed. Now we are talking about early diagnosis, we are talking about tight control of joint inflammation, and we are talking, uh, talking about inducing remission in early cases of arthritis, and if not possible to induce complete remission, at least, you know, uh, ensure that there is a low disease activity. Now, a treat-to-target approach, that is what is preferred. Early and aggressive treatment with disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs initiated during the window of opportunity. Now, for example, rheumatoid arthritis is also classified as a time-critical illness, just like acute myocardial infarction, just like sepsis, just like stroke. So you need to assess response to treatment and review treatment plan. You aim for maximum improvement within, uh, say, first six months, and 80% of that improvement that should come within the three months. So inertia, which is there at the level of treating physicians, that has to be taken care of. You reassess, and if at three months, the goals that you had set, you are not achieving it, please review your treatment and add on further drugs. Control of functional consequences, and you need to prevent long-term harm. And then control of cardiovascular risk factors because of the prolonged and sustained uh, inflammation, which is responsible for 30 to 50% of the deaths. So is the role of physician limited as a gatekeeper? Is he just supposed to refer the patients to rheumatologists? No. He is supposed to assess the patient. He is supposed to initiate preliminary therapeutic intervention in the primary care setting before referral to rheumatologist because reaching Dr. Rohini Anda or Dr. Malvia or Dr. Shok Kumar is not an easy job. He is supposed to conduct key laboratory tests because it has been seen that if the patient comes for the first time to a rheumatologist, and if we have some baseline investigations, that does save the time for both the rheumatologist and the patient. Then he is instrumental in expediting the diagnosis and in early management of these cases. And he is supposed to coordinate with rheumatologist, which may ultimately lower disease burden and healthcare cost, which is the ultimate aim of each one of us. So musculoskeletal pain, first of all, you know, they have to be trained, they have to be told whether Look for it, whether it is a periarticular pain or whether it is an articular pain. If it is articular, is it non-inflammatory or is it inflammatory? Non-inflammatory, which are especially common in our country, osteoarthritis, hypothyroidism, anemias, high doses of statins that we are using so frequently nowadays. Then if it is inflammatory, you classify whether it is monoarthritis, oligoarthritis, or polyarthritis. Then articular pain usually is deep and diffuse. There is pain during both active and passive movement of the joint, and there is presence of associated factors like swelling, capitation, deformity, instability, locking, or contractures. 
Non-articular pain, there will always be a point of focal tenderness in areas adjacent to articular structure. It may radiate along the tendon, for example. There will be pain only during active movement of the joint, and physical findings may be present remote from the joint capsule. So if you are able to train them to differentiate between articular and non-articular pain, then probably osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia, they can be handled at the level of primary care position itself. Then they have to be taught how to differentiate what is the difference between arthralgia and arthritis. The key features that aid pattern recognition, the mode of onset, duration, number of joints involved, distribution, presence of extra-articular features, sequence of events. All these they have to be taken into account before reaching at a diagnosis. Now how do you recognize inflammation in joints? Frankly speaking, I am fascinated by two branches. Neurology and secondary neurology. Because 80% of the diagnosis you reach by taking a careful history. 15% by physical examination. And only 5% of the diagnosis, you know, that is what is done by relevant investigation, that to targeted investigations. So that is very important. So in the history, you ask for significant early morning stiffness, improving the activity. You ask if there is spontaneous fluctuation in disease activity, presence of constitutional symptoms, low-grade fever and night sweats and fatigue. Then in examination, you look for inflammation, and in labs, you have to do <coughs> acute inflammatory markers like ESR, CRP, platelets, and uh, normocytic normochromic anemia, so-called anemia of chronic disease. So as I told you, focused history is very important. You look for how many joints are uh, involved. Depending on that, you keep certain diagnosis in mind. Onset, pattern, additive, and migratory and intermittent. Just I'll give you an example. For example, any patient, especially in the childhood who's presenting to a physician, first diagnosis they keep in mind is that it is a rheumatic fever if he has pains. Because incidentally, he happens to have ASLO titles of more than 200 Todd units. So, but uh, the pattern that is additive or migratory is very important. Migratory, some joints will be involved, then new joints will be involved, but the, there will be resolution of symptoms in the earlier joints. Whereas, for example, in juvenile uh, GRIA, it will be additive. That is, joints are involved in implied arthritis, joints are involved, then new joints are involved. Then there are erosions, there are deformities. Then activity effect, what is there on the joint distribution, whether it is symmetrical or symmetrical. If there is systemic or extra-articular symptoms present, this is one more indication. If a physician is not able to make out, explain these extra-articular symptoms, probably he should refer such a patient to a rheumatologist. Then monoarthritis, some of the common causes of septic arthritis, tuberculosis, gout and other crystal deposition diseases, spawned arthritis to begin with, then monoarticular onset of a polyarticular disease. In fact, monoarticular, the dictum is you, uh, until unless it is proved otherwise, treat it as a septic arthritis. Oligoarthritis, gout is a common example, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, psoriasis, spawned arthritis, and polyarthritis, you are all aware, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, lupus, systemic sclerosis, adult onset, Hill's disease, IBD, and uh, polyarticular gout is not unknown, especially in elderly patients. So again, differentiation between inflammatory and non-inflammatory arthritis. Inflammatory arthritis, examples of rheumatoid arthritis, spawned arthritis, lupus. In these cases, morning stiffness will be there for more than 30 minutes. There will be pain aggravation on even on resting the joint. Spontaneous flares are common and acute phase reactants, they will be increased. Whereas non-inflammatory arthritis, for example, in osteoarthritis, hypothyroidism, morning stiffness will be less than 30 minutes. Pain will be more on moving the joint. Flares are uncommon, and acute phase reactants, they will be normal. These pattern onsets telling you what kind of disease it is, all of you are aware of it. One more uh, advice I'll give you to the internist, especially keep a nail paint remover in your office always, because these uh, specially connected tissue diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, they are more common in young females. They will come to you with this. You have to do oxygen saturation, so you need to remove the nail polish. Then you have to see the nail changes, for example, in psoriasis. Or you have to do nail fold capillaroscopy. Always keep, uh, because they are not carrying it with them. The stick will be there, but this will not be there. So similarly, examination of hand is very important. For example, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, typically involving rest, proximal interpharyngeal joints. They're still interpharyngeal joints, especially involved in osteoarthritis, the nodular form, a burden that we are talking about is uncommon in Indian context. Reactive arthritis and psoriasis. 
Rectilitis is another important thing that will help you in finding out what kind of disease it is. So sometimes you come across patients who have joint pains associated with fever. Keep in mind lupus, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, infective endocarditis, rheumatic fever, various vasculitis, and adult onset till disease. A patient is coming to you with a Reynolds phenomena and rheumatic condition. Keep in mind systemic sclerosis, which is a commonest cause. Mixed connective tissue disease, lupus, Sjogren's, rheumatoid arthritis, cryoglobulinemias, rheumatomyositis, and antiphospholipid syndrome. Now, lab investigations which are advised, acute phase reactant, CSR, and CRP, autoantibodies. Again, remember, you have to use autoantibodies very carefully because, as I told you, 95% of the time, you will be able to uh, reach your diagnosis by history and focused general examination. And you have to do these uh, autoantibody profiles only to, you know, confirm your diagnosis. Rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP, ANAs, which are now called as anti-cellular antibodies rather than anti-nuclear antibodies, NCAS, HLA, especially HLA-B27, synovial fluid, and X-rays of the relevant parts. Now, if, you know, this is a common fallacy, rheumatoid factor is positive, patient is having joint pain, straight diagnosis that is made by physicians is rheumatoid arthritis. So we must keep in mind that positive rheumatoid factor is also associated with elderly people, other chronic inflammatory rheumatic diseases, primary Sjogren's, mixed hyoglobinemia, lupus, then certain infections like infective endocarditis, tuberculosis, viral hepatitis, and some conditions like sarcoidosis, autoimmune hepatitis, they can all lead to positive rheumatoid factors. So rheumatoid factor positive does not mean rheumatoid arthritis. Similarly, AN is another test that we are using. The method of choice is indirect immunofluorescence. ELISA, we are not recommending because there are limited antigens that are picked up by it. And with the use of um, um, these newer epithelial cells, HAP2, now it is virtually unknown that uh, ANA negative lupus, it is virtually unknown. So some of the autoimmune diseases in which uh, ANA is positive, lupus in 99% of the cases, systemic sclerosis in 90%, Sjogren's in 90%, mixed connective tissue diseases in almost 100% of the cases. Then inflammatory myositis, rheumatoid, osseoarticular GIA, they can all have this. Now, non-rheumatic diseases where you can find positive ANAs, autoimmune hepatitis, ambibillary cirrhosis, myasthenia, infectious mononucleosis, and in fact, 5% of the healthy young women. Infections, they can lead to transient positivity. For example, in post-COVID patients, they're coming to up Many of them, they are, you know, found to have ANA positive. And finally, drugs like procanamide, hydralazine, penicillamine, isoniazid, and NDTNF drugs. Then, you know, if another common mistake that is done is that ANA is negative and people are altering extended nuclear antigen profile. That is something which should be avoided because this is, uh, our country is very much, you know, resources are very important. So only if ANA is positive, then only you go in for ENA profile. If you have high clinical suspicion, then, for example, uh, you know, various types of subtypes are there, anti-Smith, that is specific, or anti-DS, DNA, they can even be used to monitor the disease. Otherwise, ANA or rheumatoid factor you have done once, there is no point in uh, repeating them. Though in a long standing case of uh, lupus, ultimately ANA does become negative, but there is no point in getting these tests repeated again and again. So, Again, to uh, synovial joint uh, fluid examination, most of these, you know, other acytic peritoneal fluid, what we are doing, that is usually not uh, required for joint fluid analysis. You need to just do about the cell counts and see how many of uh, uh, cells are neutrophils. For example, non-inflammatory, the cell count will be from 200 to 2,000, and less than 50% will be neutrophil. Whereas inflammatory, it will be more than 2,000 up to 30,000, Two to 10 WBC per high power field and more than 50% will be neutrophils. Whereas in a septic arthritis, there will be more than one lakh cells and more than 90% neutrophil. Rest of the, all these things, you know, that we used to do earlier, that is no longer relevant. This is good enough, gram staining and culture. PCR also is not that helpful unless there is a, you're thinking about a particular diagnosis. Now, this is uh, basically I see the uh, stalwart of uh, rheumatologist sitting here. My just uh, only point to show this slide is that now even, you know, we earlier used to say for rheumatoid arthritis that more than six weeks of 
duration is that is required. But now even that criteria has been taken off. All these domains and you give particular scores and if it is more than six by 10, you diagnose it as rheumatoid arthritis. So that is the importance of early diagnosis and early intervention that is very important. So, uh, you know, we do ex uh, uh, advise radiographic imaging in low back pain. Some of the fallacies that are committed are, for example, majority of patients with non-specific back pain, they will have normal X-ray. There is something known as clinical radiological discordance. For example, patients, they will be having impressive radiological abnormalities, but may be totally asymptomatic. On the other hand, the patient will not give you any symptoms and he's having marked uh, radiological changes. Nearly 60% of patients with radiographic evidence of lumbar disc degeneration are asymptomatic. So you have to keep in mind what diagnosis you are thinking about. For example, if you're thinking about spondylitis, you get MRI spine. Most of the patients you will find evidence of disc disease. And uh, you know, every physician is very comfortable. This is disc disease and that is it. They do not, you have to advise them to focus on sacroiliac joints. And even plain x-rays are good enough. Plain x-ray of pelvis is good enough to diagnose if the you know, sacroiliac joint is already involved. Similarly, there are certain pitfalls in diagnosis and treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, which I have already told you, basing the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis on serology without clinical correlation, frequently repeating rheumatoid factor, suboptimally utilizing physiotherapy and occupational therapy services, underdosing of methotrexate, injudicious use of corticosteroids, and delaying treatment escalations in face of a flare. You know, rapid de-escalation rather than it should be gradual and escalation has to be rapid. Now, methotrexate, I think this is one drug that uh, uh, internists or physicians, they have to be made aware of how to use it because this is the only drug that has been shown to reduce mortality in rheumatoid arthritis, not even biologics, they don't reduce mortality. Yes, they do reduce radiographic progression, but mortality advantage is always present with methotrexate. So it is the anchor DMARD4 RA, and we must remember these are the doses which are anti-inflammatory doses, which are quite safe from 7.5 milligram to 25 milligram. If the dose is more than 15 milligram, you break it into two doses. If there is a nausea, you may use an antiemetic. In patients, it's subtopnimal relief to oral methotrexate. Subcutaneous methotrexate may be used. And uh, it must be stopped three months before planning pregnancy. Earlier, there was a concept of a cumulative total dose. But now it is clear that there is no concept and you can continue to use it indefinitely. Of course, you have to follow up and do the relevant test. So corticosteroids, they are often misused. So what is their place? They are used as a bridge therapy, especially for the earlier eight weeks or so, when initiating or switching uh, conventional synthetic DMRDs for the treatment of rheumatoid flares, for extra-articular rheumatoid disease like rheumatoid vasculitis, mononeuritis multiplex, ILD. Low dose of 7.5 milligram or less can be used in patients with refractory RA to maintain quality of life. And pregnancy and lactation, remember this is one of the safe options that is there with you. Then intra-articular corticosteroids, especially if there is oligoarticular involvement. So biologics, if uh, you have a doubt in mind that this particular patient requires biologics, I think it is better to refer to a rheumatologist. So patients who are having aggressive disease with poor prognostic factors, for example, high titers of autoantibodies, high disease activity, and you see there are early erosions. These patients will really require early institution of biologics, and they should be uh, referred to a rheumatologist. Similarly, intolerance to adverse effects, or the patient is not tolerating uh, conventional synthetic DMARDs, and special situations like corneal melt, rheumatoid vasculitis, some patients is RA, ILD. That is, uh, these are the conditions where you would like to initiate biologics early. This is another common uh, you know, complaint that we come across. In fact, low back ache is responsible for 50% of the big four of uh, rheumatology, these conditions that you've seen in this. But fortunately, let us remember that more than 90% of the cases, they are mechanical, non-specific, back sprain, herniated disc, osteoarthritis, spinal cord stenosis, these are the causes. Systemic inflammatory conditions contribute to less than 10% of these. So how to differentiate inflammatory from mechanical low back pain? If mechanical low back pain is there, for example, in a herniated disc, it onset may be acute. It can be seen at any age, especially with, uh, you know, even in younger population in this age group when we are sitting for prolonged periods of time. Rest will uh, improve mechanical pain. 
precipitate it will be precipitated by strenuous tasks for example wait list acute phase reactants will be normal and other features for example buttock pain rib pain uvi taste peripheral arthritis will be absent whereas if it is inflammatory then usually it will be in sedosin onset patient will be young more likely to be male so it is not uncommon in females rest will worsen the pain patient will usually get up in the night walk around and then will feel better there are no precipitating factors acute phase reactants are increased and other features extra articular features can be present in these cases so when to suspect a serious disease as a cause of low back pain presence of following signs we were weight loss patient uh, pain with recumbency especially on lying down nocturnal pain morning stiffness lying for more than 1 hour localized pain bone pain visceral pain abdominal pain age more than 50 if there is a previous history of cancer especially if there is sphincter incontinence and if there is neurological deficit these are the cases that need to be investigated further uh, can i ask you dr chavla to wind up yes sir only last one or two slides that's it so another common you know thing that is hla b27 is advised very uh, frequently we have to keep it in mind that 6% of especially north indians they are uh, positive for hla b27 out of them only 10% they are the ones who develop disease so it is the follow up is important and sacroiliitis i was already told you is very important so one uh, uh, gout also we are commonly coming across a certain myths that hyperuricemia gout is not so remember crystal identification is the gold standard primary utility of serum urate is monitoring response to treatment just like for diabetes you use hva1c you use serum uric acid for of this levels may fluctuate during uh, acute attacks and it can cause all it mono oligo polyarthritis there is no we need to give some yes. time for discussion definitely sir give me just this is last slide so urate lowering therapy has to be continued drugs you must be careful which are the drugs that are causing uh, hyperuricemia thank you so much for your patient here thank you very much for giving a bird's eye view of the specialty and uh, i have a few comments the first thing that he pointed out was that if you look at the community non specific complaints top the list but by no stretch of imagination should non specific be equal to non significant non specific means that you are not able to pinpoint whether it is rheumatoid or spond arthritis or a disc disease but from a patient perspective it is not trivial so this is one of the important things the second thing is that as he said rheumatic diseases don't announce their arrival the patient would more often than not first present to the internist and the role of the internist is extremely important in picking up the disease early you need to connect the dots and i think there are three important things that uh one would uh perhaps say that the internist can do one is early detection referrals are needed only if there is a multi system disease where you are anticipating multi organ involvement requires multi parametric assessment and you are contemplating biological and it's a symbiotic relationship the patient can then go back to the physician so the physician can be the first port of call with occasional inputs from the rheumatologist refractory diseases will surely need greater inputs from the rheumatologist so it's not one to the exclusion of the other and as he said it's the uh, team working together and there is energy in this synergy now comments from the house uh, can we have an il mic which would be easier please identify yourself i am dr vk gautam an orthopedic surgeon and uh, very often i do come monoarticular arthritis in my practice and sometimes there is a confusion whether it is a septic arthritis or even a pyogenic so the cell count cut off values i think i want a little more elaboration on that because when we do a synovial cell count your cut off was 30000 and uh, more than 50000 was infection of course we have to consider many other criteria 
But uh, most of the books do not uh, consider this 30,000 to 50,000, but the many literature says that up to 50,000 is also inflammatory. So I'm not saying that this is the ultimate. There are many other things, but uh, what is your view on the cell count for this purpose? Uh, that's what I want to ask you. So usually if you're suspecting septic arthritis, cell counts may be as high as one lakh. And in fact, if it be polymorphs, more than 90%, they'll be polymorphs. And then, Ultimately, it is your clinical suspicion. If you are suspecting that you have a focus and you are thinking that it is septic arthritis, you treat even if cell counts are, say, uh, 40,000, 50,000. Sensitive test. In situations when there is a monoarticular arthritis and you are really thinking whether it is an inflammatory disease or an infective disease, even before the gram stay in a quick leukocyte estrays, I think I rely it's quite significantly for this being biogenic. Very well taken, Professor Gautam. You are an clinician. I think all inflamed fluids would be intensely cellular. And this cutoff of 2000 for osteoarthritis, I'm not very sure that if there is an inflammation on osteoarthritis, whether the counts will not go up. The reliance is on advanced techniques like cultures or trying to do, you know, gene expert on body fluid. And you have to put everything in totality. I would not be stuck up only on one numerical value. The situation lies in the fact that if it is acute arthritis, septic arthritis, particularly in infancy, it is an urgency to decompress that joint. We can't even wait for the culture report. So the joint will be destroyed because most of it is cartilaginous and we have to have something quick to decide. Even a negative arthrotomy, I would say, is not a... This is what I would say. Very... And in reactive arthritis, actually it's called a pseudoseptic. You just cannot make out whether it is active. Very well taken. Other comments? Yes, Professor Malvia. I think it would be rest of time if we have an aisle mic rather than this being where the aisle mic could be placed here you know it's easier rather than trying to hand over sir yes. okay um my take at uh, infective arthritis is very straightforward if you ever diagnose infection in a joint you will have to ask yourself why am i diagnosing infection infection does not occur in the joints you will be surprised to hear that from me God has made joints so safe, it doesn't get infected, unless there is a reason. So when you diagnose infection, you will have to give a reason. One of the common reasons is people get very busy when everyone else is sleeping in areas that have red lights. There are other reasons, like extreme emaciation or extremes of age or underlying damaged joint already existing. Therefore, de novo, sepsis in a joint is more often spondyloarthritis or a typical presentation of rheumatoid or gout. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now we need to wind up this session and please join me in a big hand to our opening batsman. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for an informative discussion. It will be a privilege for me to invite on stage our next speaker, Dr. A.N. Malviya, sir, the well-known, the most celebrated. Uh, uh, I would request the chairpersons to please introduce him, though he needs no introduction. Good morning, all. It's a real privilege to invite such a stalwart and a senior clinician. Uh, probably he needs no introduction. Pro Professor Anand N. Malviya is a revered rheumatologist and clinician, not only in India as well as worldwide. Uh, he's a founder member of IIS, one of the earliest members of IRA. Uh, he has discovered low-dose methotrexate for treatment of systemic autoimmune diseases, the recipient of several ICMR awards, uh, trained more than 50 students and several chapters in 
API medicine. I would like to invite him again. And, uh, thank you, sir. Dear persons, uh, sir, one moment. I cannot let this opportunity pass without saying one liner introduction for my guru. The story of Indian rheumatology starts and ends with Professor Malviya. Thank the you. Floor is yours. Thank sir. you. The very dear persons, very nostalgic feeling to be back at my Karam Bhumi. On this stage, uh, I can say 50-50. 50% 50, 50, uh, 50 I gave talks and lectures and CPCs. The other 50% I used to sing. I used to be a singer. And Aja Sanam Madhur Chandni Meham, I sang as a duet with Dr. Prem Chopra right here. So I remember those days when I spent my time here. Without wasting any further time, when I am in difficulty in understanding a subject, so I try to understand and then teach it. That's the best way to learn a subject. Teach it to the students. You will also learn about it. Long ago in D2 ward, a young lupus patient was admitted and she had acute dyspnea. And I was rather perplexed. Why is she having dyspnea? Her heart was okay. She was unable to even talk. And then I went back along with my, all the uh, MD students and we found out that pulmonary hypertension is one of the important considerations in a patient who comes with dyspnea, especially in systemic lupus. And since then, I have liked to teach and learn more and more over a period of time as the new drugs are being found for the treatment of this disease. So, during the next 15 minutes or so, I will try to cover this. Rather difficult, but I will really try to make it very simple. So pulmonary hypertension is the broad term, but I'm going to localize on pulmonary arterial hypertension, and I will explain it to you in a moment. I have no disclosures for this talk, and I will like you people to remember, I sh may sh maybe she is here, Sandhya Ulukul, one of the brightest young rheumatologists working at St. Stephen. Two years ago, she gave a talk on pulmonary hypertension, extensive in-depth talk meant for cardiologists and physicians. So using her talk as the background, and she was kind enough to give me the link for that. It's on YouTube, it's available. Um, then in, in my own way of thinking about pulmonary hypertension, I have made these slides, which I will share with you. My approach is for a busy rheumatologist in an extremely overcrowded OPD like Sanjeev Kapoor's at Indian Spinal, and he's right there. So this is the crucial slide. And the, Okay. Now, very simple pulmonary circuit. Everyone knows right heart, uh, then pulmonary arteries, the lung, then pulmonary veins, left heart, and then the systemic circuit from inferior vena cava and superior vena cava to the right heart and back to lung. Now, we can divide pulmonary hypertension very easily in the WHO groups. Group one, that is the area that we are interested in. Almost entirely, I'm going to talk about this area because the diseases, systemic immunoinflammatory rheumatic diseases that we deal with, they affect the pulmonary arteries and arterioles, and that pulmonary arterial hypertension I'm interested in. The second one, of course, is for the cardiologist. It's right there. The left heart, the left heart diseases, when they put back pressure, the pulmonary artery uh, pressure goes up, but that goes primarily to cardiologists, and I'm not going to discuss that, except one passing reference to one disease that we have, might be interested in. And then we have group three, because many of the systemic immunoinflammatory rheumatic diseases also involve lungs. And the, because lungs are involved, that is the third type of of pulmonary hypertension due to chronic lung disease, like interstitial lung disease, but more often uh, 
bronchiectasis, chronic carpal pulmonale, and other things. So group three primarily goes to pulmonologists, but there is a subgroup of interstitial lung disease that we handle, but in them, the major problem is interstitial lung disease related issues. But if you look for that, pulmonary hypertension may also be associated with that. But leave aside group two, three, and the fourth one is the showers of pulmonary embolus or microthrombi from the rest of the body entering the right heart through superior or mainly inferior vena cava due to DVT in the legs or in the pulmonary, uh, in the pelvis area. That is also not of our interest except one disease, if antiphospholipid syndrome, antibodies are positive, look for showers of microthrombi and that may be causing pulmonary hypertension. So I'm back to group one and type one majority remains idiopathic for the general physicians. But for us, our all those conditions that we deal, uh, systemic lupus, systemic sclerosis, and others related diseases, we are dealing with group one, which affects the uh, arteries and arterioles of the pulmonary circuit. And it is shown clearly in group one here. There are other conditions also that can involve the group one pulmonary artery and their arterioles, but let us stick to the diseases that we are dealing with. And that, good. And this one is the one that we are interested in. Forget about pre-capillary and post-capillary and don't confuse yourself. Just let us uh, look for this. There are many other causes also that I will not be discussing. And so out of hypertension in this circuit, which could be here, which uh, it, uh, see the uh, background is so yeah, yeah. bright that <laughs> anyway later. you can see group one, group two, group three, or group four. Uh, let us go to group one, which is called among the uh, the broad spectrum pulmonary hypertension. This is group one pulmonary arterial hypertension. That's our area of interest. There is a group five, which I will not be discussing. Rare diseases cause not known mechanism, under, not understood. So group one is the one that we are interested in. In group two, that is left heart, only one disease, myocarditis. So forget about it. To even diagnose myocarditis in our diseases, we have to take the help of cardiologists. Group three is the commonest interstitial lung disease, but the pulmonary hypertension there, we are not interested. If you treat interstitial lung disease well, pulmonary hypertension also improves. The group four, the showers of microthrombi, antiphospholipid is the only one of our interest. Do a, a VQ scan and you can make a diagnosis and you start treating. So let us now go to pulmonary arterial hypertension, pulmonary artery and arterioles. And when the patient comes with dyspnea in our clinic, what and how clinically we say, is it interstitial lung disease or is it pulmonary hypertension? Because these are the two common causes of presentation of patients with, in, with systemic immunoinflammatory diseases in our clinic with dyspnea. Only two conditions. And then we have to take our, the help of our cardiology colleagues to establish pulmonary hypertension. And I will not worry about this slide because this is meant for cardiologists who do right heart cath. So forget about it. Look at this. I will like to hear from them that on doing right heart cath, Dr. Malvia, your patient has pulmonary pressure which is equal or more than 20 millimeters of mercury. Here we go. We got it. This patient has pulmonary arterial hypertension, and this is gold standard for diagnosing pulmonary arterial hypertension, not eco, even eco Doppler does not correctly estimate uh, the, the pulmonary hypertension as estimated by right heart cat. And the cutoff point used to be 25, 
now it is 20. Remember, anything above 20, we have to pay attention to the patient because the lifespan will be cut short if we don't catch early and treat appropriately. Method of measuring pulmonary arterial health. It's a right heart cat. But once you have made the diagnosis, in the follow-up, you can use echocardiography um, with Doppler. They can give you some estimate whether you are on the right path, patient is or is not improving. But if you want to change the medicine, that it seems that the patient is not responding, and you are going to change the medicine, again, you will have to take the help of cardiologist for right heart cath to tell you precisely whether the pulmonary hypertension has gone up or has gone down, and then you decide on changing, adding, subtracting the drugs for treatment of pulmonary hypertension, arterial hypertension. Now, the workup. Let us see the patient comes to the ward. One of them says, I'm dyspneic, but in addition, patient has hacking cough, and when you put your stethoscope at the basis of the lung, there is velco crepitation. Everyone will make the diagnosis, straightforward interstitial lung disease. And what will you do? You will do the usual pulmonary function test. You will do a chest radiograph, and you will then confirm with high resolution CT. And you will say, this is ILD. And I'm not, not going to discuss that, because ILD may have pH, but we don't treat that separately. We basically treat ILD. So th this patient had dry, dry hacking cough with dyspnea, not pulmonary art arterial hypertension. Diagnosis, most likely ILD. The next patient is dyspneic. Not having cough, no other reason for dyspnea that we can find out. But on examination, there is accentuated P2. Very much indicative that is it possible that the patient is very sick? Young lady doctor from Jaipur, three weeks ago came. I can't breathe, doctor. I have been diagnosed lupus. Oh, God. All the cardiologists, right heart cath must be done to see what is the pulmonary hypertension level. But to cut the long story short, she had severe pulmonary hypertension. We have advised her what is to be done. Accentuated P2, then we will not do echocardiography. We will go straight to the cardiologist. You can do ECG and echo and suspect. But finally, give me the exact answer by right heart cath. And if you are doing right heart cath, please give a little bit of nitric oxide also to see whether it is reversible. Why? Because if the pulmonary circuit can get dilated, you can give calcium channel blockers for immediate relief. But the majority of those where there is a proliferation of a smooth muscle and narrowing of the lumen of pulmonary artery and artery dole, there will not be reversibility with nitric oxide. And if you have that, that is the type of patient who needs now treatment that I'm going to discuss in the next five minutes. Dilatation test with nitric oxide negative. This is, we need real pulmonary vasodilators, which will change the, the structure of the pulmonary arterioles where smooth muscle proliferation has increased and lumen has gone down. We have to reverse that process. So, Number two is the, the, prime, the left heart. We will not bother. We will send them. They don't come to us anyway. They go to cardiologists. Chronic thromboembolic, majority of them will go to vascular surgeons, except pulmonary, uh, uh, um, the antiphospholipid syndrome. If that is there, we will have to then go back to cardiologists and find out and do Q, VQ scan to see whether it is showers of emboli. And none of the above, I don't deal with that. So here is a patient who has been now proven she came with dyspnea. I didn't find any velco crepitations, and she had no, um, no cough. What she had was only dyspnea, and her diagnosis was lupus. And when I examined her, her P2 was accentuated. I suspected pulmonary hypertension. I sent her to cardiologist. They did ECG, and there's right heart, uh, right axis deviation, right heart dilated. And the echo confirms that there is some uh, pulmonary hypertension. But I insisted upon left uh, right heart catheterization to know the exact millimeters of mercury, how much is the pulmonary hypertension? It was 35. That is really bad. And she needed treatment. How to choose the drugs? There are so many of them and so many classes of them. Let us see. There are three major classes, 
and five groups of drugs. Endothelin pathway is the one, nitric oxide is the second one, and prostacycline is the third major group. And this slide is taken from a very famous paper in Nature Review Cardiology. And we suppress the endothelin pathway, and I won't go in detail because these are receptors. Endothel endothelin is produced by endothelial cells. It goes and occupies the receptor A and B, and we can stop that combination of endothelin with its receptor using drugs that are already mentioned. If it is selective only acting with uh, receptor A, it is ambicentan. If it's a dual active, we have bosentan, which we cannot use because of liver toxicity. And uh, mesentan is the more uh, superior one because it is a dual activity. It is uh, blocking both uh, receptor A as well as B. So these are the drugs that are available to us, three drugs within this class, and we can choose any one of them. And then we go to the next one. Here is a soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator. And we will like to stimulate it even further so that the vasodilatation reaches its full um, capacity. And on the other side, phosphodiesterase 5 is the enzyme that, that um, needs to be suppressed so that it doesn't cause constriction. So first group of drug, you suppress. Second, you stimulate. Third, you suppress. And the fourth group is the prostacycline analogs or now we have um, um, agonists. So you can stimulate that one. So we have basically three groups of drug and five different categories of drug. This is a nice slide, but I have not used it. Similarly, you can make your own slide using this one, which is the superior, but I had already made the previous slide. So now we have prostacycline pathway stimulator, uh, antagonists, and nitric oxide. So we have now endothelin receptor antagonists, and nitric oxide. In prostacycline pathway, now we have um, receptor antagonist, selexipav, the first oral drug in the group of prostacycline pathway. So instead of giving intravenous, we can use oral in the first category of prostacycline pathway. In the um, endothelin receptor antagonist, we have three drugs and we can choose among them. And then in the last one, nitric oxide, uh, PD-5 uh, inhibitors are the one which is available, the older one, sildenafil, and now tadalafil is much more popular. So these are the drugs, but now already I have given the name of five, six, seven drugs. How to choose which combination, which patient, how to categorize, that will be next two or three sides. Which one and how to choose them. And here comes what we call assess the risk of the patient and then choose the drug or drug combination. And what are the tools that are available to us to stratify patients? The lowest patient, up to 5% chance of death within one year. We don't really have to treat. You treat the underlying disease, the patient recovers. But if it is more than 10% chance of death within the first one year, then we have to immediately start treatment. And in some of them, it's an emergency, and intravenous drugs will be needed. Risk assessment tools. The old one is the WHO one, which I will show you. The, the more recent one is Reveal 2. But the latest after 2021 is the one which we are using in our clinic now. It is non-invasive, simple to perform in the OPD. And I will show you that. Here is the WHO, no limited activity, slight limitation, marked limitation, severe limitation. The last two marked and severe need immediate treatment. The last red one needs emer emergency treatment with intravenous drug. Now, this is the reveal registry. By the way, the previous one uh, was used in the famous ambition trial, nine, uh, 2015, published in New England Journal of Medicine, which gave us the two drugs, which are the biggest selling drug in the world at that time. But now, they, we have superseded that. And I will be using reveal registry. And here you have these items listed there, plus minus, you go to get the, the total sum, add six, and you get certain figure. And that figure will tell you what is the risk. 10-year risk will be de uh, decided on that based upon this. So if the score is zero to six, don't worry, treat the underlying disease. More than seven intermediate risk, you can be slow. You can give oral drugs. 
you don't have to admit an emergency and give intravenous drugs. But if it's seven or uh, nine or more, you will have to admit that patient and start alprostadil or one of the uh, prostacycline analogs uh, in ICU. This is the one we are using now in the OPD. Non-invasive, functional class, systolic BP, heart rate, six minute walk distance, a brain natriuretic hormone level, and renal parameter. These three things, these six things, will give you figures like this. And if the score is between one and five, don't worry. Treat the underlying disease. More than six, start the oral treatment. More than eight, you go for, sorry. More than eight, admit the patient uh, in ICU and start intravenous alprostadil or one of the prostacycline analogs. So the initial treatment based upon the intermediate or severe risk, this is the 2000, uh, sorry, the <laughs> typographical error. This 2015 famous paper, I'm sure most of you have read. Uh, this paper was really so-called Hahakari paper. Uh, the, this combination of Tadalafil and Ambrisentan, even the drug companies have made a com combination uh, tablet, which many of you have used on your patients. And this is widely being used and re highly recommended. However, now we are in 2022 and things have changed. These are Griffon study and Triton study. Both of them, they say that is old, that will keep on killing the patients despite dual drugs. And thus we have now high risk and reveal trial. Although it said that you use only two drugs, now triple drug has become the norm. And from today onwards, if you have an intermediate risk patient, you will have to start them in mesitentan or pedal edema, though, DOC guat, plus selexipad. Triple drug therapy is now the norm to control intermediate pulmonary hypertension in your patients with systemic immunoinflammatory disease. Um, this is the way you can mark them because the time is over. So in the olden days, the red one, uh, the, the uh, green one, two were used, but now we will shift over to the three in red color and combine them to start three. I have given all the um, references also. Remember, never prescribe more than one drug within the same group, and these are the three major groups shown there already. This is for the fellows and uh, those who are in uh, DM and DNB. To remember the drug and how to give them, I don't remember. I always check with that, so I will not go in detail. In conclusion, um, endothelin pathway, nitric oxide pathway, and prostaglandin pathway, all the three should be suppressed or stimulated, as the mechanism is, to get the sufficient control, that is factory control, or pulmonary hypertension, and save death. These are the references, and thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, can I start with uh, one of my own queries? And then it will be open for questions. So just I wanted to ask you, when should the when should we refer the patient for RHC? Is the doubt which all that remains? Excuse right heart death. Yes, sir. I will do it the moment I wish to confirm the diagnosis to start treatment. I already mentioned that. So at the time of starting the treatment, you have to be sure. Because recently we saw a doctor Okay, I'm walking, laughing, very nice. He said, I have high, high pulmonary hypertension. I said, rubbish. Uh, no, no, my uh, echocardiogram has shown. We got the uh, right heart cath and Kapoor knows the detail. There was nothing. The pulmonary pressure was normal. So please, always before you start treatment or make a diagnosis, you must request a cardiologist to do right heart cath. There's no alternative to that. Right heart cath only in follow-up for... Uh, a rough idea whether I'm on the right path or not. And again, if the drug is failing and you want to see whether really drug is failing, you will have to do right heart cath to see the pulmonary pressure. Yes, sir. Kapoor Saab is my teacher in this area and he told me, yeah, Messi Tantan se bohat thing hoti hai, aap kyun lehi? Sir, excellent talk. He is really my guru. 
No, sir. Uh, excellent talk, sir. I mean, uh, as we have discussed also, like, I mean, the fifth category, that is the idiopathic sarcoidosis. We have seen few cases of sarcoidosis where idiopathic pulmonary hypertension was diagnosed. Yeah, Kapoor, you say what yeah. happened. Why I didn't, uh, uh, it was shortage of time. Was yeah, there. yes, sir. But I, I think sarcoid involving pulmonary, I will refrain treating them because I'm a rheumatologist. I would like to treat sarcoid with joint disease. But you are right, in case by chance any patient comes, I will ask the pulmonologist to please get involved and then treat along with it. Second thing is that in most of the our cases, I mean it is in 40 to 50 percent of patients, it is the ILD with uh, pulmonary arterial sure, yeah. dual. Sure. Because dermatomyositis and scleroderma are the two where pH is also there and they, so we have to combine the two t uh, modalities that is uh, basically DIPIN or I MDIPIN. Mean, uh, I mean if you are thinking that the treatment of the disease is not achieving the ideal uh, outcome, you may definitely go for at least uh, do the um, Doppler echo to get some idea and then if it shows something, go ahead. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. This is the oil mind. Are Chaturvedi ji. Doctor means, uh, is the right heart cat? I don't know who are the cardiologists sitting here. They are so busy in doing the NGO. Hardly anybody agrees for right heart attack. So, Indian is so, final. so Our what to do? Our really said, Sir, if you say that, we will do it at that A few points. One is that, as Dr. Kapoor said, uh, sarcoidosis as a cause of pulmonary hypertension is now the leading cause of death in sarcoidosis and not ILD any longer. So we must recognize that. Second is that, as you said, ECHO is a very, very unreliable tool. We must not only depend on ECHO, it can both underestimate and overestimate. The third important thing is that when we are treating pulmonary hypertension, there has to be very little scope for tolerability. We have to treat very aggressively and we have to treat to target. Now, let me tell you what is the target. The target is an NYHA class 2, a six-minute walk distance of at least 400 meters. Unfortunately, the Griffin trial has now shown that even NYHA class 2 is not good enough because in, uh, the patients who were in NYHA class 2, almost 40% of them ended up with hospitalization. So it's very important to understand that a very rigid control over NYHA, six-minute walk distance is very important. What we utilize is the Australia Scleroderma Interest Group, the ASIG algorithm, which is very simple. Look at the FEC-DLCO ratio. If your FEC is less than 70% and the FEC-DLCO ratio is more than 1.8, then you're dealing with uh, uh, a suspected pH. And if your anti-proBNP is more than 210 picograms per ml. You are absolutely... So, you say, they, I mentioned this. In reveal, um, light two, it mentioned six minute walk time. And in our hospital, we have the measured thing and we keep doing it all the time. Uh, in addition, um, systolic BP, heart rate, and brain naturalistic hormone. If you can do that in between, and Kapoor really does this exactly as the, such, it is slightly better than WHO class, which was recommended in the past. And I think we cannot use it now that we have better instruments. Sir, I wish we could have listened listen one hour to you. Uh, sir, two questions. Uh, first, any role of immunosuppression in isolated pH in case of chronic disease? Second, I, let me answer that. I have not read any paper, but uh, I think Pradeep, uh, Prasandeep Rath has some. So, only one role of immunosuppressive in pulmonary artery hypertension, and that is lupus. And we have the paper from NIMS by Dr. Lisa. So we have a series of patients who have used cyclophosphamide in these patients because, uh, because we believe that it's not just simple intimal fibrosis, unlike scleroderma where it doesn't have a role. But in lupus, you probably have a small vessel vasculitis going on. Uh -huh. But in scleroderma and any other disease, there's no role of immunosuppressive. However, if you look at the Farrow study, it showed that those patients who were on microphenolate mofetil surprisingly had less pulmonary hypertension as compared to those who are not. So the Faro study reflects, but there's not been any study to suggest that micro, we know microfilament has anti-fibrotic action as well, but it's to be seen whether it really helps. But as of now, other than lupus pH, there is no role of immunosuppression. Really, really, first, the remodeling of the, um, the no, arterioles. No, but in lupus, there is a small vessel vasculitis. So NIMS has produced a series of lupus okay. pH where we have used... I mean, I was not aware of that because it's a remodeling is the issue. And whether that will act as remodeling. That I used in lupus, sir. Uh, patient was referred for lung transplant. pH was 100. And now last visit, her pH was 30. So, so I use MMF. Second question, sir. Uh, uh, any chances of developing pulmonary edema with IV prostacycline? 
have seen one actually yes so the key is that if you develop pulmonary edema when you are giving a process cycling these patients have pulmonary veno occlusive disease pvod so the key of picking up pvod and pvod is a great mimicker of pah uh, the way to pick up PV, uh, pvod is when you start giving them vasodilators they start developing pulmonary edema that group four you are talking Uh, sir, uh, as you said, that of course, uh, gold standard is uh, right heart catheterization. But as Dr. Rath has said, that if that uh, pulmonary function test is showing uh, FVC, DLC ratio more than 1.8, patient pro BNP is significantly raised, and the patient is having features of right heart failure, NYHA classification three or four, then what to do in those cases? Where <laughs> I uh, tell you, we have all known that right heart cath has been a problem. And we all use these parameters and somehow have been managing. But over a period of time with better drugs available with high efficacy, I think now we have to insist with our cardiologists and convince them that they have to help our patients. That is now our uh, stand. Unfortunately, we have a very cooperative cardiologist who's helping. Uh, unfortunately, uh, to overcome this problem, Dinesh Khanna and we made an algorithm for India minus the right heart cath. Unfortunately, that has not been published for various reasons, but we made a very nice algorithm. I'll send it to you. For Indian standards, where uh, the recommendation is that to repeat an echo twice from two different people because of the subjectivity, to do the nt pro BNP, and based on that, minus the right heart cath, whom to treat, whom to not treat, and where to do a right heart cath. So a lot of patients can still be treated even without doing a right heart cath. Only a selected sub few would need a right heart cath. I'll send that. that uh, great, I'll uh, send. Let it get published also. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, giving me this splint, splint uh, lending, and revealing talk on this difficult Thank you. Features can make this. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much, sir, for such an informative and enlightening talk. Uh, moving forward to the next session of today's program, uh, which is on drug review in immune-mediated rheumatic disorders. Uh, we have chosen the two most frequently used biologicals, JAK inhibitors and rituximab, for today's discussion, which are being used left and right in various autoimmune diseases these days. Uh, markets are flooded with the various manufacturers pitching in, resulting in reduction of costs of these drugs. The discussion is directed to get more clarity on the issues like efficacy, safety, when to use and when not to use. So may I request the first chairperson of the session, Dr. Priyanka Kharbanda Vam, to please uh, come on the stage. Uh, she's a senior consultant at Portis Shalimar Bagh, has various national and international uh, Publications to her credit, been a winner of APLA 2010 scholarship as well. It will be my pleasure to invite on stage Dr. Sovik Das Gupta, sir, to chair this session along with uh, uh, Dr. Priyanka Kharbanda. He is currently working as a consultant rheumatologist at, at Yashoda Super Speciality Hospital, Koshambi. He's been a senior resident in rheumatology department at Ames as well. He has numerous publications in his various journals, wrote various book chapters. Now may I please invite the speaker of upcoming talk on Jack and inhibitors, Dr. Samir Gulati, sir, on stage. And I would request the chairpersons to kindly introduce him. I welcome Dr. Samir Gulati. He is professor in uh, VM's uh, Medical College and uh, Sardarjan Hospital. He has uh, 15 years of experience in rheumatology and critical care medicine. And he is a certified uh, EOLAS course in rheumatic diseases and musculoskeletal ultrasound. He is also the member of editorial board of national and international journals. Over to you, sir. He has many publications in books and international and national journals. 
thank you so much, ma'am, for the kind words. Uh, uh, a very good morning uh, for the to the respected dignitaries on the dais, uh, my respected seniors, my colleagues, and dear friends. The topic that has been assigned to me is to take you through the evidence-based uh, review on the emerging uh, data on safety uh, on jack inhibitors, uh, particularly for the uh, tofacitinib and baricitinib. So as it was uh, rightly introduced that uh, this particular, particular group of drugs had created a lot of uh, uh, excitement amongst the uh, rheumatologists and the patients alike because of the oral drugs, they could be used easily and uh, everybody was looking forward for it. And uh, it, it was in 2012 that uh, FDA uh, uh, gave uh, uh, approval for the drug and we have almost come 10, ten years far from the approval that was initially granted for 5 milligram twice a day uh, tofacitinib for rheumatoid arthritis. Subsequently, it has received uh, approval for various other uh, rheumatic diseases as well, uh, such as psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, and there are now uh, fairly advanced trials going on uh, as far as SLE is concerned, and uh, even for scleroderma and uh, for large vessel vasculitis. So uh, have these the initial excitement caused so the, uh, the initial excitement caused by the uh, uh, very good efficacy of these drugs, has, does that still remain uh, given the safety data that, uh, that exists now over 10 years? Has the safety data now changed over the 10 years or not? So please permit me to take you through that journey. So uh, because the very fact that it, it, it was efficacious because it was blocking the JAK inhibitors uh, has now is, is, uh, is the reason uh, for the safety concerns for this drug. Fortunately for us, most of the events are non-serious and ranges from nasopharyngitis, upper respiratory tract infections, headache, nausea, uh, diarrhea. Uh, but then there are concerns regarding infectious complications, uh, such as uh, severe infections, viral infections. Out of that, herpes, zoster virus stands out and has been the concern for, for all of us. Tuberculosis especially for a country like ours, where the baseline tuberculosis risk is so much, and then the fungal infection. Malignancies cannot be forgotten, and that stands uh, very solidly amongst the uh, expected complications for the JAK inhibitors. The cardiovascular complications, namely thrombotic and thromboembolism uh, thrombo episodes, and the lipid disorders, cardiovascular uh, disorders in uh, cardio, uh, the atherovascular sclerotic disorders in particular, had also created concern amongst uh, for this group of drugs in the initial uh, data that was presented at the FDA before its approval in 2012. So I will just take you through these evidence as of now, and then uh, we can decide for ourselves that uh, how safe these drugs are. What was the evidence trail? Well, the uh, evidence trail ranged from the initial uh, JAK inhibitor development program, which, which included the phase one, two, three uh, randomized control trials, the data that was generated out of that, uh, the safety data, and then it was followed up uh, uh, by the observational studies, which ranged from the, uh, 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 like the cohorts like the US health plans, market scan, US corona uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, registry, uh, and also the long-term extension studies, which were, which were continued from uh, for uh, uh, the patients who were initially included in the randomized control trial. And the recently published oral surveillance trial, uh, which was published in the uh, uh, very important uh, journal of repute, that is New England Journal of Medicine, uh, in this year only, that gave us a very good insights as far as the malignancy and the cardiovascular complications are concerned. So quickly, let me begin with the infectious complications, namely the herpes zoster. So, before we, uh, I'll take you through the uh, uh, the data of the herpes zoster, uh, uh, like the various incidence rates and the uh, standardized uh, ratios. Uh, it is very important for us to understand what is the baseline risk of herpes zoster in the general population per se, and then in the rheumatoid arthritis group. So as far as the general uh, population is concerned, the uh, it is uh, perceived that approximately one third of the general population will develop herpes zoster in their lifetime, the annual incidence rate being somewhere between 0.4 to 1.1 per 100 patient years. And especially the uh, risk group is belongs to the age group of 50 to 80 years, and the highest rates were seen in, in women. A approximately 10% of these patients will develop post herpetic neuralgia. When we, when we talk about rheumatoid arthritis, there is an added, there is an, uh, they are obviously uh, have a higher risk of herpes zoster, and uh, that might be two to three fold higher. 
and uh, that simply being that might be related to the activity of disease or the uh, immunosuppression that these group of patients are subjected to. When we add the risk of the oral glucocorticoids or the uh, DMARDs or the TNF alpha antagonists, then but obviously the risk increases additionally by about 1.5 to two fold higher. Uh, and the biologicals, uh, like the TNF alpha, amongst the TNF alpha antagonists, uh, it is perceived that there are difference existed between monoclonal antibodies and the eternal uh, but the studies have been shown a mixed result in that. To answer the, uh, the demographics of the tofacitinib and herpes roster, uh, it, this was looked up and uh, uh, Winthrop et al. then collated all the studies, phase one, two, three, and the long-term long extension studies, and then uh, which included about 4,789 participants. Uh, they were more, mostly, there were 239 episodes of uh, tofacitinib associated herpes zoster. Most of them were females. The median age uh, was uh, ranged from 57 years. The incidence rate that we see here, uh, the total incidence rate was around uh, 4.31 for uh, tofacitinib overall, which in comparison to the uh, TNF inhibitor uh, adalumab, was, uh, which had an uh, incidence rate of 2.81, is definitely on a higher side. And uh, uh, like uh, also, uh, this also showed that amongst the two groups, that is 5 milligram and 10 milligram of tofacitinib, the incidence rate was almost, uh, almost similar. However, a sub-analysis in the same study showed that Initially, in the first three months of the treatment, the difference rate amongst the dose groups may differ, and uh, it may be as high as 5.2 in the 10 milligram BID group, uh, uh, as compared to 2.1 in the 5 milligram BID group. There were differences in the regional wise also, and uh, the higher uh, incidence rates were seen in the Asian countries, uh, the highest seen in Japan and Korea, and India was not far behind with an incidence rate of 8.9. Fortunately, the severity of herpes zoster infections was not of the concern here. Most of the cases were not multidermatomal. Only one case, that is 0.4%, was multidermatomal. And there were no viscerally disseminated disease or death. And only a few handful of patients were hospitalized or they received, or received intravenous antiviral drugs. When the, uh, uh, the uh, re regression analysis was uh, done, then the uh, important factors which stood apart were just the age and uh, the regional uh, difference, that is the Asian, Asians were more prone to get herpes zoster in comparison to the Western uh, population. When we talk about uh, the additional risk uh, conferred due to the addition of glucocorticoids or uh, the DMARDs, I would like to point out here that the uh, odds of 0.56 in groups having tofacitinib 5 milligram BID without DMARDs or without glucocorticoids rises tenfold times in a group which has a tofacitinib 10 milligram BID with DMARDs and glucocorticoids. So definitely there was a difference uh, when there was an either the group, uh, either the dose of the tofacitinib increased from 5 to 10 or the uh, there was addition they were given along with the, uh, uh, the DMARDs or the glucocorticoids. The risk increased almost tenfold times. Now, the, the thing that we uh, like uh, have understood so far is that in presence of any infection, the demurs should be stopped. But strangely enough, when these all these studies were collated and their sub-analysis sub was carried out, the, most of these patients either continued taking uh, demurs, uh, namely the tofacitinib, or the dose was decreased. And it was found that the outcomes uh, vis a -vis the time to resolution of the uh, skin leak of the herpes zoster was not very much of concern. So there was not much difference between the groups uh, which either continued the drug, they stopped it, or they uh, uh, like decreased the dose. But the very important takeaway point here is that more, all of them, almost all of them, were on antivirals. So if they're on antivirals, the results were very good, and the time resolution was not very much different, both in the rheumatoid arthritis group as well as in the psoriatic arthritis group. As far as baricitinib is concerned for the herpes zoster, the, uh, since baricitinib received uh, approval only in the year 2017, so we do not have much of long-term extension studies here, but when the phase one, two, three studies uh, were collated and uh, with a total of uh, 3,492 patients, the incident rate came out to be around 3.3 per 100 patient years with 170 events. And uh, fortunately, even in, with herpes zoster, with baricitinib, 
uh, there uh, like there was not much of uh, multi dermatomal involvement or much of visceral disseminated herpes zoster reported so there were not very serious cases of herpes zoster even with baricitinib more data is being collected and probably they will all, they will uh, shed more light to it coming to tuberculosis now tuberculosis is a infection which causes which uh, i mean raises our concern amongst all of us amongst the internists among rheumatologists for the patients alike because of a very high baseline uh, prevalence rate of tuberculosis in our country and uh, so and the tofacitinib per se also uh, by virtue of the basic uh, sciences uh, uh, hypothesis uh, it's it's very much possible uh, biologically plausible that to, uh, that tuberculosis can occur because of the of the concurrent administration of tofacitinib because uh, it reduces the containment promotes bacterial replication inhibits both the adaptive and innate immunity and it can increase the baseline risk of 5 to 10% uh, uh, risk of uh, ltbi rea reactivation uh, to a higher percentage so what does the data show the data uh, when we looked into the uh, uh, like the studies and uh, did a meta analysis then the jack inhibitors versus placebo the odds ratio was to the tune of 2.66 so definitely tofacitinib was increasing the incidence rate of uh, of tuberculosis in the population and when it was compared with other biological drugs the incidence rate of jack inhibitor of about 0.2 lies somewhere in between that of the uh, tnf inhibitors which are on a higher side uh, the average being somewhere around 0 0.3 0 0.47 to 0 0.35 uh, and and on a lower side we had tocilizumab, tocilizumab with an incidence rate of 0.08 so uh, the risk of having uh, tuberculosis with tofacitinib uh, was somewhere in between the risk of the other uh, commonly used biologicals that we use in our clinical practice right now uh, uh, the meta analysis study also showed that amongst all the opportunistic infections tuberculosis was the most common uh, opportunistic infection and uh, the and most importantly what i want to stress here is that the median time between drug start and diagnosis was 64 weeks to about 9 month and what does it show it shows that the concern here is not the ltbi reactivation on the other hand it is the uh, uh, primary infection that uh, that causes the tubercular infection with ltbi but Another point that I want to stress here is that mostly this is the Western data. In our population, it might be a little different. Similarly to the herpes zoster, the higher risk of tuberculosis was found in regions with high background TB. And uh, in higher regions, the uh, incidence rate was about 0.75, in the low about 0 0.02. Uh, the meta-analysis also confirmed that the 10 milligram dose at a higher risk of uh, causing tuberculosis as com in comparison to a lower dose of about 5 mg uh, with an odds ratio of about 7.39. What was very heartening was that uh, whichever uh, patients of LTBI that were screened uh, before initiating tofacitinib, uh, they responded very well to isoniazide and tofacitinib uh, therapy and almost none developed active TB in this group. So it is recommended that screening for patients for LTBI before initiation of uh, tofacinib should be carried on and that can reduce the risk of uh, active tuberculosis by about 90 patients and 90% uh, sorry and uh, these patients uh, should then be monitored uh, like uh, 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 serially uh, at least once a year. So whoever uh, tests negative for LTBI they should then be serially monitored. Another very important thing that we should realize here is that amongst the various uh, regimens that are available to us to treat the LTBI, rifampicin should not be uh, selected because rifampicin, drug-drug uh, interaction exists between rifampicin and tofacitinib and there can be 80% reduction in bioavailability bio of tofacitinib and we might fail to control the, uh, the activity of the disease. And failing to control the activity of disease is not a very good option available to us because that can then complicate various other matters. Periodic liver functioning should be conducted during this therapy because uh, tofacitinib and isoniazide both can uh, like cause uh, uh, problems in the LFTs. Coming to malignancy, the baseline risk of patients with rheumatoid arthritis, the overall risk is not very high with pooled uh, standardized incident, incident ratios of about 1.09. But I would like to uh, point out here that the risk of lymphoma is towards the higher side in these category of patients for obvious reasons, which ranges, uh, which the absolute one is 2.46, for Hodgkin's 3.21, and for non-Hodgkin's is 2.26.
So definitely that is on a higher side in comparison to the general population in the group that is rheumatoid arthritis. So even in the arthritis advisory committee when the data was presented, the incidence rate increased from the first six months to after uh, uh, six months from 0 0.79 to 1.93, indicating that obviously the incubation period for malignancy is more, so shorter duration uh, studies will fail to pick up the, uh, uh, the development of malignancies and what we need is long-term extension studies and longer surveillance data to make, uh, to conclude effectively in this. The, uh, the, the overall uh, risk incident rate of, uh, of, uh, malign uh, of uh, uh, this malignancies with uh, tofacitib was around 0 0.94 which was comparable with other biological drugs. And there was a certain difference between uh, the two doses of tofacitinib between five milligram and 10 milligram. So that uh, difference seemed to be uh, uh, like significant between the doses as well. The meta-analysis, when we looked into the meta-analysis, the, amongst the demographics, the most common cancer was lung cancer, followed by breast cancer, lymphoma, gastric cancers, non-melanoma skin cancers, gy gynecological malignancies, prostate cancer. All of these were documented in the cohort of patients uh, who were receiving tofacitinib, the most common being lung cancer. But now this particular table is summarizing the standard incident ratios of these malignancies in rheumatoid arthritis patients who were receiving tofacitinib. And what we uh, like notice here is that the uh, standardized incident ratios are not very much different from those of the uh, baseline RA population. So what I mean to say here is that though the risk of malignancy is on a higher side in group of patients who were receiving tofacitinib in rheumatoid arthritis, they are not very much different from the patients of rheumatoid arthritis who were receiving either biologicals, other DMERDs, or they were not receiving anything. So the risk was almost comparable. As far as baricitinib is also concerned, since we do not have long duration studies, uh, so uh, at data pertaining to only 973 cases, there are just two reported cases of non-melanoma uh, skin cancers. And uh, so far, no patients have been uh, reported for solid tumors, but it is too early to make any conclusion in this. And probably the data which is being collected uh, uh, in the surveillance studies will shed more light onto this particular question that, we, that might arise in our minds. Now, this was a landmark study, oral surveillance study, which got published in NEGM this very much year. And this showed that the base, that the risk with tofacitinib was definitely higher than uh, the, uh, uh, the anti-TNF uh, uh, TNF inhibitor drugs. So uh, the hazard ratio which they reported was to the tune of about uh, 1.48 for the combined doses and almost similar hazard ratio for the two, do to the two doses, 5 milligram and 10 milligram doses. So the diff, uh, like this particular study hence still puts a question mark that whether tofacitinib is safer uh, when we compare it with anti-TNF inhibitor and probably that red flag still remains and we have to be on a watch out and collect more data to answer this particular question. Coming lastly, coming to the cardiovascular protection, uh, this the initial uh, like. Uh, Belief was that uh, tofacitinib might give protection to uh, uh, the cardiovascular protection because of its uh, property to reduce systemic inflammation. And uh, certain studies also confirmed that there was a decrease in CIMT. And also, though there was increase in uh, all the components of cholesterol, the predictors of CV events, that is TC by HDL ratio, uh, remained unchanged because both total cholesterol and HDL increased. So with that in mind, the data from all the uh, registries were collected and the data was extracted for about four to five years uh, uh, time period. And it was found that all the major adverse cardiac events, the diff there was not much of difference between the, when we gi were giving tofacitinib or we were giving biologicals. Similarly, with uh, episodes of venous thromboembolism, DVT, and pulmonary embolism, there was no much difference was found when the data from the uh, US Corona Registry was evaluated for these uh, uh, like outcomes. Even the meta-analysis surprisingly showed so that there was no risk of this talk. just so two, two minutes. Now. So there was no more risk of cardiovascular events with tofacitinib. In fact, surprisingly, they showed that there was a better outcome with 10 milligram of tofacitinib. So why was this difference coming on? This was because probably the incubation period to develop cardiovascular disease was not good enough, was, was more, and it was not getting picked up by the RCTs. 
and rightly so the study a3921 133 then pointed out that definitely there was a difference between 10 mg and 5 mg doses and there were more cardiovascular events with 10 mg doses and hence the black box warning came up in the year 2019 consequent to it again the researchers went back and collected data more of data from the observational studies as far and as well as from the rcts clubbed together all possible observational studies were picked up in this particular study and then also there was no difference was found out between the incidence rate between the uh, like uh, in the in the occurrence of cardiovascular events with tofacitinib but what came out very beautifully here was that when they stratified the data further in the sub analysis and then they found out that the patients with cardiovascular risk factors were more likely to experience thrombo thromboembolic events than those without and the incident rates in patients with risk factors were very low in patients who had lower risk factors so this particular thing uh, stood out and this was again highlighted in the oral surveillance study which got published in just now and uh, this study was by and large a non a non inferiority ra random con randomized controls trial and as i pointed out uh, with reference to the malignancies other than malignancies they also found out that the risk of major adverse cardiac events were more in tofacitinib when compared with the anti tnf agents so uh, to summarize what i mean to say is that probably the red flag still remains and we have to be on look lookout as far as the malignancies and the cardiovascular events are concerned and probably continue our surveillance program and meanwhile uh, what has been suggested by fda and ema seems to be good enough that is these drugs should be started only in patients who fail to do well in the in our preliminary uh, choice of uh, conventional synthetic dimers and should be started only in patients after screening them out for the cardiovascular and the venous thromboembolism risk factors so we should screen them and only start them on only those patients who do not have these risk factors so uh, i'll just skip that uh, tofacitinib and baricitinib there is not much so of difference we like to keep some time for discussion also yeah. yeah so to summarize the uh, yes tofacitinib is a very safe drug and uh, uh, we can like it has it is a very promising thing being oral uh, it has uh, we have come so far uh, for 10 years we have been using it and uh, most common reported adverse events are non serious but i with the recent red flags which has been raised by the oral surveillance study we should uh, uh, be a little bit cautious and use them in patients uh, who do not do very well with uh, the uh, conventional synthetic dimers after carefully uh, ruling out the underlying risk factors We'll take one or two questions. Only one comment. Thank you so much for bringing up that tuberculosis thing in Tofa City. I think this is exactly what I was discussing with Doctor Huma. Uh, in one of the Iracon meetings, we had this discussion, and one of the rheumatologists from the south said, "Well, why, why, why should we do latent TB screening?" So please understand, just because a drug is cheap does not mean it is safe. Latent TB screening must be done, and as you've shown, the odds ratio is so high in a Western population. In our country, it would be perhaps, perhaps even more. And we have seen tuberculosis in my patients of tofu. Thank you. Take a the question. I have a comment. The prevalence of latent tuberculosis in our country is forty percent, if not more. So every person you screen. the chances are four out of your 10 patients bio eligible patients or targeted treatment eligible patients would be latent tb positive and that is the surest way of turning them away from uh rheumatologist to alternative medicine because they start believing ki aapki dawa se hame tb ho gayi hai and i am not very sure we need to have a multidisciplinary meeting for this with a high background of 40% i mean who should be screened how they should be screened and how they should be treated and the frequency of screening i mean it's a matter of debate but uh, the first thing people say is that they it's very difficult to explain to them that latent tuberculosis is not tuberculosis and now i've started telling them that 40% people will be positive so don't get surprised the art of medicine and the science is different but uh, let me talk just about the science today art is i agree there may be compulsions when you are practicing 
But the logic is that we must give them, and if 44% are positive, then 40% receive the prophylaxis. That's why if you look at the Australia uh, Rheumatology Association guidelines for latent TB, they clearly uh, 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 treat based on the risk factors. And any patient coming from South Asian country is a high risk. So already they are on. Because the risk to benefit ratio has to be seen. The data also, sir, the, the very fact that uh, uh, patients who were treated for LTB, I did very well. Uh, so that is very encouraging. So uh, I think the take-home message for all of us here is that the screening for LTBI has to be done. And if they come positive, they should be treated with INH in this particular instant for nine months. And the tofacitin can be started after four weeks of uh, INH. And then, uh, I mean, they, are, they can have very good results. And we should not forget about the uh, risk factors from the patient's perspective also. So like alcohol, malnutrition, and all those things should also be figured in and factored in. Thank you, sir, for covering the infectious complications. Could you please shed light on the interaction of tofacinato with hepatitis B as well? For example, with herpes zoster and TB, latent TB, we know. But there has been significant with hepatitis B as well, with some reactivations being reported. Yeah. If you could so, uh, thank you very much for that question. I did not include it primarily in my talk because of the time factor. India, definitely, there is a high prevalence of hepatitis B, and that remains our concern. And before starting tofacitinib, the workup that needs to be done is to uh, rule out the viral infection, chronic viral infections as well. So we will be doing hepatitis B uh, surface antigens. But uh, and if they are positive, they should be treated uh, for the hepatitis B for four weeks, at least two to four weeks before initiating tofacitinib. And the therapy for hepatitis B should be there for at least six months after stopping tofacitinib. So that much uh, like uh, precaution we have to take. One very important thing that we should uh, uh, realize here is that the data shows that even the carriers, that is, I'm talking about the group where, who are surface antigen negative, who are core uh, like positive, and have a demonstra demonstrable uh, hepatitis B virus DNA, they should also be treated because they also, uh, it, the data documents that they can also get reactivation of the virus. Dr. Gulati, how long can we give Thank it? Thank you so much, sir. We can take questions during the lunchtime. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for an elaborative discussion. Uh, before moving uh, further, I would just request kindly to the speakers that uh, we have to finish the uh, talk in 15 minutes strictly so that we have five minutes for questions and answers. Uh, so moving on, it is an honor to invite uh, Dr. Ashok Kumar, sir, uh, on stage to deliver the next talk. And I would request the chairpersons on stage to kindly introduce him. I take great pleasure in welcoming uh, Dr. Ashok Kumar here. Uh, as we all know, we all know him. He has been professor and head of rheumatology in AIMS. And he is also a recipient of Noel Oration of Indian Rheumatology Association. He has been a president of IRA and edit, uh, editor in Indian Journal of Rheumatology. He is the recipient of Dr. M. N. Pesky Award for in IRA for Lifetime Achievement. And he has received multiple awards and multiple publications. He has been a great pleasure to listen to him. Thank you. I think every invite to come and speak at AIMS is a matter of great pleasure as well as honor to me personally. And I'm really grateful to Uma for this present uh, session. And the topic also that has been given to me is quite interesting. I will begin by starting uh, with uh, the statement that uh, the spectrum of disease modifying drugs has definitely enlarged. Now you can classify them into synthetic and biological disease modifying drugs. And the first category, as you know, has the old ones, the conventional synthetic DMARs. Uh, I mentioned four here, which are commonly used, but you can add Iguratimod also to it. The others have been just put in the 
and backbench and the targeted synthetic DMARs, the JAK inhibitors, which is the topic of today's discussion. And I will not mention much about the biological DMARs and biosimilars. Go to the next slide. So the question that has been posed is, are JAK inhibitors the substitute for conventional synthetic DMARs? To answer this question, obviously we have to speak a little more about the biology of uh, JAK inhibitors, a little more understanding as to what JAK stands for. So JAK is actually nothing but an enzyme. It's a genus kinase. Genus is the name of Roman god, the god of all beginnings, whether it is day, month, or year, and the month of January is named after Janus, just to give an example. And Janus has two faces so that it can look forward and backward without having to turn around. Now, GAC enzymes are part of the very uh, common intracellular signaling pathway called JAK-STAT pathway. And this involves four JAK molecules and four uh, type of STAT molecules. STAT stands for signal uh, transducer and activator of transcription. Now, there are four different genus kinases, JAK1, 2, and 3, and one called tyrosine kinase 2. And just good to know about this, that if there is a mutation of JAK3 or tyrosine kinase 2, it can lead to serious conditions like severe combined immunodeficiency. So these are very important molecules. The STAT family includes seven of them. So they are numbered like STAT1, STAT2, STAT3, 4, 5A, 5B, and 6. Anyway, that much about their uh, Now, what exactly is this uh, intracellular signaling pathway? So if you see this small spherical thing, imagine that this is a cytokine or a growth factor, which has to bind to a surface receptor. Now, this receptor is shown as these two yellow bars. It's a dimeric molecule. It has extracellular and intracellular domains. So once it binds, there is a series of phosphorylation reactions that gets triggered. So first of all, the JAK, uh, you know, genus kinases associated with that particular receptor, they get phosphorylated. That means they get activated. Then they activate uh, the uh, intracellular domain of the receptor. And then finally, STAT molecules. So the actual thing is this STAT. Once the STAT molecules get activated, they then form a dimer. They enter into the nucleus, go and bind to some places in the, uh, in the DNA to activate genes which will produce pro-inflammatory mediators and cytokines or, you know, enzymes. So that is how the inflammation gets uh, picked off. Now, the JAK inhibitors have, have this importance that they can actually stop this reaction completely. So the intracellular signaling will stop 100%. So that is how they are so efficacious and they stop the inflammation very, very effectively. Now, not all cytokines make use of this JAK-STAT pathway. And you can see the right column, such important cytokines like TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, interleukin-8, TGF-beta, they don't make use of JAK-STAT pathway. So not every cytokine is the other ones which are listed here. So most of the interleukins do make use of JAK-STAT pathway. And as I mentioned, JAK inhibitors are so powerful that they result in robust inhibition of erosions in RA. They inhibit maturation of osteoclasts. This uh, decreases rank ligand production. So they have a potential to actually convert sustained remission into cure. This has also been mentioned as an extreme statement, but then, of course, that reflects the, the uh, intensity of their effects. Now, the cytokines which are amenable to JAK inhibitors in rheumatoid arthritis are shown in this picture. Uh, just to avoid reading these things in small print, I've listed on the left side, you can see these are the ones. So both types of interferon, type 1 as well as type 2, IL-4, IL-6, IL-12, IL-15, IL-21, 22, 23, and GM-CSF. These are the ones which are amenable to JAK inhibition in rheumatoid arthritis, and they are relevant to rheumatoid. Now, this is, I mean, don't read too much of it, but just to say that 
the intracellular uh, domain of the receptor associates with the uh, CAC molecules not randomly. There are, you know, uh, preferred ones, you know, like JAK1 and JAK2 for interferon gamma. You can see here only JAK2 for uh, growth hormone and uh, for erythropoietin and so on. And similarly, the STAT also there are preferences. So a given, you know, cytokine will need a particular set of JAK molecules and a particular set of STAT molecules. But there is a considerable overlap also. And again, you don't have to read the small font. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that the JAK uh, inhibitors have found such wide usage in uh, not only uh, rheumatology, but also allergic disorders and other inflammatory conditions. And trials are in different phases. Like the right column shows phase three trials. Then the, uh, you know, phase four trials. And then those which are approved already, those are listed in the first column. And I've just written them in a big font so that you can read. So rheumatoid arthritis, polyarticular JIA, atopic dermatitis, psoriatic arthritis, and kylosing spondylitis, ulcerative colitis, and lastly at the bottom, COVID-19, where baricitinib was approved. So um, more conditions uh, you will find JAK inhibitors finding uh, approval with time. So it's a very active area. Now, five JAK inhibitors have been approved for rheumatoid arthritis, which are listed in this table. But you can see tofacitinib and pefacitinib. They are pan-JAK inhibitors. So all uh, get affected. While baricitinib, mainly JAK1, JAK2, apadacitinib and felgotinib, only JAK1, selective. And don't miss at the bottom what I've written, that uh, felgotinib is approved by ULAR, but not by US FDA. US FDA says no, not acceptable because it has testicular toxicity. There is some effect on male fertility. So for that reason, it has not been approved by FDA. Now this is a table which basically tries to show that uh, Pfizer tried to uh, sort of conduct trials in all possible formats of use of tofacitinib, um, giving different names to those trials, like, you know, uh, tofacitinib against placebo, just for 12 weeks, that's oral solo. Then the comparison with methotrexate, then comparison with uh, adalimumab, and then its uh, effect in preserving radiographic, uh, you know, structure, avoiding erosions or protection, then how it works in combination with other DMARDs. And lastly, as a rescue drug for people who have failed on multiple biologics. So the last one is that, oral step. So everywhere, the efficacy was absolutely, you know, amazing. But there were also clearing side effects, adverse effects. We have just had this talk by Dr. Samir Gulati, highlighting the adverse effects. And this particular oral surveillance trial was actually mandated by FDA. Post-surveillance, post-authorization, open label, randomized but non-inferiority and safety endpoint trial. And the results have been published only recently. I mean, they came in print in January this year, but otherwise, online they were available in September itself. And uh, so this was a four-year trial, and uh, what they uh, found was, I mean, what they compared was, uh, there were three groups, one getting TOFA at 5 milligram dose, second at 10 milligram, and third getting TNF inhibitor uh, in 1 is to 1 is to 1 ratio. And uh, these were patients who were inadequate responders to methotrexate. Uh, suffering from rheumatoid arthritis, 50 years or older, with at least one additional cardiovascular risk factor. So this was the study population. And it was a large study with more than 1,400 patients in each of the three groups, very large study. 
and the incidences of major uh, adverse cardiovascular events and cancer were higher with TOFA group, as you have just heard, 3.4% uh, and 4.2% as compared to TNF inhibitor, which was 2.5% and 2.9%. So this gave a hazard ratio of something like 1.33 and 1.5, significant. Opportunistic infections like TB and zoster, as well as non-melanoma skin cancer, for more with rofacitinib, and the FDA issued a black box warning on 1st of September last year after these results became available to them. And what was this warning? They said there is an increased risk of serious events such as heart attack, stroke, cancer, blood clots, and death with Zelgens. Baricitinib and apendocitinib are also expected to have similar risk because of shared mechanism of action. This is the statement given by FDA. Clinicians must consider benefits and risks for individual patients prior to initiating or uh, continuing therapy with these three drugs. This applies particularly to current or past smokers, those with cardiovascular risk, and those with history of cancer other than non-melanoma skin cancer. So at the end, it is mentioned use of JAK inhibitors is limited to inadequate responders to TNF inhibitors. Now, this is also something that we should note. Now, uh, just a few words about uh, others. Paricitinib also has similarly undergone several trials. But this is the one which I want to just uh, focus here, that it says there is a head-to-head -head comparison between tofacitinib and baricitinib, and efficacy-wise, baricitinib is superior. Side effects-wise, there was not significant. This is just the gist of it. I'm not going to spend time on it. And then a few words about selective JAK1 inhibitors. Apadacitinib and filgotinib are two selective JAK1 inhibitors, and uh, their JAK1 selectivity combines efficacy with better safety profile. Because some of those bad side effects come from JAK2 inhibition or JAK3 inhibition. Select compare trial proved safety of apadacitinib at par with that of adalimumab. Serious infection, major adverse cardiovascular events, and venous thromboembolism, malignancy, they were balanced across the two groups. So, so there is a lot of hope on JAK1 selective uh, you know, inhibitors. Now, we come back to the basic question. Are JAK inhibitors a substitute for conventional synthetic DMARDs? So I've just tabulated a few parameters. If you compare conventional uh, DMARDs with JAK inhibitors, the route of administration for the conventional ones is mostly oral but can be parenteral, while JAK inhibitors are all oral. The size of molecule is small in both. Mechanism of action of conventional ones are not very well defined, usually vague, while it is well defined target in case of JAK inhibitors. Monotherapy in either is efficacious, but JAK inhibitor is more efficacious than methotrexate, the best uh, conventional DMAR. Direct analgesic effect, our conventional ones don't have, while JAK inhibitors have some kind of analgesic effect, which has been really uh, sort of emphasized in the literature that the pain control is better with JAK inhibitors. What mechanism uh, operates here is not very clear, but this is an area of research. We may find more applications of JAK inhibitors in controlling pain, which otherwise is not responding to anything. Industrial production is relatively easy in both cases. When the proof is there, you, you know how many companies are making tofacitinib at present. Price of generic version, low and affordable in either case, but safety, our conventional ones are considered generally safe, while JAK inhibitors are real safety issues. Place of treatment in algorithm, First line, conventional case, while in JAK inhibitors, certainly not first line. Safety considerations, they must. So what is the answer? I think I've already answered it. They are not, certainly not, uh, substitutes for conventional synthetic DMARDs. So to conclude, JAK inhibitors are orally, orally administered targeted synthetic DMARDs. The generic tofacitinib, which is available in India, is highly efficacious and affordable. 
Although comparable to biologics in efficacy, some serious adverse events have eclipsed the initial glitter of JAK inhibitors. Their position in RA treatment has slipped below TNF blockers. Obviously, they are not substitutes for conventional synthetic DMARs. Selective JAK1 inhibitors have better safety profile, but these drugs will take a long time before becoming available and affordable for the third world countries. So I will end it here so that there is some time for discussion because I must have provoked a few issues. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. Now is open for discussion. Dr. Ashok, I just want to ask two quick questions. During your uh, presentation, you said that it also inhibits the osteoclast maturation. Yes. So can this have a collateral advantage in improving osteoporosis as an orthopedic surgeon because osteoclastic inhibition will lead to increased bone mass? The second is that uh, the previous speaker had said that uh, tuberculosis incidence is within nine months of onset of Molnis. So if somebody has taken for two years or so, does that mean the incidence of tuberculosis will be significantly reduced? These are the two questions. Well, the first one, I don't think anybody can answer that. Because uh, the trial has to be done, it has to actually see whether it has uh, that much of uh, benefit. With, in, 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 well, that will be that possibly will be there. Possibly will be there. What I talked about was suppression of erosions. Sir, how long can we give, sir? Wait, wait, wait. wait. He, he asked two questions. The second one is still... Uh, now, the second question was about tuberculosis. Now, oh. let me tell you very openly. I also started using tofacitinib the way others were using. And I was probably not so impressed with the risk of tuberculosis. It has been really you know, highlighted so much. I did not give any any kind of uh, prophylaxis. I didn't even check for Montu test or uh, uh, quantiferon TB gold. And in my first 100 patients, only one developed tuberculosis. And that guy, you could have predicted because he was so lean and thin, 40 kg weight. And, uh, you know, he did not develop tuberculosis with NTTNF, surprisingly, which on which he failed. And then I, you know, gave this, and he developed tuberculosis. Barring him, other 99 patients, simply no problem of tuberculosis. So what I'm saying is, NTTNF, the risk of tuberculosis activation is 10% and above. While with tofacitinib, at 5 milligram VT dose, the risk is probably 1% or less. So keep that in mind. I've already done this trial of 100 patients. Actually, I've gone to more. And that I just gave you, uh, you know, bigger beginning. And continuing the same, Practice, I have not yet seen a second patient, 200 plus. Okay, so that's a practical experience, unpublished. Somebody else may stand up and I've seen five cases, I've seen 10 cases. Yeah, maybe they're right. But so I have for not. How long did the patient wear on Tofacitinib? Oh, the, the drug came in December 20. From that time onwards, within three months, I had already given it to 100 patients. So now it is 22. More than one year, definitely. Average. So just to answer his first question, so the uh, conventional understanding is that the osteoclastic activity and the osteoblastic activity are coupled with each other. So when you inhibit the osteoclastic activity, the osteoblastic activity also gets inhibited. So they are not, uh, you know, uncoupled from each other. Teriparatide is a different drug. Teriparatide is a different drug. It increases the osteoblastic activity. But when you give a bisphosphonate, you suppress the osteoclastic and the osteoblastic. And that is why you end up with atypical femoral fractures. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I think we can close this session. Thank you so much, sir. Good luck. Now I'll hand over the mic uh, to one of my colleagues, Dr. Pallavi Vich, uh, SR Rheumatology, for hosting the inauguration ceremony.
Good morning, respected faculty, delegates, and welcome to Rheumatology Update 2020. Organized under the aegis of Delhi Rheumatology Association by the Department of Rheumatology in New Delhi. We're truly honored to have such a galaxy of eminent rheumatologists, physicians, teachers, and students as a part of this glorious event and a much awaited event. And we extend a hearty welcome to all of you present in the auditorium here today. Light and brightness is a symbol of activity, prosperity, and abundance. So to begin with, we would like to seek uh, we would like to seek the blessings of the Almighty by lighting of the ceremonial lamp, for which I would like to re request the following dignitaries to kindly join us on the dais. I would like to invite our chief guest, respected Dr. Randeep Puleria, sir, Director, Ames, New Delhi, to kindly come on the dais, sir. I now invite Dr. A. N. Malavia, sir, former HOD in medicine and chief of clinical immunology and rheumatology department at Ames, New Delhi. Currently, the head of the Department of Rheumatology, ISIC, Spoof Super Speciality Hospital, New Delhi. Sir, can you please honor us with your presence on the stage? I request Dr. Rohini Hanna, sir, to please ascend to the dais. He is a former professor and head of the Rheumatology Department at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, currently associated with the Indraprastha Apollo Hospital, New Delhi, and is also the scientific chairman of the Rheumatology Update 2022. I further invite Dr. Sandeep Padhyay, sir, the President, Delhi Rheumatology Association, and Senior Consultant Rheumatology at Indraprastha Apollo Hospital, New Delhi. Please come to the stage for the honours of lighting the lamp. I invite Dr. Heyman Sharma, sir, Secretary, Delhi Rheumatology Association and Head of Medicine Department and Rheumatology Wing at the NDMC Medical College and Hindu Rao Hospital, New Delhi, to please join us on the dais, sir. And I finally request Mr. S. L. Gera ji, our guest of honour, to please come to the dais for this inauguration ceremony. Can we please hand the faculty on the stage with the lamp, the candle? Shubham Karuti Kalyanam, Arogyam Dharm Sampradha, Shatru Bhuti Vinashai, Deep Jyoti, Namaste. Deep Jyoti Par Brahma, Deep Jyoti Janardana, Deep Dharma Me Papam, Deep Jyoti. We thank all the dignitaries on the stage for doing the honor. Thank you. I would like to request Dr. Guleria sir, Dr. Handa sir, Dr. Upadhyay sir, and Dr. Uma Kumar ma'am, and Mrs. Mr. S. L. Gera ji to kindly stay back on the stage and take their seats on the dais, please. John Quincy Adams said, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, and become more, you are a leader. I would like to attribute this proverb to all our dignitaries on the dais and would like to request them to give us this opportunity to please felicitate them on this occasion. Dr. Momita Ma'am, our research officer, Director Ames, New Delhi, Dr. Randeep Kuleja, the token of a gratitude. Round of applause, please.
Dr. Seher Shroof for Senior Resident Department of Rheumatology to honor, respect, and honor. Can we please applaud the Next, I request Dr. Manikandan, SR Rheumatology, Ames, New Delhi, to kindly welcome and felicitate Dr. Sandeep Upadhyay, sir, please. I would like to now call Dr. Isra Rul Haq, SR Rheumatology, Ames, New Delhi, to kindly felicitate Dr. Uma Kumar Ma'am, our Head of Department and Organizing Secretary for Rheumatology Update 2022. A doctor's world is not complete without his or her patient. So we took this opportunity to do something unique in the means of this meeting and invited one of our oldest patients taking care under us for nearly 34 years to be a guest of honor and he obliged us with accepting the invitation. Guest of honor with a momentum of our gratitude and appreciation and love. This conference was a brainchild of our head of department and the organizing secretary for Rheumatology Update 2022. Without her painstaking efforts, this conference would not have seen the light of the day. I kindly request Dr. Uma Kumar Ma'am. To please give a welcome note to our faculty and the delegate parents. Thank you so much, all of you, and very big thank you. So you found time to come here on Sunday morning, and um, I would like to acknowledge my respect, regards, and gratitude. To our Honorable Director, Prof. Randeep Guleria, sir, and uh, my teacher, my guru, Dr. Rohini Handa, sir, because, because of him I am in rheumatology, uh, and Dr. Sandeep Upadhyay, President, Delhi Rheumatology Association, Sri S.L. Gera Ji, uh, who has been associated with AIMS for more than three decades. So, it's a very massive how precious he to us. And I would also like to uh, thank all the audience once again for gracing this occasion. I'll not take much time. I'll just inform that we had this one and a half day work. The overwhelming response that we had to close down registrations for workshops. And today we are having this full day nine to five meeting on various rheumatological things. As you all know, rheumatology is a budding specialty. It's still in infancy, but the hope and positive thing is that it is being taken up by our junior colleagues and the cutoff for rheumatology is going up day by day. So brightest of the brains, they are opting for rheumatology. And, um, and previous month, April was uh, being celebrated as uh, Rheumatological Disorders Awareness Month. So it's first May today and this happens to be International Labor's Day. So happy International Labor's Day to all of you. And uh, uh, I would, in the, I would be fall short of words if I don't thank uh, my sponsors who have uh, made this event a uh, success, and my students, my office staff, my lab staff, and everyone who I forget to name. And our director that has to go for the, I mean, interviews are going on in the uh, institute, so he has to leave. So I'll just keep it short. Thank you so much once again. Jai Hind. Thank you, ma'am, for your pleasant and kind words. I now request Dr. Rohini Handa, sir, to kindly bless this illustrious gathering with a few kind words. Friends and colleagues, I think uh, I would like to begin by of medical sciences for organizing this update. Rheumatic diseases are shrouded in and surrounded by myths and misconceptions, both amongst the mind, patients, and doctors as well. Patients believe that their treatment 
perhaps include always corticosteroids, tendency of therapeutic nihilism. It's no longer true. An update such as this one dispel these myths. Uh, the content of this update has been curated by chair and the faculty is very experienced. I'm sure all people who are attending this update will go enriched. And the ultimate aim is improving the quality of life of our patients with rheumatic diseases. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your appreciation, your motivation and encouragement. I would now like to request our respected director, Dr. Randeep Gulehya, sir, who has obliged us with his precious time to please bless us with his kind words. Been able to stay here for the entire operation. We have ongoing uh, and I joined as a faculty many, many decades ago. In many ways, he selected me for this, for this institute. So I still, it reminded me of my younger days when I came to fly, and I was much younger as far as this institute was concerned. But I'd like to take this opportunity to really congratulate the Department of Rheumatology for holding Rheumatology up to 2020. It's nice to see a big crowd physically rather than this. And I think we have a huge interest in this area. Rheumatologists, physicians, dedicated branch as well as rheumatology Specialist and to increase more awareness both to the general public and among practitioners. And we do still see patients who have been neglected, who haven't had proper treatment, and therefore have had significant deformity. I think this is something that we need to. Last few decades have been very, very fascinating. dramatically, and so has the uh, I think our understanding of epidemiological diagnosis and treatment in rheumatology has been really phenomenal. We moved from an era where we looked at symptomatic treatment and rehabilitation, now really offering something very aggressive as far as treatment of rheumatic and muscular pain. Now looking at biological DMRDs, I think there is a lot of change at the Later part of the talk that Dr. Shokumar said. And I think it's very important that we're able to understand how do we balance that out. There are new challenges also. We are seeing now people, patients with rheumatological disorders, living into an older age group with multiple comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease. Because of this, what is the drug drug interaction? How do biologicals behave in these patients in terms of these disorders? There are some, I've seen an article on rheumatoid arthritis and its drugs that got cardiovascular disease. I think there is going to be a lot of interest in how do we now these patients with comorbidities. Finally, I think it's been a challenging time for all of us last two years, and so has it been for rheumatologists. Otherwise, new ways of managing. Uh, 
vaccine uptake in these patients what is the risk of having severe disease as far as covid is concerned you are on immunosuppressive therapy or you have a disease does not do you immune response so i think these are new challenges do these people need more booster doses do they need a higher dose of the vaccine these are still issues conference workshop congratulations for that and i'd like to congratulate and thank you very much thank you so much for your time and your precious message we'd like to take this occasion and uh, request you to please greet and felicitate our guest of honor for tonight for this meeting mr ethel geraldi and now humbly request mr ethel geraldi our guest of honor for this occasion to please share a few words with us on his long journey with his disease and his experience at a नमस्कार इस प्रकार के के लिए किसी प्रमुख व्यक्ति को ऑपरेशन के लिए इनवाइट किया जाता है परंतु प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर उमा कुमार जी ने इस कार्य के लिए एक पेशेंट को चुना क्योंकि वो अपने पेशेंट को सारी टीम अपने पेशेंट्स की सुविधा और इलाज पर बहुत अधिक महत्व देते हैं मैं अपने क्लिनिक में कई वर्षों से रहा हूँ और मुझे कहते हुए प्रसन्नता होती है और उनका प्रबंधन अतुलनीय है डॉक्टर्स की टीम एवं पेशेंट्स का रिकॉर्ड और उनको डॉक्टर्स भेजने का कार्य ये सब बड़ा ही सुचारू रूप से किया जाता है डॉक्टर उमा कुमार एवं उनके डॉक्टर्स की टीम का पेशेंट के प्रति कमिटमेंट प्रशंसनीय है कहा जाता है कि दवाई बीमारी को ठीक करती है पर बीमार को तो केवल डॉक्टर ही क्यों करता है इसका उदाहरण है जब मैं पहली बार अपने इलाज के लिए यहाँ आया तो डॉक्टर ए एन मालविया ने मुझे कहा निराश मत होइए यू आर इन सेफ है उन शब्दों ने मेरी टूटती हुई उम्मीद को सहारा दिया और आज मैं आपको पूर्ण महसूस करता हूँ और मैंने यहाँ आकर पेशेंट के ठीक होने का सबसे बड़ा कारण यहाँ के डॉक्टर्स का विनम्रता और मुस्कुरा कर मुस्कुरा कर पेशेंट्स के साथ व्यवहार है डॉक्टर्स के प्रति कुछ शब्द डॉक्टर्स के महत्व को उजागर करते हैं जब आंसू होते हैं तो आप चंदा होते हैं जब दर्द होता है तो आप गवाह होते हैं और जब हादसा होता है तो आप उम्मीद होते हैं थैंक यू वेरी मच Director, Dr. Sandeep Upadhyay, sir, 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 Director
the loud and clear message is that you need to be um, uh, affectionate and you need to be uh, with the patient, empathetic with all his or her requirements. That's the most important number one message. Number two for students, uh, Professor Uma said, this is a burning subject. This is a burning uh, speciality. So it's something that is not too hot to handle. I, I want you guys to really start treating. If you're, if you're not rheumatologists, you're physicians, and you kind of go into uh, more uh, lucrative branches like cardiology, give rheumatology a chance as well, because there's so much happening here. And uh, it's, it's nearly as uh, brilliant and uh, academic as any other branch in, in the medical sphere. And finally, um, learn to respect your teachers. Be happy to learn something new every day. Uh, that's that's the number one and number two and number three message. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that message. With this, we now come to end of this remarkable inauguration ceremony. I now request the attendees to kindly stand in honor of our national anthem. I thank all the dignitaries, faculty, for showing an overwhelming response to this meeting and extend our deepest gratitude for participating in this landmark event for our department. I thank the dignitaries on the stage for doing the honors of this inauguration ceremony. And I now hand over the stage back to Dr. Sayaj Roop Kaur to take us forward in today's proceedings. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so next 45 minutes, we'll be having a discussion on rituximab. For this session, uh, may I request the chairperson, Dr. Saurabh Malviya, sir, to come on the dais. Uh, Dr. Saurabh Malviya is a consultant at Department of Rheumatology and Clinic, Im Clinical Immunology in Midanta, Indore. He has over a decade of rich professional experience in this field, has published several papers in national as well as international journals and is a member of various prestigious uh, medical associations. I would also request Dr. Indrajit Agarwal, sir, uh, to join uh, sir on stage to chair the session. Dr. Indrajit Agarwal, a uh, profound rheumatologist, is currently HOD Rheumatology and Senior Consultant, Internal Medicine at Paris Hospital, Gurgaon. Uh, now, I would li like to invite Dr. Sandeep Upadhyay, sir, 
to come on the dais uh, for his upcoming talk and may I request the respected chairpersons to kindly introduce him. Good morning all. Rutuxilab, uh, as we all know, that it has been licensed for many indications, but it is quite interesting that it has not been licensed for lupus. But still, all of us here, we may have used this in this drug, in this uh, tradition. So we have Dr. Sandeep Bhupadhyay, President of the Rheumatology Association, is a consultant at Nirprasta uh, Delhi, he runs and with his colleagues very successful ENP program. So, without wasting any more time, I'd like to request Dr. Sandeep to give us this discussion on lupus. And thank you. Thank you, organizers, for the kind uh, inclusion of my talk. So, at the outset, I'll want to uh, clarify that although rituximab is the official um, theme of the next two talks, I have digressed a bit and uh, I have included uh, more of the lupus uh, related medications which have come into the ambit of uh, near FDA approval or near treatment uh, in, in our clinics as, as the goal of my talk. And that's primarily because, you know, something that reminded me of olden days, there used to be a time when uh, Thumbs Up and uh, some of the other Indian brands used to rule the roost. And then Pepsi-Cola came in. And there was this time that there was a cricket tournament which was to be organized. And uh, I think it was not Pepsi, but some other company that was the official sponsor. But then it, there was this tagline uh, about the Pepsi uh, that uh, nothing official about it. And uh, Remo Fernandez sort of uh, got it right. and. Uh, Pepsi Cola then took off very well. So, although Rituximab is the theme, I'll be digressing a little bit and talking more about, uh, with the permission of the, of the chairpersons, about what is new in the area of lupus and lupus development, what is new about pathophysiology. But that might uh, also um, make me stumble because even I'm, I'm, I'm likely to fumble and stumble because I, I made the the mistake of speaking with Dr. Malvi is he here or he left? The teacher of teachers. Okay, so the, the idea is never to speak to him on the evening or, or the eve before your talk because it's likely that he'll come up with something that that will stumble or make you fumble. So he told me about uh, something that is, I'll have to take it out of my pocket and read it out to you. It's something like Obutu Zumab or something. So. I was, I was stumped and I said, uh, okay, I'll try to include it into my talk because he is always well read on matters that are most recent and he's gung-ho about this. This is something that's going to work on uh, CD20. It's a, it's a uh, monoclonal that is even better than rituximab as regards lupus nephritis trial. So I've not been able to include that. And I was wondering what to do about it. Then I then turned from teachers of teachers to the student of students. I, my um, student, uh, Dr. Deepak, and I asked him, uh, what is this all about and how does it act and all that. So, so if, you're, if you're stuck and you're, you're wondering what to do about things, this is what you should do. Go back to your student, he'll be able to teach you about something new. So with that, as, as the um, introduction, let me get into the uh, talk itself. We've seen uh, several years of development for drugs in lupus and till we had... Uh, Belimumab get uh, approval, there were a close to 50 years of nothing happening in the field of new treatments as regards uh, lupus. Uh, even rituximab seemed to be only uh, a off-label indication for so many diseases and conditions of lupus. So it seemed as if uh, when I took up the talk that the road travel thus far has had problems galore and we've not really had much progress and there seemed to be no solution in sight. But then I started to look ahead and the future of lupus, there is bench to bedside uh, data coming in that makes it very optimistic. Although it's equally daunting, the, the, the future is also very daunting, but there's something to look forward to. There is a bottleneck right there underneath the, the, the bridge, but there is a freeway right after that. So I believe that in the next five, seven years, uh, there will be uh, a, a 
shower of new antibodies, monoclonals, uh, you know, you name it, even, even uh, some forms of vaccines that are being uh, given uh, a trial. So, so getting on to the real talk, there is the problem of lupus, which is a very heterogeneous disease. And uh, even if we look at it from any angle, there is thrombocytopenia for one, there's lupus nephritis, there is cerebritis. And then to put them all together in one clinical trial and see A is better than B, is very difficult. Uh, you have to look at standard therapies as part of the established treatment before you use a uh, treatment that's experimental. So that has to be in the background. That interferes with the the outcomes of treatment and you're not able to define whether the new treatment was really effective or it was just the steroids or it was doing the trick. So therefore, targeted therapies have a tough time getting uh, approval. Uh, we have more and more of steroid-related toxicities. We have more and more of infections. We're now aware that more than uh, the disease itself, it's the malignancy and the CBD risk that kills the patient. And the dilemma is actually now finding effective solutions to solutions of effective treatment. We have to look for solutions to the problems that you create with these treatments. Now, if you use rituximab, you're likely to have infections. If you use any other medication, mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide. So it's now more to do with the dilemma of solutions to effective treatments. And therefore, uh, there's been a, a shift of the, the bench to a bedside paradigm from T cells and T cells and others to regulatory T cells, interferons, and some other um, cell mediated therapies. Now, this actually is, is um, again the same uh, paradigm about how difficult it is for an average clinician to deal with lupus. And, and much of this comes from the fact that biomarkers, absolutely nil. We just have to rely on the few that we have, which includes uh, anti DSDNA. Uh, include C3, C4, but all the others ex that are experimental, the ones that are with ICE3CB or interferon one, or they're, they're not really available for you in the clinic. So you can't really use that as uh, a biomarker for activity. Then the treat to window target is, is very difficult to define. It's, it's not something that you can see on the outside, like a DAS28 score with you know, tender and swollen joints. You can't really decide whether the drug that you're going to start is going to have side effects, which are different from the lupus itself, or they're, they're part of lupus uh, disease itself. So you might give steroids, but the steroids might cause, uh, say, for example, candidemia or some fungus or skin rash. And you can have a lupus-related subacute cutaneous rash, which looks like a, a fungal infection. So there are problems galore, comorbidities to deal with, there is. Uh, the chance that you have a lady of 40, 50 who's on steroids for several years gets diabetes, gets, uh, you know, has this hangover of, uh, you know, I've read in the book that there is a malignancy associated with uh, X drug. So more and more of these problems uh, have been tackled now. And uh, what was partly a, an innate immune problem uh, started to look like an adaptive immune problem. But soon after, it, it was realized that it's not just these two, but also some of the bridging cytokines, including the BAF, type 1 interferons, IL-1223, which are responsible for uh, lupus pathology. And with that in mind, there's been plenty of work in this area. So it's not just the B cells that have been targeted, but T cells, dendritic cells, uh, myeloid cells. And then there are several cytokines that have been targeted. Interferons, uh, one of them, a success example. So. Uh, what was accepted as norm earlier is now part of um, the clinic. Uh, uh, it, what was not the norm earlier is now accepted as part of the clinic. As regards lupus nephritis, for example, in class one and two, we know that you should not treat until it's, it's really difficult for the patient. And there has been this development for electron microscopy and to look for photocytopathy. Treat with steroids uh, with or without cyclophosphamide. For class six, uh, the emphasis is now to go for renal replacement therapy and avoid immunosuppression at all costs. Uh, class 3, class 4 nephritis, earlier used to just rely on either cyclophosphamide, mycophenolate, and rituximab regimens. So despite the fact that it's not FDA approved, uh, it's uh, ULAR and ACR certified that it's part of the protocol of treatment, and uh, we have 
had problems with the initial trials that were uh, done with uh, rituximab in lupus nephritis. And some of those uh, can probably be uh, tackled later. But now that it has been accepted by the scientific fraternity at large, there's not much point going back and trying to prove it in a clinical trial. It's part of the deal. But there are several uh, caveats with rituximab use. And those have been uh, addressed by the, the molecular structure or, or changes in the molecular structure that uh, has been applied to the uh, anti-CD20 molecule. And some of those include, you know, higher uh, propensity to attach, uh, a higher ability to form uh, complexes with, with the anti-CD20, uh, with the CD20, and prevents uh, its, its dispersion in, in the uh, cytoplasm. And then there's some that allow dispersion in the cytoplasm. There are lipid rafts which hold these CD20 molecules on, on it, and, and the CD20 molecules float around it. Rituximab tends to put them together in, in uh, foursomes. So that's something that's beyond the scope of this lecture. But what I'm trying to say is that there is a, a role for development in, in this biotechnology sphere uh, with regard to newer molecules that have a CD20-like um, mechanism action. And they're extremely good, and they're doing uh, well in phase two, phase three trials. The subsequent slides will just cover briefly some of those uh, molecules. So I'm not sure if you can see this, but uh, this primarily is more or less like the overview of all immunology. So you have uh, the native immune cells on the one side, which is the myeloid uh, cells, the dendritic cells, and the P and T cells on the other. What happens is that uh, the Dendritic cells are the one major link between the adaptive and the innate immune system. They're the ones uh, who, who sort of carry forth the uh, antigen from uh, tissue uh, into the uh, lymph node or secondary lymphoid tissue and raise the alarm for uh, antigen, which is part of the process. Now, Dendritic cells and uh, plasmacytic dendritic cells are also responsible for making a lot of interferons. And we know that lupus is now uh, a, an interferon signature disease. So with that in mind, there has been a, a trust or, or a move towards trying to capture or, or control plasmacytic dendritic cells and interferon-related uh, antibodies, and indeed even BDCA2, which is part of the plasmacytic dendritic cell um, system, has been suppressed with, with an antibody. I'm not going to go into the details of what turned out of those trials, but suffice it to say that this is the length and breadth of, so you, you start with uh, the immune cells that are absolutely in the innate uh, sphere, uh, as say, for example, the myeloid cells, which, which secrete BAF, BAF and BLIS, which is part of the uh, B cell uh, immunoactivation uh, molecule. And some of these uh, are absolutely new, and some of those that are on the left, on the B cell side, have been used, have just been tweaked a little bit. The ones that are CD20, CD19, for example. And then there is the plasma cell. So you, you look at the plasma cell and you give an anti-CD38. There's something called daratumab. So what we'll do is very briefly look at some of those um, molecules. Rituximab we've uh, discussed is good for RA and anchor associated vasculitis, but was a lupus failure, as, at least in trials, but is now accepted by the ACR ULAR and is used successfully in several of these lupus-related uh, manifestations. Uh, now the success story of belimumab. This is the first molecule after 50 years of uh, absolutely zero uh, development in the sphere of lupus. Uh, it's uh, something that you can uh, use for BAF and BLIS. Uh, it's an anti-cytokine. And uh, these were the trials, BLIS 52, BLIS 72. And it was able to show uh, benefit in mild to moderate lupus. Subsequently, the ones that are 
uh, you know, combo biologics or tandem biologic use. You use belimumab along with rituximab in some of these trials called this believe beat lupus. They were all very successful. Now the success story is watlosporin. Combination with microfinid morphotil, rapid taper of steroids was possible. This works through uh, the mechanism of um, um, calcium um, inhibition. Uh, it's, it's like cyclosporin and uh, extremely effective, less toxic, and has also been approved by uh, the authorities. Uh, it has uh, found use in triple therapies, for example, a combination with, uh, with mycophenolate, steroids, and oclosporin itself. Anifrilumab is uh, one of the other success stories, also approved, and like we said, interferon is a very important uh, cytokine for lupus generation. It's been approved for moderate to severe lupus. I won't go into details, but in 60 years, the only second molecule that has been um, approved for lupus, uh, tulip 1 and tulip 2, it improves skin, restores blood counts, neutrophils, lymphocytes, and T-cell subsets. Uh, there are some other molecules that I'll just rapidly go over and tell you in a brief CD40 ligand inhibition, dapirilizumab, pegylated dapirilizumab for patients who could use it during pregnancy, or bexilizumab for anti-CD19, or malizumab anti-IgE, so IgE affects uh, basophil activation and can, through basophil activation, lead to reduce um, plasma surgic dendritic cells. So by and large, uh, just a bird's eye view of what was uh, new in lupus, not just rituximab. So I said this is nothing official about uh, rituximab, but no, uh, no uh, um, nothing to take away from the rituximab. It's one of the most important molecules we use for not only lupus, but for some, several other indications. Mycophenolate and voclosporin as triple therapy. Mycophenolate plus tacrolimus, that's again a new uh, way forward. Biological combinations, they're, they're uh, very much uh, in the offing. And uh, finally, even jackanibs are finding a space. With that, I'll uh, summarize and, and uh, let you know that uh, just the same way that we've had uh, an explosion of molecules for psoriatic arthritis for rheumatoid. We're going to have the next phase of uh, renaissance in lupus. And that's something that uh, Dr. Malvia has predicted, uh, and he has wagered a million dollar bet that, uh, it, was it obit to Munumab or some, some, something like that? Oh, OK. So it's always good to learn. Even if you're on the dais, you should always keep your eyes and ears open. So uh, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'll be open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Sandi. Um, well, uh, rituximab, as we all know, very parts. Consequently, we have a lot of challenges. Comes to you in the clinic, and how you should proceed with this current and in the future. But SME has uh, many controversies, many challenges. Then the treatment options are also uh, not there much, apart from toxicloroquine, and delivery Well, uh, rituximab, we all use it as like, you know, believing in God. You know, have you seen God? No. God exists. That is the asthma. So what we do in this situation that what is the time when we like to use proximal apart from lupus nephritis? Give us two, three, four. So one would be thrombocytopenia that's maybe unresponsive to IVIG. A patient with lupus cerebritis, maybe a patient who has hemolytic anemia that's responded initially but needs steroids continuously for maintenance. And of course, lupus nephritis, like we discussed. Well, uh, you know, I would use it in a patient who's got RA like definitely as this. Probably, and then I also use this, you know, if you with me. But in uh, those uh, patients who are going to be 
talking about marriage and childbirth and all. There is, at least give this medication, there will be some amount of time that you can purchase and the patient may not be on. That is another Absolutely. medication that I use. So if you notice, there was this development for a pegylated molecule, which works like an antibody. And uh, it, if it's, it works well, you can even use it during pregnancy. So that's the kind of development that's happening in this sphere of uh, biotechnology. Since I see so many uh, young faces, you know, and I'm so excited that you are the future. Please do don't shy away, you know, ask questions. Take your time here. I think uh, deep enjoyed your talk. One of the things is that retax fails also. I mean, uh, one would imagine that uh, the biologicals work for everyone, and when the chips are down, you still need to go back to good old cyclophosphamide. And there are some times when you need to combine both retux with cyclophosphamide and lupus comes in all shapes, sizes. And if you re-biopsy your patients with lupus nephritis refractory and you find they're not doing well, uh, I, I would be interested in knowing about the experience of other people combining cyclophosphamide with uh, retux. I take, I take that point very well, and I believe uh, there are n number of uh, uh, occurrences that we have this patient in the ward who who's done well first with a set of molecules, and we then see something uh, come through, like either protein urea or active sediment or rising creatinine. And then you biopsy again, and you find uh, crescents. And you say, then let's use uh, cyclo. There are times when cyclo fails. There, there are times when you give retux. Retux fails. So that's when the combination might be a good idea. And then, you know, finding. In my But then we all know that cyclophosphide could work life I think probably I would rather not take any funds therapy which after half month, one month. So I would definitely use cyclophosphate in those. And then thereafter I would still the time and money and all that exist. I will use uh protection. Uh, can, can I? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, just uh, because where it works best, no, you are using for uh, cytopenia. You are, what uh, what Rohini was asking, uh, our experience, our experience has been that probably it works best in the uh, Sugran syndrome, in the secondary Sugran also. Now, in a very severe su secondary Sugran syndrome also, it works beautifully. Primary Sugran, of course, it works. Very nicely. I think uh, I have a comment to make that uh, you see, once you have a long time follow up, the refractoriness of these diseases emerges. You may win the first round, but down the line, five years later, six years later, eight years later, all the systemic vasculitis and lupus can tax your patients and the patient's patients and you need to shuttle back and forth in the absence of biomarkers. Incidentally, any prolumab, AstraZeneca is trying to get it in India, and for belimumab, unfortunately, the Technical Advisory Committee felt that India does not need it. So th that's why we don't have belimumab. Awesome, Just a few comments about rituximab. Um, you know this drug, obinituzumab, the trial has already come, and it is predicted that it will replace rituximab completely. The reason is that it really depletes B cells, not only in periphery, but also in the areas in the body where it is hiding and is not touched by rituximab. And um, it is predicted that this, in combination with other drugs, might be the real drug to treat lupus nephritis. 
by the way one other thing must be noted that in in when we talk about lupus kidney involvement we are talking of two entirely separate areas of involvement one is glomerulonephritis lupus is glomerulonephritis but there is another entirely different area that is podocytopathy which occurs but rarely in lupus and the treatment of podocytopathy has to be very different than the drugs that are effective in glomerulonephritis and that's why um, the evacopan ev evacopan is going to be the drug for podocytopathic type of kidney disease which is very uncommon last question when roll up and doctor as well so you will get a chance please come first and then doctor Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I wanted to know what are the clear-cut indications of stopping steroids in lupus? Well, that judgment would be best kept uh, with the patient and the treating physician. And uh, if the patient feels well, there's no fatigue, there's no swollen joints, no rash, the ESR is fine, that's when you... I mean, if the patient is in complete remission, there are no cytopenias, it stops steroids. So normally, in clinical experience, how much time does it take from the time of diagnosis? Dr. Sandeep, I mean, we are talking about the, the, my experience and I mean, what I speak. Yeah, uh, what I feel is that I mean it is best uh, can be used in uh, conditions like neurological uh, lupus in the sense that I mean if transverse bilateral Osnidan syndrome or if any more type of uh, antibodies are there, it responds magically. And the other thing which where it works is lupus with uh, caps, uh, the catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, which is not responding to IVIG or plasma pheresis. Reductic reductic works very well. So I mean the the real indications are. A refractive nephritis, thrombocytopenia, hemolytic anemia, and a neurological complication which is not responding to standard therapies. But I don't I allow my I don't allow my patients to go so bad that they go into such kind of complications. No, they come in this so I have very little experience they, with that. They, I'm they, just they, kidding. In, no, no. I mean, in, in your practice also, because I mean, uh, we have a very limited no, practice. We need to stop this. But in your patient, patient come like that only. Doctor. So thank you. You know, it just was a lot of uh, questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sandeep, sir, for such a th uh, thought-provoking session. I would like to uh, invite Dr. Uh, P.D. Rath, sir, on stage for the upcoming discussion. And uh, I may request the chairpersons to please introduce, sir. This topic is also very good. Thank you, sir. How, when, and why? For this, uh, our Amitabh Bachchan of Rheumatology, his name itself, personal that he's always person, he's more scientific. Today you'll see more and more uh, questions and suggestions from, from the audience that he has given. And uh, he, uh, Dr. Rath, he's uh, currently director and head of the Department of Rheumatology in Max Official Hospital. He has got many publications, <coughs> he has in many guidelines, and also uh, he's a very good orator. What do you think? Thank you, Dr. Saurav, and uh, thank you, uh, the organizers, Dr. Uma, for giving me this opportunity to be here today. Uh, I'm going to talk about rituximab and AAV. So today, when we talk of anchor vasculitis, we no longer talk about microscopic polyangiitis or GPA. We talk about PR3 and MPO as two different diseases because we know now that they are two different, genetically different from each other. PR3 depends more on HLA DPB1 and MPO depends more on HLA-DQ. So the diseases are now defined by the antibodies and not by the phenotype. What has revolutionized the treatment is this molecule which we were discussing, which is a chimeric molecule, rituximab. What we also know, the mechanism of action is very varied. So what it does is antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity, complement-mediated cell-dependent cytotoxicity, antibody-dependent phagocytosis, and apoptosis. But for us immunologists, what is more important to understand is that immunologically it resets the body. 
So in, in anchor-associated va uh, vasculitis, we have these defective T follicular helper cells, which cause autoreactive B cells. And these defective T follicular helper cells are increased in patients of GPA. And even after treatment, these remain high. But when you treat with a B cell depletion therapy, such as rituximab, you find that it significantly goes down. On the other hand, when we look at Tregs, which are important regulatory cells, which reduce the inflammation, which are normally present in high number in normal individuals. When you see in patients of GPA, they are very low. And even when treated with conventional therapy, they remain low. But when we treat them with rituximab, they go back to normal levels as seen in individuals, healthy individuals. So rituximab resets the immune system in the body. So what it does is, it brings down the defective T follicular helper cells, sorry for the pointer, and it increases the T regulatory cells. So with that, I'll go to the rituximab induction therapy. There were two major articles published in the same year in NEGM 2010. This was the RAVE and the RITUXVAS trial. Both these trials compared cyclophosphamide with rituximab with subtle differences. So the RAVE trial basically looked at three pulses of methylpred followed by prednisolon and rituximab infusions versus rituximab, placebo and cyclophosphamide oral and followed by azathioprine. So this basically tested cyclo oral plus azathioprine with rituximab alone. And what they found was that rituximab alone was as effective as cyclophosphamide followed by azathioprine over a period of 15 months. What they also found was that almost 64% of patients were in remission at six months of PRED on rituximab. What they also found was that in relapsing subsets, the remission was 67% as compared to cyclophosphamide and less chances of leukopenia on rituximab. The other trial, Rituxvas, and I will want you to just hold on to this concept. What they gave was one group received rituximab plus cyclophosphamide. So this is answering Dr. Handa's question. Rituximab plus cyclophosphamide. The other group received only cyclophosphamide and azathioprine. So this was actually a comparison of Ritux plus cyclo versus cyclo plus aza. And again, the time to remission, <coughs> the BVAS was very similar across both the groups. The time to relapse was very similar across both the groups. And the safety was equal of Ritux plus cyclo versus cyclo plus ASA. What subsequently also was shown by John Stone and his colleagues that rituximab worked better in relapsers. So almost 66.7% patients achieved remission versus only 42% on cyclophosphamide. So clearly there were indications that this drug worked better in relapsers. And what they also found was that it was the PR3 anchor associated vasculitis which was leading to more relapses and Ritux worked much better for PR3 associated anchor vasculitis as compared to cyclophosphamide. When we look at the effect on the anchor serology, more patients in rituximab group became anchor negative as compared to the cyclophosphamide group, 47% versus 24%. So what about the dosing of Ritux in anchor associated vasculitis? So one of the first multicenter surveys showed that two doses of one gram each was as effective as four doses of Ritux in refractory anchor vasculitis. Subsequently, there was a systematic review and meta-analysis. And this showed, if you look at the size effect, I'm very sorry this pointer is not working and I'm not comfortable with the pointer here. So if you see the effect size of four doses of Ritux versus two doses of Ritux, there was no difference in the effect size, thereby confirming that two doses of Ritux was as good as four doses of Ritux. So clearly, Ritux was established as the choice in induction therapy. What about Rituximab as maintenance therapy? Now we know that the, the landmark trial, Cycazarim, clearly showed that azathioprine was better than cyclophosphamide in terms of safety profile and as good as cyclophosphamide for maintenance of remission. So clearly azathioprine had taken its place as the treatment of choice in maintenance therapy. And that is where the Menritsan trial came in when they started to look at rituximab versus azathioprine for maintenance. 
And what they did is they looked at the induction phase completed with cyclophosphamide followed by two doses of Ritax, 500-500 given two weeks apart and then 500 every six monthly for 18 months. And what they found was that as compared to azathioprine, the rituximab patients had lesser relapses. Almost 5.2% relapses versus azathioprine which had almost 30% relapses. We know about the main RITSAN2 which showed that a fixed dosing was as good. You need not do a B cell counts, CD19 counts and that was equally good. What the main RITSAN3 did was it was trying to study whether giving rituximab for a more prolonged period which is 36 months was it better than giving it for 18 months and what they found was that there was no difference between the two groups and that giving it for 36 months did not give any extra advantage. So 18 months of Ritux was enough. Then came the study from uh, the French group and this was recently presented in the recent concluded vasculitis conference in Dublin where they showed that an ultra low dose rituximab was given for maintenance therapy in ANCA associated vasculitis. This was 500 mg yearly versus the standard 500 mg every six monthly. And what they found was equal rates of remission with low dose, ultra low dose of rituximab. So in a, in a, in a resourceful, resource poor country like ours, this could be one of the regimes. What about rituximab in relapsing ANCA vasculitis? Now, there were early evidence to suggest that rituximab probably was superior to cyclophosphamide in ANCA vasculitis. And that is where the ritazerim trial came in. And what this trial did is it took relapses at one month and three months. And then it started to compare. They gave four doses of rituximab and then rituximab 1000 milligram every four monthly, not six monthly compared to azathioprine. And what they found again was that the Ritux group did much better, only 10.7% relapses versus 45% relapses in the azathioprine group and four deaths in the aza group versus no deaths in the Ritux. So clearly Ritux was the drug of choice for relapsing ANCA vasculitis. And now I come to what I feel is the most exciting part of my talk today is the combination therapy which Professor Handa was just alluding to and this is a reading a very landmark study called the Cyclovas study. This was published by Stephen McDo and colleagues recently in Kidney International and followed by the Nephrology Dialysis and Transplant and what they did is taking cue from the Rituxvas study all patients who had life-threatening manifestations, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, severe kidney injury, creating more than 500 millimoles per liter, or requirement of renal replacement therapy within first 48 hours. What they did is they gave them two pulses of rituximab day one, day 15, six pulses of cyclophosphamide according to the Eurolupus protocol, 500 every two weekly, six pulses, and very small steroid, start with 60 and immediately after one week, 45, 30, similar to the Pexivas protocol, tapered down very rapidly by 20 weeks to 10 milligrams. And please see, not a single patient received IV methyl pred. They were only on oral prednisolone. And what they found was fantastic. The GFR improved significantly at the end of six months. The anchor titers fell. The CRP fell. The ESKD free survival was more than 75% in this group. And all the patients, of course, the group which had RRT at baseline did slightly worse than the patients who did not have RRT at baseline. But what is important is, irrespective of the baseline creatinine, more than 75% had a kidney, good kidney survival at 36 months. And it was only the RRT group which did not do well. The time to first infection, almost 75% were infection free at 36 months. And when you look the current cohort and you compare it with the historical cohorts of ANCA vasculitis, it clearly was superior, far superior to the historical cohort. What also was very fascinating is what they found was what determines the prognosis is histopathology. So histopathology, clearly if you have focal, they do the best. If you are mixed, they do slightly worse. Crescentric and the worst are sclerotic. So the renal histopathology will determine the prognosis in ANCA vasculitis. That is the most important message. Infections, well, if you look at grade 3 infections, 63% had no infections, 14% had one, 23 had more than two infections. Buoyed by this, they came up with a long-term follow-up of combined this trial known as the Cyclovas protocol in milder patients. Now they took patients who had did not have severe renal disease, they had 
treatment more than 500 millimoles per liter, did, I mean, who did not have treatment more than 500 millimoles per liter, did not require dialysis at initial presentation, did not have alveolar hemorrhage or cerebral vasculitis. So milder patients, and they gave them the same protocol, and they looked at long-term outcomes at five years. Excellent outcome at six months, BVAS significantly decreased, those of prednisolone significantly reduced, creatinine significantly improved, CRP levels decreased, ANCA titers decreased. 94% remission at six months, 95% renal survival at five years, with 0.124 patient per patient per year infection at five years. So this was clearly or is clearly the future where you combine rituximab with cyclophosphamide with very low dose steroids and you taper down the steroids. And if you look at the ESKD free survival, and if you look at the ANCAs, significantly good responses with this regime. What is also very fascinating is when they compared the cyclovos patients with all the UVAS cohorts. You can name it Cyclops, Ritux, uh, Ritux Vas, Rita Zerim. You compare them with all the UVAS and you find relapses was definitely much significantly less in the cyclovos protocol. ESRD was significantly less. And more importantly, mortality was significantly lower with the cyclovos protocol. The other combination that is being tried is the CombiVas protocol, which uh, combines rituximab with belimumab. This is an ongoing trial. The results are not yet published. Two doses of rituximab and belimumab subcute every weekly for 52 weeks. What this trial is trying to look at, the primary outcome is time to PR3 anchor negativity. And the secondary outcomes are changes from baseline in naive, transitional memory and plasma blast and plasma cell subsets, time to clinical remission, time to first relapse, and incidence of severe adverse events. And it will be very interesting to look at the result of this trial to look at whether a combination of belumumab and rituximab works better. So clearly, the combination therapy holds the future. And I'm sure there'll be a, uh, there'll be a, there'll be a talk here in future about the rise and fall of steroids in ANCA vasculitis. And the steroids are going to fall and fall and fall till they disappear in ANCA vasculitis. And especially with the advent of avacopan, you will find that steroids will be buried in ANCA vasculitis. Side effects of rituximab, if you look at the RAVE and the rituxvas uh, studies, the side effects were not very different between rituximab and cyclophosphamide. What was very interesting was to see that the effect of rituximab on malignancy. So the standard incident ratios of malignancy in rituximab specifically for non-melanoma skin cancer is very high. What they found was that cyclophosphamide was associated with almost 4.6 fold higher risk of malignancy as compared to rituximab. And what was even more fascinating is that very, with every cumulative dose of cyclo, the risk of malignancy increases. But with every cumulative dose of rituxab, the incidence of malignancy decreases. So that's so fascinating. Hypogamma has always been a concern, but studies have shown that hypogamma across cyclo and ASA group versus retux group have not been very, very different. If you look at the IgG, IgM, and IgA, the change from baseline at six months and 18 months across both cyclo and retux group have been the same. And even in those who are hypogamma globulinemic, the infection rates have been quite similar in patients of normal versus low IgG levels, and incidence of severe infections also have not differed. So on an average, hypogamma is not an indication to give IVIG, and routine IgG is not to be done in patients of retux unless your patient is developing infections. PML, of course, has been a concern, but as I showed you, with GPA, the risk of PML is low. Perhaps it's somewhat very peculiarly linked to lupus. Now I'll come to some lesser known side effects. And these are certain things which have taken the world by storm in the recent times. We use rituximab often for lung disease, but rituximab induces lung disease. So you can have an immediate reaction and you can have an acute interstitial pneumonitis or ILD. You can have a hypersensitive pneumonitis. But what is very, very fascinating today is the development of bronchiectasis with persistent use of retux and bronchitis and cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. So an acute reaction occurs within 15 days to one month, can be life-threatening and needs high dose of methylpred and oxygen, can be prevented with adequate steroids as pre-med. So give them 100 mg of methylpred as pre-med. Do not compensate on pre-meds. Rituximab-induced bronchiectasis is a fascinating condition recently described 
especially in patients who are on regular use of Ritax. And the reason probably is a low-grade infection happening inside the bronchioles. There are also studies to show that Ritax can induce selective antibody deficiency, which means your IgG levels may be normal, but you have, don't have the capability to fight, say, streptococcus pneumoniae. So selective antibody deficiencies can happen. So if your patients on Ritax developed selective, uh, a particular infection and your IgG is normal, remember, it doesn't exclude immunodeficiency. And again, a very fascinating uh, paper produced from, uh, from the Mass General, uh, again published in this uh, recently concluded ANCA uh, conference at Dublin, is bronchitis. So they found bronchitis, so chronic cough. So your patients of Ritax are going to have chronic cough, which is a bronchitis cough, which is seen in almost 17.5% of patients with less than two years, and almost 24.7% of patients with more than three years of B cell depletion. Late onset neutropenia, again a very, very fascinating aspect of Ritux, and we have seen two or three patients, and this can have immunological, it can be antibody mediated, you can be cell mediated because of T large granulocyte uh, lymphocytes replacing, it could be transcriptional maturation arrest, or it could be due to hematopoiesis disturbance such as growth factor retentions, B lymphocyte depletions, and bone marrow fatigue. And finally, I will end with a very important thing for the pediatric rheumatologist is unmasking of primary immunodeficiency. This has been seen with rituximab of late and as adult rheumatologists, because pediatric rheumatologists are anyway aware of it, but as adult rheumatologists, we must be aware in our patients, any patient who has a prolonged hypogamma lasting for more than 12 months must be ruled out for primary immunodeficiency because remember, most of these PIDs can also have coexistent autoimmune disease. Most often they have autoimmune cytopenias and that's where Ritux is given and that can be the sole presentation of PID in these patients. These patients are often younger in age and uh, so these are the uh, uh, clear-cut newer or rarer complications which we must keep in mind when we are treating these patients with Ritux. So with that I would like to end my talk uh, summarizing and I think I've given a brief update of Ritux today in Anka vasculitis. Thank you. Uh, sir, very good. Indeed, I, it's a privilege to chair your session. It's more scientific. Uh, very good presentation, sir. So, uh, uh, even I'm using uh, Ritux as a maintenance therapy in, uh, in Kasu studies now, with, with off steroids almost four patients. Uh, so, what's your experience uh, as a maintenance of Ritux in that? Yeah, I think so. If you see the main Ritzan, I think at least 18 months is clearly the indication for Ritux in maintenance. So when you have a relapsing disease, especially PR3 associated disease, I think Ritux does take precedence over cyclo where you can, and uh, both for induction and for maintenance. And maintenance 18 months, as I uh, as you have seen with Menritz and 3, is probably sufficient to give long-term remission. Prolonging it beyond 18 months may not be of benefit. That's what the Menritz and 3 tells us. Sir, uh, to help uh, this young start. So what, how do you choose rituximab as a maintenance and how do you follow? Uh, so, uh, level or do you use, uh, no, so main Ritzan, uh, if you look at the main, uh, the uh, Ritazerim trial, it clearly showed that Ritax two doses of 500 every two week, or day one, day 14, and then 500 six monthly is good enough to maintain remission and the remission has to be clinical. The problem with following ANCA is in our country, ANCA is dubious. So when we are talking of pathogenic ANCA, so please remember that ANCA are of various types. ANCA are not monoclonal, they are polyclonal. Some of the ANCA epitopes are specific for disease activity. Some ANCA epitopes are specific in remission. So unless we have an epitope specific ANCA to know which ANCA is pathogenic. So when we have a say a sandwich ELISA, we know we have a three, uh, you know, conformational three-dimensional uh, epitope and we preserve. So both of the pathogenic epitopes are three-dimensional. But when you put, on a, uh, put it on an ELISA plate, many times you lose it on a conventional ELISA. So many times what the ANCA that you're picking up may not be pathogenic. So do not treat patients on basis of ANCA. And Mendelssohn 2 clearly showed that CD19 or ANCA-based treatment uh, is not as good as a fixed dose interval treatment. So fixed dose, clinical remission, that should be the guideline. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Prasan. Thank you for such a nice talk. Hi, Sandeep. Yeah, I just wanted to say that no discussion about uh, rituximab can be complete without addressing the elephant in the room of current times, that is COVID. Because giving rituximab is planning a prospective treatment. We have to look into the past also, whether there is what type of vaccination the patient has received, what is the current immune status after the vaccination? Yeah. How do you prepare the patient for a rituximab vis-a-vis -vis vaccination? Yes. yes. 
and then how do you prepare for any eventuality yes. so i yes. just want you to highlight two or yeah. three things yeah. is that do does it make any difference what kind of vaccination the patient is received because we have two vaccines in our country but in all likelihood we would have more vaccines secondly what titers would you do before giving rituximab if you want to give an additional dose of covaxin or covishield how much would be the interval yeah. before giving another dose yeah. of rituximab patients who have already received an induction therapy do for a maintenance therapy now uh, should we delay our maintenance yes. for a little these are small points yeah. I would so appreciate I if very, you give a one line yeah, answer. Yeah. So, so very, very Thank important you. question. So I'll also take you down to what is the latest in this field and then take you back to the conventional. So when we talk of rituximab in the times of COVID, there's always been this concern that with B-cell depletion, antibodies are less. Will these patients be able to fight infection? And the whole COVID, we were really afraid of giving Ritux. The data now comes from the European Society of Immunodeficiency in patients who have primary common variable immunodeficiency. So CVID patients who developed COVID did not have problems. They had very robust T-cell responses. And based on that, what they said is that giving a B-cell depletion therapy may still be viable in patients because if a CVID patients with COVID are able to survive with good T-cell responses. So there are studies now to show that B-cell are not the only arm and you have good T-cell responses, which is good enough to get an, a, a robust uh, you know, uh, protection against a vaccine. But the guidelines... Uh, the ACR guidelines have still said that the vaccines have to be given at least one month before the retux, and if you've given retux, at least four months after. So those are the guidelines. That's what we adhere to. But in a patient where you have to give the drug, you give the drug knowing very well that the T-cell arm of immune response is robust, and patients who have CVID with COVID have shown robust T-cell responses. So, so I think that is the scientific thing that guides us, but these are the guidelines which we need to follow. Thank you. So I talk, uh, Dr. So this is something that... Secondly, that, you know, you, the different brand, because you know, there are Brands are very yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And then after that, brand. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So again, there's a scientific and a practical answer to that. The scientific answer is no, because uh, you know the different brands can have problems. And in Mexico, the deaths happened because of switching from the uh, innovator to the generic, and that was the problem. But in our country, I think now there's enough experience. I did not have much experience, but one of my patients, through one of my patients, when I talked to the R&R &R &R hospital, Dr. Karthik told me, well, we have used, whatever we get, we use it. The next time we get another drug, we use another drug, and we have not had any problems. So quite buoyed by that, but still one has to be careful. I mean, as much as possible, try to stick to the same drug, same company, because they are different molecules, and we know that biosimilars or intended biosimilars are inherently different from each other. So try to stick to the same brand as much as possible, but... Uh, some experience, maybe from the others also, that a switching of brand probably has not made any difference uh, to most of these patients. That's what I've heard from my colleagues. We can, can you stop? Dr. Sujat. That's the next time. Thank you so much, sir, for an interesting and stimulating discussion. Uh, so as today's uh, program is uh, all about sharing knowledge and wisdom uh, so I would like to quote a Sanskrit shloka before moving on to the next session. Nachorhariyam nachrajhariyam nabhratra bhajyam nachabhaskari vayakrite vardhatya nityam vidyadhanam sarvadhanam pradhanam which means uh, the wealth that cannot be stolen, neither abducted by state, nor can be divided amongst brothers, neither it is burdensome to carry. The wealth that increases by giving that wealth is education and is supreme of all possessions. Moving on, um, rheumatology is an ever-changing super speciality with increasing understanding of pathophysiology of uh, autoimmune diseases. We are able to find better ways to diagnose and manage at the earliest, uh, resulting in newer management guidelines and recommendations almost every two to three years. 
in the upcoming session we'll be discussing on the current management guidelines of the commonly seen diseases like ra gia and spa to chair the session may i please request dr pulin gupta sir to come on the dais uh dr pulin gupta is professor of medicine and consultant rheumatology at Al at atal bihari vajpayee institute of medical sciences dr rml hospital new delhi he is a member of numerous institutional university and government of india committees he is also an adjunct professor of medicine at loyola university chicago he is a pg teacher he is a viewer of many journals has written many chapters in medicine updates and books been awarded oration awards twice and has more than 50 publications to his credit uh now i would like to invite the next chairperson dr anu maheshwari ma'am uh, to come on stage um and grace the stage with her presence she is associate professor pediatrics at lady harding medical college and kalavati saran children hospital new delhi she has over 30 publications in books international and national journals is a peer reviewer of various national international journals her areas of interest are pediatric immunology and rheumatology i would request dr sandeep grover sir um at the next chair person to come on the dais dr sandeep grover is a well known rheumatologist and merit whose area of expertise lies in prevention and treatment of rheumatology immunology and arthritis and lastly i would like to invite dr ram pratap saini sir to chair the session he's professor and consultant department of medicine in charge of rheumatology clinic at vardhaman mahavir medical college in safdarjung hospital new delhi for the upcoming talk i would request dr rajiv ranjan sir to come on the stage and begin the session and i would request the esteemed chair persons to kindly introduce him good afternoon everybody so uh, now we have four session regarding the guidelines the recommendations for probably the most common cd in our clinical practice arthritis has HIA and lapidotomy. That these are the four guidelines which the residents need to learn and know the most. One of these will definitely come in their final exam. And we have four prolific and fantastic speakers for all of these four guidelines. The first one is Dr. Rajiv Ranjan Kumar. He is a MD in internal medicine from West Bengal. He is associate from rheumatology department in East. He is DM Clinical Immunology and Rheumatology from. He has more than almost thirty international and national publications. He is a young player, young scholar award from 2018. He has special interest in myositis and vasculitis, and currently working as a consultant rheumatologist at Gram, which is arthritis and rheumatology clinic. Gram also a visiting consultant in CK Bilda Pratik and Park Hospital Gurugram. He is a faculty at ESIC Medical College and Hospital Hyderabad. and occasionally he goes to the big apollo hospital partner over to dr raj thank you sir thank you so much so my topic today is current management guidelines in the rheumatoid arthritis so we all know that rheumatoid arthritis is a typical autoimmune disease which usually presents with symmetrical additive inflammatory polyarthritis so if if this inflammation is not checked it can lead to irreversible damage to the multiple joints and further this inflammation can spill over to the multiple organ causing multiple organ damage so if you look at the different ra management guidelines worldwide so we have more than 20 different management of guidelines uh, in worldwide but we usually follow the acr guideline that is american college of rheumatology and ular 2019 guideline which are the updated guideline so as the evidence emerges we have different recommendations based on the time to time the recent one given by acr is 2021 guideline and the by ular it is 2019 guidelines so coming to acr 2021 guidelines it is based on the pico questionnaires systematic literature reviews and grade approach so acr 2021 has given 44 recommendation the 7 is strong the 37 is conditional the strong recommendation and conditional recommendation is based on the different parameters one is the quality of uh, uh, evidences or quality of research the second is the desirable and undesirable effect of particular recommendation the side effect and the different patient related aspect also and based on that the panelist gives 
uh, strong and conditional recommendations. So ACR 2021 guideline is based on the disease activity of the patient. For those who are demand naive patients, if the disease activity is low, then the hydroxychloroquine is conditionally recommended over sulfasalazine, while the sulfasalazine is conditionally recommended over methotrexate, while methotrexate over leflunamide. If the patient is taking conventional synthetic DMARDs, but not taking methotrexate or having moderate to high disease activity, then the methotrexate monotherapy is preferred over the combination of methotrexate with biological DMARDs or targeted synthetic DMARDs. If the patient is having moderate to high disease activity, then methotrexate monotherapy is strongly recommended over hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, biological or targeted synthetic DMARDs monotherapy, or combination of methotrexate with non-TNFI biological DMARD or targeted synthetic DMARDs. If the patient is uh, having moderate to high disease activity, the methotrexate monotherapy is conditionally recommended over leflunamide, dual or triple DMARDs, conventional synthetic DMARDs therapy, or combination of methotrexate with TNFI biologicals. Regarding the steroid uh, treatment, the ACR recommends that patients with conventional synthetic DMARDs without short-term glucocorticoid, that is the less than three months of dose, is conditionally recommended over conventional synthetic DMARDs with short-term glucocorticoids. While the conventional synthetic DMARDs without long-term steroid is strongly recommended over conventional synthetic DMARD with long-term steroids. So regarding the treatment modification, treat-to-target approach is strongly recommended than the usual care of the patients if they are not taking the biological DMARD or targeted synthetic DMARD. If the patient is already have taken the biological DMARD or targeted synthetic DMARDs and not uh, uh, at a target, then the treat to target is conditionally recommended. The target is based is remission. If not, then low disease activity is conditionally recommended over it. Regarding the treatment modification, these all are conditional recommendation. Addition of a biological DMARD or targeted synthetic DMARD is preferred over the triple therapy if the patient is not at target with maximum tolerated dose of the methotrexate. Switching of a biological DMARD or targeted synthetic DMARD to a different mechanism of action is preferred over than the switching from the same class if the patient is taking a already taken that particular class of drug. Addition of or switching to conventional synth synthetic DMARD is preferred over the continuation of a steroid with conventional synthetic DMARD, even the patient is on target. This is the most important recommendation regarding the methotrexate ad, uh, administration. Oral methotrexate is uh, preferred over the subcutaneous methotrexate. Initiation or titration of methotrexate to a 15 milligram weekly doses over the period of four to six is conditionally recommended over less than 15 milligram per week. If the patient is uh, uh, before labeling methotrexate intolerance, either try to split the dose over the 24-hour period, or you can give the subcutaneous methotrexate, or increase the folic acid or folinic acid before labeling it as a methotrex intolerance or starting a, another DMARDS. If the patient is on oral methotrexate and not at target, then you can switch to subcutaneous methotrexate. Regarding the tapering of biological, uh, de, uh, reba, sorry, regarding the tapering of DMARDS, the ACR recommends that continuation of all DMARDS is preferred, but uh, this is uh, uh, conditionally recommended over dose reduction if the patient V says. If the dose reduction, dose reduction is conditionally recommended over the gradual discontinuation, while the abrupt discontinuation is not at all recommended. If the patient is on triple therapy or having sustained remission, the gradual discontinuation of sulfasalazine is recommended over uh, re uh, tapering the hydroxychloroquine or methotrexate. If the patient is on methotrexate with biological DMARD or targeted synthetic DMARD, the first uh, gradual tapering of methotrexate is recommended uh, over the biological or targeted synthetic DMARD tapering if the patient wishes and if the patient is on target. Now I will discuss about the special population with rheumatoid arthritis. If the patient is having subcutaneous nodules, methotrexate is conditionally recommended over the other conventional synthetic DMARD. And if the patient's uh, developing more nodules, that is the progressive nodulosis on methotrexate, then you can switch to non-methotrexate DMARDs. Patients of pulmonary disease or interstitial lung disease, 
if the pulmonary disease or interstitial lung disease is stable or mild, then metrotrexate is conditionally recommended over the other DMARs. For the lymphoproliferative patients, rituximab is preferred over the other biological or targeted synthetic DMARs. For the patients of heart failure, usually the TNA5 is uh, not preferred. So the non-TNA5 biological DMARD or targeted synthetic DMARD is preferred over TNA5. If the patient is already on TNA5 and are having class 3 or class 4 heart failure symptoms, then switch to non-TNA5 biological DMARD or targeted synthetic DMARD. If the patient is having persistent hypogamma globinemia without any evidence of infection, then continuation of rituximab is conditionally recommended. If the patient is having serious infection in last one year, the serious infection is usually defined as if the patient requires IV antibiotics or hospitalization for particular infection, we call it serious infection. So in this particular patients, conventional synthetic DMARD is preferred over the biological DMARDs or targeted synthetic DMARDs. Try to reduce the steroid as minimum as possible or stop it if you can do it. Regarding the hepatitis or liver disease, for the patient hepatitis B, we have to see two things. One is anti-hepatitis B core antibodies. The second is hepatitis surface antigen. If hepatitis B core antibody is positive, regardless the hepatitis B surface antigen status, if you are planning for rituximab in this kind of patients, the prophylactic antiviral is strongly recommended before starting it. If the patient is having both positivities, like hepatitis B core antibody positive and surface antigen positivity, then you are, you are planning for biological DMARD or targeted synthetic DMARD, then you have to give prophylactic antiviral th therapy. These are strongly recommendations. If the patient is having only core antibody positive with hepatitis surface negative, and you are planning biological DMARD or targeted synthetic DMARDs, then only frequent, mo frequent monitoring is recommended. For hepatitis C patients, those who have already taken or received the antiviral treatment, the recommendation is same as the normal RA patients. And if the patient do not require or not receiving any antiviral therapy, then conventional synthetic DMARDs are preferred over the biological DMARDs or targeted synthetic DMARDs. For the patients of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, methotrexate is conditionally recommended if the liver function, liver function tests are normal and no advanced fibrosis. For the patients of malignancy, like if the, they have already been treated or untreated skin cancer, melanoma or non-melanoma, conventional synthetic DMARDs are preferred over the targeted synthetic or biological DMARDs. If already they have take, uh, taken treatment for solid malignancy, the treatment is as normal RA patients. For non-tubercular lung disease, try to reduce dose of steroid as minimum as possible. Discontinue if possible. Conventional synthetic DMARDs are preferred over the biological DMARD or targeted synthetic DMARDs if the disease activity is moderate to high. If you have to give any particular biological agent, then abatacet is preferred over the biological DMARDs. This is all about the ACR 2021 guideline. Now the EULA 2019 update of rheumatoid arthritis treatment. It has phase three, one, two, three, with four, five overarching principles and 12 recommendations. The most important is conventional synthetic DMARD should be given as soon as the possible uh, when the clinical diagnosis of RA is made. Treatment should be at target, and our target is sustained remission or low disease activity. Methotrexate should be the first line treatment. Active monitoring is required. If the patient is having active disease, then monitoring one to three months are advised. If no improvement at three months or target is not achieved by six months, then adjust the dose. This is the phase one treatment. First, the diagnosis of RA is made. The second, if uh, look for contraindication of methotrexate. If there is no contraindication, then start methotrexate. If there is contraindication for methotrexate, either you have to give leflunamide or sulfasalazine, along with the short-term short steroids. Monitor your patient at three months or six months. Add at least 50% improvement at three months expected, or target at six months. If this is yes, then continue the treatment. If not, then you have to modify the treatment. Modification is based on the poor prognostic factor in phase two. If the patient is having poor prognostic factors, then you have to add a biological DMARDs or JAK inhibitors. If poor prognostic factors are absent, then you can add or change to another conventional synthetic DMARD, that is leflunamide or sulfasalazine. The poor prognostic factors are moderate to high disease activity, even on the patient, even if the patients are on conventional synthetic DMARDs. 
high rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP, high inflammatory markers, high swollen joint count, if the patient is having early erosion or failure of two or more conventional synthetic DMARDs. Uh, again, after this, you have to assess at three or months or six months. If the target is achieved, continue the treatment. If not, then you have to modify the treatment. And in phase three is like the similar one. You have to change one biological DMAR to another or change to another mechanism of action and assess at three or six months. So now the recent thing is difficult to treat RA. What is difficult to treat RA? The EULA recommends that uh, according to the EULA guideline, if you are giving the treatment and there is failure of two or more biological or targeted synthetic DMARs, after failing the conventional synthetic DMARs, this is the first criteria. The second is there is sign or symptoms of active or progressive disease, which is defined as moderate disease activity or sign or symptoms of active inflammation inability to tap, taper the steroid to less than 7.5 mg per day, rapidly re radiographic progression, or if the patient is having reduced quality of life. And the third is management of sign and symptom is perceived as problematic by the rheumatologist and the patient. These three criteria should be pre present to fulfill the difficult to treat RA guidelines. For difficult to treat, you have to really assess that the definition actually meets or not. The second thing that you have to assess the rheumatoid arthritis mimics. Sometimes the patient may have some different disease and you are treating the patient are not responding. So misdiagnosis should be reassessed. The second thing is just uh, assess the patient with some other illness like the check for inflammation, arthritis. If clinically not possible, you can also use ultrasound or you can also check for the other like fibromyalgia-like conditions. And... Uh, if another point to check is adherence. This is the most important factor in day-to-day -day or clinical practice. If patient is taking the drugs properly or not, if adherence is yes, then you can discuss the all treatment and optimize difficult to treat uh, patients. So summary of the all guidelines are like conventional synthetic remarks should be given as soon as the possible. Monitor disease activity based on the inflammation or high disease activity. If it is high, then frequent. The target is remission or low disease activity. Methotrexate is the best initial therapy. Biological demand or targeted synthetic demand should be kept only for those patients who are having persistent active disease even after the conventional synthetic demand. Steroids or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs should be given as minimum as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Just, a, just summarize the changes in the present guideline, the previous. The most important thing is like, uh, uh, if the patient is having, taking, a, like first is conventional synthetic demand. Uh, this is the, the primary treatment even in 2015 and 2021 guideline. The second is the steroid. In, uh, in 2015, they have uh, advised for the use of low dose steroid. But in 2021, it is like ACR is usually conditionally recommended or try to uh, advise that uh, use of steroid should be as minimum as possible. Without a steroid treatment is preferred over than continuation of uh, long-term steroids. The third thing is uh, earlier uh, recommendation is that uh, you can give, uh, it is preferred that uh, targeted synthetic demand or biological demand if inadequate response you can uh, uh, switch to different mechanisms of action rather than having same group of drug. This is the one thing that is, they have modified. On the vaccination than before triple demand, right. pressure or before biological. Yes, sir. So the, so vaccination uh, uh, recommendation has not been updated in the 2021. It is similar to the 2015 that uh, for, uh, uh, for inactive, vaccine, inactive vaccines can be given before the con uh, during the treatment of conventional synthetic demand or even on uh, biological or targeted synthetic demand. Live vaccines should be properly, we have to monitor, uh, and it should not be uh, given uh, if the patient in on, on treatment of biological demand or targeted synthetic. Booster vaccine, your vaccine, has been started on right. Cannot give a yellow fever vaccine. It is absolutely necessary to go to South. Do we have any questions from PGs? Any recommendation uh, where to use rituximab or TNF inhibitor over and above? We know uh, the target is right. Right. Uh, right, sir. 
Sir, for uh, rituximab, those patients who are uh, having lymphoproliferative disease, this is the one biological demand which is preferred over the other biological demand. While the anti-TNF, the one thing that we have to uh, monitor is heart, uh, heart failure. A patient having class 3 or class 4 symptoms, you should not give the anti-TNFs. You have to prefer other biological demands over the anti-TNF. I want to know one thing more. Told about the uh, pose of metrotic shape, oral preparatoga, subcutaneous. The, the maximum dose is 25 milligram. If you go beyond 15 milligrams, whether you prefer uh, subcutaneous or go ahead with uh, sub or uh, it's uh, the uh, like. Uh, Still, if the patient is tolerating well, no problem with the tolerating over the 15 milligram. So I don't think ki it's clearly mentioned in the guideline, but uh, uh, what I feel ki the, the same dose can be continued. If someone is having problem with tolerance can be divided into two doses if it is uh, not tolerating the high dose. Sir. Per kg. Not so they are very clear in stating the fact that uh, uh, the body mass index of patients differs a lot from population like us. So 15 to 20 million of those can be intact. Just a small query. Right. Dr. Malia Sandy. Just a few points about uh, the treatment. Uh, it was very uh, nicely presented and I'm very happy about it. Uh, there seems to be widespread misconception and misunderstanding about methotrexate. I'm not talking about rheumatologists. I'm talking about non-rheumatology colleagues. They think that this is probably related or it is the same drug which they use in, in the department there, which is called cancer. This drug has nothing to do with that and it should not be even named in the same breath. And it number never can cause cytotoxicity because the dose needed to suppress DHFR is so low uh, for treating rheumatoid and it only stimulates to produce adenosine as against to stopping the cell cycle and DNA where you need two log order higher doses which goes in grams. And if you read the literature, 13 grams of methotrexate are given, have been given there with five um, grams almost a right. routine, while we never hardly ever go above 25 milligram once a week. This is a very important point. Never, never equate for the non-rheumatologists here with that cancer drug. It has nothing to do with that. And I'm giving a talk in, in uh, the Iracon that methotrexate, LD and HD are two different drugs. And I have already written three major papers, which you must have read. Secondly, methotrexate, um, some, again, non-rheumatologists have this feeling, why methotrexate? There are so many good drugs, let us give that. But why? When the guidelines are clearly saying there is no drug till today, which can work as well, singly, as well as the best of best targeted and biologicals, they don't right. work that well unless you combine it with, with methotrexate. And I'm emotionally con connected with methotrexate because I used right. it for the first time in 1968 in autoimmune diseases. So anybody talking against methotrexate, I get very upset. And I'm again aiming again at those who are non-rheumatologists because they have all kind of issues. And now I have three or four, I can show it here and Kapoor has more. The type of schedules they keep on giving in methotrexate and the most wonderful was that I saw three days ago. 2.5 milligram on Monday, then 5 milligram Tuesday, Wednesday, and then on Saturday 2.5 in the morning, 1.5 at night or something like that. I have taken a photograph of that. Please don't do any such rubbish things. It's once a week drug. But remember that if you go above 15 and you want to give oral, split it into uh, equal doses at 12 hour interval at night and then the next morning breakfast is the most ideal way to give it. 
And lastly, one small point. No, no, we can't give it because everyone has intolerance. They start vomiting. There is an uh, anticipatory um, side effect. Uh, oh, Dr. Malviya ka naam sunte hi ulti aane lagti hai. वो उनका क्लिनिक का शक्ल देख के हमको उल्टी आती है वो उसका रेफ्रिजरेटर में जो पानी रखते हैं हम पी नहीं सकते तो दिस इज एंटिसिपेटरी एंड इट इज ऑल ड्यू टू दिन रिसेप्टर इन देंट्रल नर्वस सिस्टम वाई कॉन्ट यू जस्ट कवर दैट एडोनसिन रिसेप्टर इन सी एन एस एंड रीड माई पेपर कॉफी एंड कैफीन एंड आई कैन टेल यू इफ यू डोंट लाइक टू टेक कॉफी Six cups of day, I do. I mean, it's a, it prolongs life. Uh, you can give sting. sting. There's a new Caffeine. red, uh, small little Caffeine. drink which children keep on taking, or dark chocolate. Chocolates. Big, big pieces, two of them, and especially obese ladies. Sorry, <laughs> it's not sexist remark. But obese people also here. Obese men also here. Um, they love to take dark chocolates, two big pieces, and after that. the adenosine receptors are covered by caffeine and this problem after about 3 weeks it never recurs very peculiar and i don't know the reason for that and then they they get stuck to methotrexate for life and you just saw the man this morning who is on methotrexate now 30 years 40 years nothing last but not the least methotrexate never produces any lung disease except acute hypersensitive pneumonitis which is so rare that we don't see it in fact in interstitial lung disease and you showed it beautifully i'm so happy even american college of rheumatology which is so um, it will never recommend anything it says well now you can give methotrexate even in ild right. thank you right sir so this is basically rheumatology गुड आफ्टरनून सर सर आई वॉन्टेड टू नो जस्ट लाइक दे आर के डो की गाइडलाइंस इन सी के डी एंड ई एस एल डी गाइडलाइंस इन सी एल डी फॉर डाइट्री रिकमेंडेशन डाइट्री रिकमेंडेशन आर देर एनी डाइट्री रिकमेंडेशन फॉर रोमोटोड आथर आइट इज ऑल्सो there is no such uh, dietary recommendation in ra but yes usually what we uh, uh, that obesity is the one of the major risk factor for rheumatoid arthritis disease activity so we usually recommend those things which increases the weight should be restricted and uh, many in anti inflammatory diet we have uh, that uh, some uh, more food fruits vegetables and dry, some omega 3 fatty acid these the products which are having this anti inflammatory can be taken in higher quantity but there is no such recommendation uh, that i know thank you so much thank you so much thank you so much sir for such an elaborate of discussion next i would please request dr sujata sani ma'am for uh, the upcoming discussion to come on the stage welcome ma'am uh, dr sujata sani is the senior consultant in the field of pediatric and adolescent histology She limits herself to this area and leads a team of doctors at the Institute of Child Health in Sir Ganga Ram Hospital. Welcome, ma'am. Looking forward to your talk after adult RA. It will be interesting to hear a little bit about GIA. That's right. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm standing between you and your lunch, so I'm going to make this really brief. I'd like to congratulate Uma for this wonderful conference and giving me an opportunity to talk to you today. So I'm going to talk about current management guidelines and recommendations in juvenile arthritis. Now uh, these are standard papers which are usually published by the American College of Rheumatology. They are available free text online, and you can go and look at them and look at what the recommendations are. What I'm going to do is to spend a little bit of time on the ethos as to why these guidelines have been developed, and I'll talk to you about the nuanced approach to the child who presents with arthritis. So juvenile arthritis, first of all, is an umbrella term. and it encompasses a very heterogeneous group of inflammatory arthritis and amongst these groups we have seven classes as you're all very well aware where about and these classes were put forward by the international league against rheumatism in the year 2001 thinking that these are clinically homogeneous conditions and if you go back and look at the genetics of these patients you will then probably get the answer as to why these clinical phenotypes 
are so homogeneous. However, it didn't work out that way. And when genetic studies were done, it was found that in fact, these patients are very heterogeneous genetically. And this ethos that was developed for the classification system is not holding very well, such that the current classification system is under revision. And you will expect to see something very dramatically different in the next six months to year. And then you will see that the classification of juvenile arthritis will be aligned to what's happening in the adult world. So let's pick up an example of a child with systemic arthritis. These children, if you have 100 children with systemic arthritis, they actually fall into two groups. The first group is an auto-inflammatory phenotype, where the child has very significant fever and rashes and organomegaly, and they calm down very dramatically with steroid, and then they do not develop very difficult arthritis. However, all of us who've been in this field for long enough know that we struggle with the second group of patients who have an autoimmune phenotype, and once the systemic features die down, they have very difficult to control arthritis. And honestly, it may be worse for the child to have the second phenotype of systemic arthritis than develop acute leukemia. We know that acute leukemia of good risk is 90% curable, and the child takes chemotherapy and is off medication and has a wonderful quality of life for decades. But if you are stuck with the second type of systemic arthritis, believe me, it can be very disabling physically for the child and mentally for the treating team. Extremely difficult. Let's pick up this other so-called homogeneous group of enthesitis-related arthritis. Again, these children are very heterogeneous. We have the child who presents with repeated acute uveitis and can, that can sometimes blind the child. We have an occasional patient with isolated inflammatory back pain. We have the other child with recalcitrant enthesitis. And then we have a child who gets ankylosing tarsitis because you cannot control the inflammatory disease of the midfoot. Now, clearly, you can't have one treatment paradigm for a child with enthesitis-related arthritis. So what is, what is this uh, got to do with the recommendations? It's got to do with the recommendations that you have to personalize the treatment choice for every patient. And what does that depend upon? That depends upon, broadly speaking, what is my disease category. For instance, if I have systemic arthritis, then I'm not going to choose an anti-TNF therapy because I know that the drivers of disease are IL-1, IL-6, and IL-18. And I'm going to choose one of those cytokine blockers. What about the disease burden? If I have a child with oligoarthritis who's running around like a lunatic in the room and has one swollen knee joint, that child has to be treated very differently to a child who has got oligoarthritis with a fixed contracture of the knee, who is non-weight bearing and has got an aggressive uveitis. Then I've got, got to look at the prognostic features of the subcategory in front of me. So in a child with polyarthritis, if my patient is rheumatoid factor and or anti-CCP positive, we know that as a group, these patients are going to have an adverse prognosis. So my treatment choice is going to then be guided by the positivity of an anti-CCP in a patient. Let's look at something else that you must take into consideration, and that's the time to diagnosis. We know the concept of window of opportunity is critical for the good outcome of the children. So I tell my fellows whom I've been training for more than a decade that there are only two things that matter in every pediatric rheumatic disease. How quickly did that patient come to the correct team? And the second thing is, how quickly did that patient attain remission as defined by objective criteria? then believe me, it doesn't matter whether you attain remission with rituximab, hydroxychloroquine, paracetamol, whatever. You have to get that patient into remission quickly and see the child early. And therefore, when you have a late presentation, that is an adverse prognostic feature. So if I have a seropositive patient who's come to me three years after treatment, after diagnosis, and has currently been on some funny Ayurvedic concoction, I would treat that patient very differently to someone I see within six weeks. And these are the nuances that you have to pick up as you decide how to manage the patient. I have the bullet and I will use is very different to I have the bullet and I will use this bullet correctly for the particular enemy in front of me. And unfortunately, what of course, we are going to look at comorbidities. So if my patient has inflammatory bowel disease in the context of uh, HLA-B27 inflammatory back pain, I'm not going to use secukinumab for that child because I know that anti-IL-17 is not a good drug for an inflamed bowel. And again, if I have a child who's ANA positive and has uveitis, I know I will use a monoclonal antibody to TNF rather than to use a 
receptor fusion proteins such as etanercept. So, of course. And then something that we were never trained for is the affordability. So, you ask your question then that the current recommendations, and I will show those to you, suggest that a patient with systemic arthritis should be treated with either anti-IL-1 or anti-IL-6 blockade up front. Now, am I ethical to tell a rickshaw puller's daughter that you should start on anti-IL-6 blockade? So, what we forget as physicians sitting in, you know, institutes like All India Institute is what about that man on the road? And were you trained that you have to treat the patient in the context that the patient is presenting himself to you, not in the Western context? And unfortunately, the ACR guidelines are only meant for 10% of the children who are born in the privileged part of the world and not for 90% of the children that, you know, we have the very good fortune of trying to help. And therefore, your pharmacological intervention has to keep all these features in mind, has to be early and appropriate. We must have access to a multidisciplinary team and we must intervene early in these patients. And broadly speaking, the models of care in pediatrics are step up. That is to say, you begin standard and step up to biologic. Occasionally, when you have high risk, high burden, poor prognosis, you may want to want to step down. That is to say, if I have a patient who has a complicated uveitis and has got a vision of 660, is four years of age and has got uveitis ANA positive with just one swollen knee, then I'm going to use a monoclonal antibody. Why? Not for the joint, for the eye. Because I know that if the child is under seven and doesn't see well, and that patient's occipital cortex is not going to perform and that child will be subjected to amblyopia, which is lifetime blindness. So we have to be able to understand the exceptions where you're going to use step-down therapy. All children must be objectively assessed and you can use any objective assessment that you're comfortable with. In our unit, we are very comfortable with the Wallace criteria. We don't use what is called the JDAS, which is Juvenile Arthritis Disease Assessment Score. I find it a bit peculiar that it's a standard of care assessment tool where you stop at a joint count of 10, right? So if you have a joint count of 10 or more, you just get X number of points. But if I have a child who comes to me with 20 joints and after eight weeks, that child has now got 11 joints, well, the JDAS is not going to move, but my patient is 50% better. So probably in the Western world, you see children who present you very early and they don't have this horrific disease that we tend to see all the time. So JDAS, to my mind, is not a very great outcome tool if you have a child with very high disease burden. So that is, again, nuanced as to what you want to do. And then the Western population really emphasizes upon the protocol of shared decision-making. So you can't, sitting in the United States, tell a mom that, okay, start off an Anna Kendra, 10 milligrams, sub-Q, every day for the next five years. She's going to ask you, what's Anakendra? What's the data? Where does it come from? And you have to legally protect yourself. So shared decision making. And I think because of the shared decision making, the ACR recommendations that I'll present to you uh, for juvenile idiopathic arthritis are at best vague. They are vague. They don't talk about the dose of methotrexate. They don't talk about the route of methotrexate. They don't talk about the time interval you have to wait for the methotrexate to be effective. A lot of these are data driven. They are to legally protect the societies. And I think it's also because of a shared decision making. Uh, when you have the parents sitting in the room as physicians talk about guidelines, so they are at best vague. And I don't think that anybody can be confident enough to treat a patient after reading these guidelines. What are these recommendations based upon? The recommendations are based upon evidence. And we have uh, double blind randomized controlled trials that is type one evidence uh, for many of the biologics which are used. And all the trials in pediatrics have used one protocol. So all the children are given the trial drug in an open-labeled fashion. After X amount of weeks, the responders are then shifted to a double-blind trial. And the double-blind trial, two times to one ratio, you give the trial molecule versus placebo. After X amount of weeks, you unblind the trial. And then all the responders are given the drug in an open-labeled fashion. So when you're giving in a blinded fashion the trial molecule versus the placebo, you're looking at the time to flare. 
And the second very interesting thing is that when you look back at all the trials, whether it is adalimumab, infliximab, etanercept, uh, golumumab, all the patients that have been recruited are the ones who have a polyarticular course, not a polyarticular onset, a polyarticular course in which will be included enthesitis related, so right thick, the extended oligo, the zero positive and the zero negative. So it's a disparate group of children who have been given the drug. However, this classification paradigm has not been followed. And then if you look at the ACR70 response, which is a very robust response, you see that whether the drug is sub-Q or IV, there are some differences, but most of the molecules are giving more than a 60% ACR70 response, which is very robust. And when you look at the trial data and look at all the biologics which have been used, you see that the percentage of patients who flare on placebo, which are the bars in yellow, is roughly twice as much as the patients who flare on the originator molecule. So again, very robust data that is uh, showing us the evidence for these uh, recommendations which are now going to follow. If we keep it really simple, you look at this paper which has been published in Nature Reviews by uh, Professor Alberto Martini from Italy, and it's a wonderful paper that talks about the paradigms of management. Essentially, when you have a child with more than with less than four joints that we call oligo, you can start with an NS8 monotherapy, but very quickly. Now that very quickly depends upon how impatient you are. Between two to six weeks, you should step up to an intra-articular steroid. If the patient is not responsive, how much time do you need to wait? Not mentioned, but it's prudent to wait for at least four months. You could then go ahead and use methotrexate. And if the patient is still flaring in a further three to four months, you could go ahead and add an anti-TNF therapy. So that's broadly for the oligo patient, for the poly patient. You should start with methotrexate. Three to four months, your patient is not responding. Add an anti-TNF therapy. If you look at the data from the uh, British Society of Pediatric and Adolescent Rheumatology, the BSPAR, the most commonly used molecule is adalimumab, followed by etanercept, followed by uh, anti-IL-6 blockade on the sub-Q route. And I think the reason to use adalimumab much more than etanercept is the fact that in the Western world, 60% of the children you see are oligoarthritis, and those children, 70% are ANA positive, and that's the group that is going to get the uveitis. So if you want to use an anti-TNF therapy, again, it's nuanced, and they don't talk about it, but if you read between the lines, you use a monoclonal antibody in an ANA-positive oligo patient, even if that child does not have uveitis, because we know that etanercept can is known to trigger uveitis flares in children who've never had uveitis prior to being given the etanercept, right? So that's the polyarticular cause. Methotrexate, not working, anti-TNF, not working. The data suggests better to switch to a different class rather than a different molecule and a subtype of the anti-TNF therapy. When you have systemic arthritis, uh, the current data, and I'll show that to you, suggests anti-IL-1 or anti-IL-6 upfront, which is clearly not possible in our country. And all these children, you should follow the treat to target strategy. So your objective assessment should bring you down to a zero physician score, a zero patient score, a normal acute phase response, no febrile features, no active uveitis, and no active joint. And that's a time point that you cannot achieve for a child who presents with late disease, where you may want to go to what we call minimal disease activity. And again, that's got different cutoffs depending upon what kind of outcome measure you want to use. And for these children, you have to personalize the choice by doing a regular assessment of the disease activity, by changing the therapy at regular goals to achieve the target, by sharing the decision making with the parent, by making sure that you've abrogated inflammation, and most important, avoidance of long-term steroids. So remission in juvenile arthritis is remission without steroids. We cannot use one milligram per kg ad nauseum in a patient who has systemic arthritis and think that, you know, we've done it because the child has zero disease activity. So it has to be remission without steroids. And for the first time, the treat to target strategy has suggested that we should have a 50% achievement of the disease activity reduction within three months and remission within six months. And when you talk about disease activity, you have to look at all the domains of disease that that particular patient has. 
And once you achieve the target, then you monitor the patient carefully. There are several outcome measures. We won't go into those details. And with that background, you now have just published hot off the press. You have the guidelines for oligoarthritis. The boxes in deep green are those options which have got a strong recommendation and the light green ones have the conditional recommendation that depends upon the level of evidence. So oligoarthritis, treat with intraarticular steroids, not doing well, step up to methotrexate, not doing well, go ahead and step up to an anti-TNF therapy. But there's no consensus for duration of NSAIDs. Sub-Q methotrexate is preferred. There's no discussion on the dose. And of course, you must avoid oral steroids. And these pictures just show you that how you treat the child in panel 3 will be very different to how you treat the child in panel 1. There's a separate recommendation for the temporomandibular joint. Interestingly, this is one joint that you should not inject willy-nilly. Only inject if the patient is symptomatic. Why TMJ? Because TMJ growth is occurring in children. And if in case this, this joint is involved in juvenile arthritis, you can get tremendous deformities of the face and you want to avoid that. So you have two children showing you jaw asymmetry and a child showing you micrognathia. So if the child has got TMJ involvement, please step up to methotrexate quickly. If the child is yet not doing well, step up to anti-TNF. Only if the child has got significant symptoms, then you should inject the child. And that's because you can damage the disc which is present within of the TMJ. So it's one joint which is an exception that you shouldn't be very gung-ho in injecting. The systemic arthritis child, like I said, whether or not the patient presents with macrophage activation, the upfront therapy is anti-IL-1 or anti-IL-6. And I think this is not possible. Methotrexate goes right down and it is used after anti-IL-1 or anti-IL-6 only if the child has got persistent joint disease. And very interesting, a moderately sick child with macrophage activation syndrome can be treated only with anti-IL-1 or anti-IL-6. I have strong exceptions to this recommendation. If you see a child on 1st May who is moderately ill and you give an anti-IL-6 blockade, how do you know he's not going to be severely sick on 2nd May? So we don't have the courage to use upfront biologics, especially with the absence of anakindra. If you give anti-IL-6 blockade to a child whose blood culture turns positive after 48 hours, you're done because the drug is in and is there for 15 days. I don't think these choices can be directly translated to our population at all. So those recommendations of 2022, and then you have the older recommendations for polyarticular GI, and this is exactly what I showed you with Professor Martini's paper. We then have recommendations for sacroiliitis. This very much follow the ASAS recommendations, where for sacroiliac disease, you use NSAID. If the child is not doing well, you go ahead and use anti-TNF therapy. This recommendation does suggest that you can use sulfasalazine for SI joint disease after NSAID if the patient has a contraindication to anti-TNF therapy. So that is mentioned. There's a detail on how to manage enthesitis, which is again NSAID and if refractory, go ahead and use anti-TNF. So like I said, there are many ambiguities which have been left unaddressed. What's the timeline to step up or step down? What's the root and dose of methotrexate? You must individualize the approach. So for instance, if I have a child who has marked improvement with some disease, I might want to wait some. But if I have a child who has very aggressive disease with not much change, I may want to step up sooner. So because clinical care is nuanced, timelines have not been mentioned at all in these recommendations. And there's no discussion of what you do if you come from a resource-constrained background. And these publications have just come about last year, uh, last month, so just a few weeks ago. And subsequent to that, we have two more licensing for GI. One is the use of tofacitinib for polyarticular GI, which is licensed by US FDA and the European Agency for methotrexate and anti-TNF failure, not as a substitute for methotrexate and not prior to anti-TNF therapy. We also have the new licensing for secukinumab for enthesitis-related arthritis for children over four and for psoriatic arthritis for children and over two. So to conclude, I work in a wonderful institute. I've been here for more than two decades. But we look after children who come from rural background. We look after children who have lots of roadside vendors who try to offer care. 
we have a lot of societal pressure for alternative care we have very poor health insurance coverage we don't have a health care coverage for the 1.33 billion which i'm told as this meeting is going on has gone up to 1.34 billion and the public expenditure from the government is abysmal abysmal if you look at the data we spend 16 us dollars per capita on health in india and switzerland Switzerland spends six thousand nine hundred and forty-four dollars per head. We have one of the richest people in the world, and then we have the kid who scavenges to survive. So, to my mind, I think the biggest difficulty we face is not following the GI recommendations from the American College, but how do we address the issue of inequity and poverty that we as clinicians face every day? And for the children who come to us, those little girl children. they have no advocates they can be taken to homeopathy to ayurvedic they can be given no treatment they can get osteoporotic fractures they can become blind we have no social service we have no child advocate and one fine day we get nasty reviews in google where people say that we went and met I dr xyz i'm finishing last line we went and met dr xyz and you know my child is today blind and xyz should never be gone to so that are the problems that we grapple with not the acr recommendations thank you thank you ma'am for the wonderful talk and i completely agree with you that the poverty and the inequality in our country but i think things are getting better and i would like to share something like uh, in we had a patient with systemic onset gia he had severe refractory mass we treated him with methylprednisolone pulse and uh, cyclosporine but she did not respond but uh, we were able to procure anakinra for her and uh, anakinra is a wonderful drug and we have given that child anakinra for 3 months now and initially as we tried to taper the pulse after 5 days the patient continued to have fever and we were waiting for anakinra so another modality which i have used in two three patients and they respond very well is the tapering of the pulses like if you give 30 for three days or five days and then you can go on to maybe you know uh, 20 for three days then go on to 15 for three days then 10 for three days then 5 for three days i think they published from chat pgi chanding or a small correspondence to that debate and that patient does very well so ma'am i think we have to keep on being innovative and uh, and i think you do you did a wonderful job with the talk thank you so thank much. you my remit was uh, acr you. my remit was recommendations of right. course we do know how to innovate and use the steroids yes, but can you see that it's not mentioned in the acr recommendations Absolutely, up front ma'am that's it. i think malvia sir had a... yeah i know we are short of time but if you want to learn diction voice modulation and how to express yourself in a language which i think is first language for her we all learned how to speak this language so jata you are great thank you sir but i would like to just mention one thing for those again who are non rheumatologists a child with one swollen knee is not tb a child who has two swollen knees one earlier and now is not rheumatic fever they are all what you were talking and i think people should understand that and stop this nonsense of a single joint tb 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 why tb they haven't learned about gia thank you sir i think most of them undergo arthrotomies in the private sector and it's sad when they come to the clinic with you know theek ho sakta hai bachcha aap usko operate kar dete very very sad why it's thing hey Uh, Dr Anu I have to take exception to that comment you made about private sector I can show you a lot of goons in the public sector so I'm sorry I take exception to that comment thank you I didn't mean it like that that elementary the orthopedicians in the in whatever sector thank you Thank you so much, ma'am, for an informative and interesting uh, discussion. I would like to invite our uh, next uh, speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure to call upon Dr. V. Chaturvedi, sir, for the next discussion. Uh, and I would request the chairpersons to introduce him. I would. Uh, I have. I can't have enough words to. Pioneer in trail business. Was one of the earliest alumni from this. 
Yes, now a senior. He has been a listing Kennedy Institute, and then uh, he has been ex president okay. of Institute of Industry and Delhi He has been forced to establish the department at Haridwar Hospital. Now, Persian departments of Delhi. Presently, sir is working at Sir Karam Hospital as a senior. He has been a pioneer as one of the earliest persons to be able to use biologists in our country and has tremendous experience in the field of SPA. Sir, over to you. Thanks for the kind introduction. A respected chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I must thank Dr. Uma. After a long time, we are meeting. We are so excited about it. Excellent. Uh, as introduced, I was working earlier in this hospital. Youngsters may not be knowing Army Hospital. Now I'm working in another equally good hospital. And my brief is to talk about this. Look, whether surprisingly, whether early disease or late disease, recommendations for encouraging spondylitis are safe. So that's very important. So don't have much issues, whether it's an early disease or a late disease. You can call it uh, radiographic or non-radiographic or early disease or a bamboo spine. The recommendations are same. So that's very interesting if the recommendations are same. And also for the encouraging spondylitis in females. So the recommendations are all same for all. The four broad categories of approved treatment. Very simple, you have inflammation, you have inflammation, so you have anti-inflammatory drug, and we know physicians and orthopedic surgeons, everybody knows about the non, uh, the NSAIDs, how to use them, which one is good, which one. So first drug remains the anti-inflammatory drug. And of course, the physiotherapy or physical exercises, and other drugs which we are using for the last 20 years, anti-TNF drugs and IL-17 inhibitors which have been added. The guidelines, don't try to read about uh, you know, all those societies, Spartan and this. Basic, basically, ACR and ULAR, these two leaders, they employ people and then they join together and then they, they may make guidelines and we have been reading, especially students, that 2016, the ACR guidelines came, and 2019, it was supported by the, uh, the, uh, the Spartan group, and now the ULAR guidelines came in 2010, and now in 2017. Mostly they are similar, if you really ask me, what we are practicing. And there are a few differences which are there which have been discussed by earlier speaker, how these guidelines are made. If youngsters also sometime, if seniors are sitting, they must know how these guidelines are made. These guidelines are made on, based on evidences, recommendations. Some people call it guidelines. Somebody says uh, the, the recommendations. They don't call rules. No, basically, we, these are all guidelines only. And we some every time methodology change, sometime you raise about 70% people say, okay, this should be used, TNF we are using. So that is how it is. So grade methodology is used. The most important slide is this, which Dr. Sujata was also talking about. Applications of these recommendations must be individualized. These are not Bible or Quran or something that has to be. So these are the recommendation must be individualized, requires careful assessment. You just don't read and start practicing. So careful assessment, Sound clinical judgment. Now, what is a sound clinical judgment? It comes from training. It comes from experience and patient preferences. Look, I'm a poor person. I can't afford anti-TNF. So definitely I'll choose other drugs. So patient preferences are also very important. You must remember. Now, non-pharmacological, a lot of people ask what should be done in encouraging spondylitis. So we all know that, yes, there are evidences that physical therapy and regular exercises this is as important as pharmacotherapy. There are moderate evidences. There are low evidences. The low evidences is probably that it improves pain, stiffness, and spinal mobility. But there is a moderate evidence that it improves physical function. No doubt about it. We know that it improves physical function and disease activity. 
And there are some evidences are there with that it improves the ASDAS, BASMI, and reduce serum calprotectin level also. Now, if you, I don't know to, uh, 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 that you should read it, but you must remember, suppose you have ankylosing spondylitis, and I tell you to do exercise, you will not do it. But if you're supervised, so that's why it has come, supervised growth physical therapy. If you're 10 people sitting there and do, do a thing, so there is a, if you do it, this is better. That is what the recommendation is. When we came in, when we, I was doing my DM from SGPGI, a lot of stress was there on the, on the swimming pool and the aquatic. So the recommendation is land-based physical therapy interventions over aquatic therapy. Because aquatic therapy is probably difficult to organize. Patient will keep searching for a swimming pool. So you must remember that land-based physical therapy has been advised. And of course, the, uh, the screening for osteopenia and osteoporosis should be done. NSAIDs. Now, that's very important. Close to everybody, whether, whether it's a rheumatologist or orthopedic surgeon. Patient asks, should I take daily? Should I take continuous? So, continuous NSAIDs over on demand. A lot of people may object that, you know, people will not take, especially Indians. So, that's why the first slide. Individual. If I'm a South Indian taking a lot of chilies, or if I'm in Punjab taking a lot of chilies, so you have to modify as a good clinician, it's not that you have just written take NSAIDs every day for whole life for two years, three years, four years. So recommendations are there, no doubt about it, that if you take a continuous NSAIDs, they are better. They stop probably the, uh, the, the, there are papers, which I don't want to read those papers, that yes, it definitely improves the structural damage. So it stops the structural damage, but on demand, over own demand. So people ask the doctor, I can take it every time. So we say if you can take continuously, it is better than we explain it. And 50% achieve control with NSAIDs alone. This is the first drug of choice. This must be, should be initial treatment. And if you are a good clinician, you ask, believe me, if you ask, doctor, when I take this, though I don't take it daily, but if I take this, it improves symptoms. It improves peripheral arthritis. It improves uveitis. It improves anthocytes. So everything it improves, no doubt about it. There is no preferred NSA. Which one? Which one to take? Nobody knows. The patient asks, Dr. Malviya had this given me, I don't want to suit. I said, you take the other one. So basically, it is just patient preference called cafeteria choice. So a lot of people ask, what should? So it's a cafeteria choice. Patient will say, hey, Dr. Malviya, I like this person. Try if one is not working, another one, and try for two to four weeks if it works. Don't give it up that it is not responding. Then after NSAIDs came the anti -TNA. This man in 19, in 2002, 20 years back, not now, 20 years back, Lancet paper, double blind, yes, anti -TNA works in encouraging spondylitis. But nobody believed it. Britishers didn't believe it. He was a German. The people who discovered the anti-TNF, who made anti-TNF, they didn't believe it will work. The story of ankylosing spondylitis, youngsters, you must remember, it was like osteoarthritis, that nothing will work. I have seen it. I have seen it. Dr. Malviya has seen it. Our generation, Dr. Malviya is much senior, that we, we thought it, nothing will work probably. So then it came, anti-TNF, it was in 2002. And I always show this. Why I show? Because I have worked. In 2002 to 2004, I had Jurgen Brown tried on 27 patients. I had about 100, more than 100 patients in the Army Hospital because I had a drug for rheumatoid arthritis. I had patients also. Army is full of, of the male patients, so more encouraging spondylitis. And we presented also. This was our first, first patient in 2002. That time only infleximab came. And we presented also in APLAR that yes, they are effective, and if you use judiciously without loading dose, no tuberculosis. Then these are the recommendations. Now, these are the recommendations of ACR that anti TNF works. So, since uh, probably I've seen this doesn't work, anti TNF, whether you use one, two, three, don't remember, you all know as a student, uh, the, the, yeah, this works. So, uh, basically, A, B, C, D, E. Whatever, 
whatever NTTNF you use, it will work. And it will work about 40 to 50 years. So if you take a ACR 40 response, almost roughly about 50% patient will respond. 50% patient may not respond. Some, uh, some works better, like the, we know it, if you really, this, if you see this, the volume map, volume map response is roughly about 54%, better than others. But it responds whether you see the axial disease or a peripheral disease or enthesitis, dactylitis, uveitis, IV, everything in response. Yes, if somebody has a uveitis, somebody has a IBD, we know this, we, we use the monoclonal antibody, so we use itinacept. So whether it is a, whether it is a, in the clinical trial in ankylosing spondylitis, you see this is ankylosing spondylitis. Okay, so use the uh, the TNF inhibitors, it works. Uh, then the, uh, the uh, sorry. So use the NS8, then it works. I think it's disturbing whatever is happening, I really don't know. So the TNF is the first line of therapy. It is basically recommended over IL-17. No preferred TNF. When to use biologics, these are the ULAR rheumatologists. The diagnosis should be done by a rheumatologist. And with the active disease like elevated CRP or positive MRI. And failure of standard treatment, at least two NSAIDs over two weeks. Patients with predominantly peripheral arthritis, Kefali is here, that uh, the, yes, sulfasalazine also works. But as per recommendation, it works in peripheral arthritis and high disease activity when as does and bias die is high and positive rheumatologist opinion. And when the TNF failure, and what is a, I think in this, uh, is it audible? Okay, so, uh, so when the TNF, uh, what is a TNF failure? It is basically, if the TNF fails, how it fails, you are, you are, suppose you are giving infliximab and it is working. And after, say, you, you, I think it's not working. Uh, if TNF is, if first TNF is working, then you can use another TNF. But if, it is a, if you use TNF, it doesn't work. So in primary failure, you change to IL-70. If a secondary failure, then you choose to another IL, uh, another anti-TNF. That is how this slide says. The IL-17 inhibitors is the, when anti-TNF fails or anti-TNF are, Contraindicated. So, what are the contraindications for? These are the contraindications. Since we are all using anti TNF, this slide is very important. You must read this slide that yes, there are contraindications to anti TNF. Probably in a busy clinic, we really, so basically, there are congestive cardiac failure, demyelinating diseases, previously untreated tuberculosis, recurrent chest infection, septic arthritis. Last, last batsman. So, if the IL-17, this is the, uh, the tofacitinib, it works. It is like, I film because of this. That everybody is prescribing tofacitinib. If you really ask me, even the recommendation, it works on axial disease, peripheral disease, enthesitis, dactylitis, uveitis, skin. Except if you are, we are, since morning we are discussing the jack inhibitors, you must remember the first question you should ask about when you're using jack inhibitors, IBD. IBD is very common and we are missing IBD. So contraindicated in IBD, that's very, very important. So this is the last drug which you use. So basically it's a active AS despite treatment with NSAIDs and when the anti-TNF, either they are contraindicated or they fail, then you can use the tofacitinib. A stable disease, I think I have one minute, so I'll try to finish. If your disease is stable, there are guidelines for ULAR and ACR. The ACR says, as Sujata was mentioning, tell me, if some patient asks me, can I take it whole life? The ACR says, you can't reduce it. You can't taper it. You can't change to biosimilar. It's probably there are some, uh, definitely a commercial bias. While the ULAR says, if six months the disease is stable, if patient is comfortable, if patients are uh, is asymptomatic or acceptable level, 
then you can reduce the dose. So dose reduction and tapering is very, very important. And we must learn this crowd how to taper the dose. And we must follow the ULAR guidelines rather than ACR guidelines. Steroid basically is no role. Systemic steroid has no role. Yes, locally you can inject. And T2 target strategy is no more. So ACR has made it comfortable that you need not to make a, uh, the T2 target approach. If you are a clinician and if you feel the disease is stable, asymptomatic, then you can see it's a, it's a, it, it is a T2 target every time you are measuring, all this is not required. Comorbid condition, iritis, you must include ophthalmologist, IVD. As we, I said, you should remember that you should not jack inhibitors. So the last slide is, this, I'll just come to the last slide. The first line therapy is physical therapy and NSAIDs. Then you can use TNF inhibitors. If the TNF inhibitors fails, then you can use IL-17. You can change between TNF inhibitors if there is secondary failure and tofacinib in active disease despite NSAIDs. No role for systemic steroid. There's nothing like T2 target strategy. As a good clinician, you are the one. You decide what is an active disease. And comorbidity management should be multi-team uh, multi approach. You must involve the ice of thermologist. And role of surgical management is important. That you must remember this slide. There's no role for, for spinal osteotomy or spinal manipulation. So that's very important. A lot of people come. A lot of people are there. If you have a this kind of test, there's no role for spinal manipulation or spinal osteotomy. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We are just within just a minute of time. Organizers have requested for no questions after this. Okay. Thanks. That's it. Thank you. But it was a wonderful talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Now, may I please invite our last speaker of the session uh, on the dais, Dr. D.S. Bhakuni, sir. Uh, if I may request our distinguished chairpersons to introduce him. Dr. Moon, at the outset, I want to thank you to the organization for giving me the opportunity to hear this important session. So, you know, it's my honor to invite uh, Dr. D.S. Bhakuni, sir. And uh, sir, has the work, uh, he's a consultant rheumatologist at the Manipal Hospital, Dwarka. He has more than 40 years of experience. Okay. And uh, he has a special interest in uh, inflammatory arthritis and osteoporosis. Please, and without wasting much time, I request With sir this, to start the proceeding. Not, no? yes, the topic is on psoriatic arthritis. What are the <laughs> recurrent recommendations? Over to sir. Uh, thank you, the chairperson. And thank you, Dr. Professor Omar, for inviting me. My lecture is very simple. It's not for the uh, you know, two benches or two rows who are sitting in front. They can go to sleep. But I could see some of the back benches, they were sleeping. It's such a simple lecture. It is meant for all of you. Oh, no, no, I mean, no, strings attached with this lecture. Absolutely simple. And uh, is it, am I audible? Those uh, who are sleeping, they can wake up. Now, the topic for today's uh, uh, talk is... Current management guidelines and recommendation in psoriatic arthritis. Now let's see, why should we know about psoriatic arthritis? Because we hardly see the patient of psoriatic arthritis in our day-to-day -day practice. But it's important because 30% of the patient of psoriasis, they develop psoriatic arthritis. That's important. And 20% of these, out of these psoriatic arthritic patients, they have permanent joint deformities and loss of function. And psoriatic arthritis occurs usually after 5 to 12 years. However, it may accompany the skin lesions. But when does the problem occur? The problem occurs when it comes before the skin lesions. So how do you diagnose? How do you suspect? The few features are the involvement of, I mean, the occurrence of dactylitis. That is uniform swelling of one of the digits, either toes or either fingers. So if you have dactylitis and the patient has come to you, after ruling out uh, sickle cell disease, tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, and bacterial infections, please suspect that the patient may be having psoriatic arthritis. And next is DIP joint involvement. All of us know that very few diseases have involvement of, uh, they have involvement of DIP like osteoarthritis, reactive arthritis, you know, all those things, but suspect psoriatic arthritis in these conditions. 
Now, the remission is also possible in like in rheumatoid arthritis. That's why we must treat these patients as early as possible. And 60% of the patients of psoriatic arthritis, if they are on biologics, they go into remission. But what happens? The moment they go into remission, we tend to taper the disease or stop the disease or the patient may himself or herself stop the disease. But remember that the disease comes back with a vengeance. So we should be very, very careful while treating and you know, tapering or stopping the treatment. Now, what should be our strategy? The st uh, typical strategy is treat to a target strategy. It was supported by International Treat to Task Force, EULAR and GREPA. And why this treat to, uh, uh, treat to target approach? Because it has shown that there are significant benefits in disease outcome, the quality of physical function of the patient, and the quality of life. The overall, overall quality of life improves. And all these things are possible because we have the newer insight into the pathogenesis of this disease. Now, this TICOPA trial, just forget about that. The good points what we have taken from TICOPA trial is that if the patient is treated, the aim should be having that the patient should have minimal disease activity. And how do we know that? The few of the points should be less than one. And what are those points? Less than one tender joint, swollen joint, passive score, and enthesitis point. And few of the points are like patient VAS score or visual analog score should be less than 15. Global disease activity of the patient should be less than 20. And HAC score should be less than 0.5. This should be our target when we start the treatment of the patient. But what is the irony? The problem is that only 56% of the healthcare professionals, they stick to this kind of treatment, this kind of strategy. And what was the target basically? To have achieved the minimal disease activity. But disadvantages are also there. Because if we go for this tight control or the treatment of the, uh, uh, this disorder, there's an increased adverse effects because we are using much more medicine and much more powerful medicines. Increased visit to the hospital and increased expenses. And the most important thing is that therapy should be individualized. Discuss with the patient, sit with the patient, tell him that this will be the expenditure and this will be the outcome. This will, this will be the adverse effects. Or do you prefer oral medication or do you prefer injectable medications? You have to give time initially to the patient. And the, that is what I've written, that patient education and doctor's role is enormous in our country, where we have less resources. In abroad, I mean, foreign countries, they have the insurance, but our patients, they do not get the insurance except those patients who have, they are panel patients. So we have to sit with the patient, make them aware, chart a plan of treatment that suits the patient. The cost effectiveness, just a comparison. In our country, it takes around 30 to 40,000 uh, 40, rupees if you are using biologics also, like tofacitinib or baricitinib, not the injectable biologics per year. Look at the cost involved outside. Without biologicals in US, it around $5,000 per year. With biologics, four times more, 20,000. I'm not audible. Who all are sleeping? Raise your hands. No one is sleeping, okay. In UK, the bio, with biologics, again, 20,000 pounds. So the enormity of the expenditure matters. But luckily in our country, we can do away with that. Of course, if the patient is of middle class or if he has some kind of help. And that has been made possible because of the reduced doses of Jack Kennedy's inhibitors as well as other biologics. Biomark is not very important, the treatment. Two categories of, uh, you know, uh, uh, patients we can have with mild psoriatic arthritis where there is an involvement of four or less than four joints, no radiological evidence of any damage and minimal functional impairment. Beyond that, everything is either moderate or severe. And what are those poor prognostic markers where we can, you know, talk to the patient that, look, the outcome may not be that rosy as you have been told. So what are those things? The increased number of inflamed joints, Increased CRP level or ESR, failure of previous medications, presence of joint damage and loss of function and poor quality of life. You must raise the red flag. Look, I am trying, but the outcome may not be as good as I expect. So EULAR recommendations. Now I, I'll be coming to the recommendations. EULAR and ACR recommendations, that's all. It Again, the target is to get the remission or low dose activity. They have recommended that for the musculoskeletal activity, just give 
symptoms, just give NSAIDs, which I'll tell about later on, why shouldn't we stick to that. For local enthesitis or arthritis, they have you know, recommended local steroids, which all of us give, and avoid systemic steroids. But I will not agree with this because if you avoid systemic steroid and if you can give them in low doses, the patient will bless you. I haven't seen any aggravation of skin lesions during for last 20 or 22 years. I was speaking to Professor Malvi, I said, he has also not seen. But I was work, you know, participating uh, with the dermatologist friends. They were very chary that they said, we do not give any steroids, thinking that, you know, skin lesions may be aggravated, which I have not found. Pharmacological therapy, few terms like OSM, oral small molecules, all of us we know that methotrexate, sulfasalazine, lefnanamide, and anti-TNF inhibitors. My lecture is basically a repetitive lecture. All those three speakers who have spoken to you, you know, that will help me. And But repetition is a good thing so that something will stick to you and the carry home message will be good. Now, Yola recommendation, it says that patient with polyarthritis, start with conventional synthetic, uh, synthetic DMARDs, methotrexate and we all of us we do with that and patients with mono or oligoarthritis with poor prognostic markers you know start with methotrexate again patient with peripheral arthritis with inadequate response within three months consider biologics but what we consider here jack inhibitors because of what reason cost factor and if re with relevant skin involvement the recommendations say that you must consider il-17 inhib inhibitors or il-12 or 23 inhibitors Peripheral arthritis with inadequate response to any uh, synthetic DMARDs and at, at least one biological DMARDs, then they have recommended JAK inhibitors. And if mild disease with inadequate response to the uh, conventional synthetic DMARDs and in whom neither you can give biological DMARDs or JAK inhibitors, then you must consider PDE4 inhibitors, which is we usually use for the mild disease. Patient with enthesitis with inadequate response to NSAIDs and local steroids, please consider biologics. And patient with axial disease predominance, all of us, we know that we have to use TNF inhibitors, otherwise, no, you, uh, you know, we do not get any good response with oral molecules. If axial disease with relevant skin disease, the ideal drug will be IL-17 inhibitor, like sacucinumab and other things. Patient failing to respond to biological demands is basically jugglery. If one drug does not act, you switch over to different biologics. That is what it says. Or patient with sustained remission. Sustained remission means the patient is absolutely all right or those factors which I told you with the minimal disease activity for last six months, the cautious tapering. Please have it cautious tapering. That is what they have recommended. Now, ACR guidelines are also similar, almost similar. They were based on systemic literature review and expert opinion. Six percent, only the, the interesting thing that whatever they recommended, six percent recommendations were strong, 94 percent were conditional. And it That's also five highlighted, minutes. sorry, five minutes. five minutes. I am seeing, half of the time I am seeing there only. <laughs> anyway. As I told you earlier, there, uh, they also said that individual, you know, uh, individual is important for the treatment. Sit with the patient and discuss all those things, you know, uh, but about the finances, about the ease or mode of this thing, which I have already spoken. If they have recommended that in active psoriatic arthritis, you have to give TNF inhibitors over the small molecule, oral small molecule like methotrexate. They have said, don't start with uh, methotrexate. But again, they have recommended that if the choice is given, IL-17 inhibitors or OSM, start with OSM or tablet methotrexate in simple language. Methotrexate is recommended over NSAIDs. Remember in ULR they said in for musculoskeletal system, use only NSAIDs. But here ACR say no, you use methotrexate or other oral small molecules. And IL-17 inhibitor recommended if possible over uh, IL-12 or IL-23 inhibitors. So, and if psoriatic arthritis, despite your methotrexate and lefnormide, it does not improve, switch over to TNF inhibitors or switch over to JAK inhibitors. Other considerations. If the patient prefers oral medications, best is, uh, you know, with, uh, oral small molecules like methotrexate and lefnormide or tofacitinib. If the patient has inflammatory bowel disease, consider IL-12 or 23 inhibitor or tofacitinib, which will be better. Cost-wise also. If the patient pref uh, prefers less frequent dosing, 
consider IL-23 uh, or 12 inhibitor. If the patient has serious infections, avoid all these inhibitors, consider abatacept. If the patient has recurrent fungal infection, consider tofacitarib or JAK inhibitors. If the patient has diabetes, uh, Start OSM rather than methotrexate or IL-12-23 inhibitors. I don't know the reason why have they written. Professor Malia sir may reply later on. In diabetes, why not methotrexate? I don't know. If with uveitis, of course, methotrexate we can start. Non-pharmacological therapy is as good as the patient asks you, doctor, I'm acupuncture or physiotherapy. Don't say no because he's asking for some certificate from you. Will this be beneficial or not? It will be better than not to have those things. You recommend the patient has faith on you. He will, I mean, improve also with those things. And of course, cessation of uh, smoking and reduce obesity. Grappa recommendation, I'm not going to this thing. Just so take home message. I think I'm going to finish within time. Start methotrexate or any uh, conventional synthetic DMART at the earliest. Do not wait for the NSAIDs only to act. Local steroids for enthesitis and arthritis must give. Avoid systemic uh, steroids, that is what the recommendation say, but in practice, if you don't treat the patient or you don't take away the pain of the patient, the patient will run away to some other rheumatologist or, or any other specialist. Give low dose steroids. What I give, 15 milligram once in a day for 15 days, then 10 milligram for 10 days, then 5 milligram for one or two weeks. The patient is happy. Never ever I've seen any aggravation of skin lesions. Affordable jack inhibitors can be started instead of biologics due to cost factor. Watch for the adverse effects. Ask for four, you know, four weekly or eight weekly, all the tests we are aware of. For axial disease, biological DMARs, TNF inhibitor or IL-17 inhibitors are preferred. Tapering with caution, as I told you, that the disease may come back with a vengeance. So we have to, you know, uh, taper very, very gradually. Thanks for listening and viewing my these things. That is what I got. Thank you so much, sir, for an excellent talk and preaching well in time. I think all speakers have done an excellent job. Please give them a big hand of applause for all your speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Due to shortage of time, sir, we are not taking any questions. That's why I have so Answers are not guaranteed. That is what Thank I have written. So much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for an elaborative discussion. I'll invite uh, all the respected faculty members and all the delegates for lunch. And uh, our uh, panel session would start exactly 30 minutes after. Please be back uh, at 2.35.
हेलो 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 चैप्टर्स हेलो ठीक है Good afternoon, all. We are going to start post lunch session. I request all delegates. Auditor. Dear resident, Pathology M Delhi, welcome you all. Post lunch session of today.
I have an important announcement to uh, make before next session. Certificate of participation will be given to all registrants, and it will be available after 4 p.m. Trends of opinion leads to inquiry, and inquiry leads to. With this spirit, proceed to our first panel discussion. Topic for first panel discussion is pregnancy and lactation in rheumatic disease. We will try to focus on common autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, antiphospholipid syndrome, SLE, and scleroderma. For this, I would like to invite our esteemed panelists to the stage. Our first panelist for the session is Dr. Sanjeev Kapoor, sir. I request Dr. Sanjeev, sir, to kindly come on. Dr. Sanjeev is Senior Consultant Rheumatologist in Indian Spinal Center, Vasant Kunj. Next, I invite on stage Dr. Hemant Sarma, sir. Dr. Hemant is HOD of Medicine at NDM Medical College, Tura Hospital, Delhi. He is actively involved in DNB teaching for last 50 years and is an examiner of DNB. Also, joint editor of journal Current Trends in Diagnosis. Next, I invite Dr. Ghansham Pankte, sir, as a panelist. Currently, Dr. Ghansham is Professor of Medicine, LHMC, Delhi, and in charge of has been editor of reputed API textbook, time to Our next panelist for the session is Dr. Kali Khanna. I invite her on. She is additional professor in internal medicine at Chandi. Chandigarh. She has received many national and international awards, including Young Scientist International Fellowship by Indian and Japanese College of Rheumatology International. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Atul Kakkar as the moderator for this. Dr. Atul Kakkar, professor of medicine and vice chairman, Department of Sargangaram Hospital. He is president elect of Delhi Rheumatological Institute. Sir has received many prestigious awards for Jan Oration Award for Best Physician. Sir, kindly come on. I'd like to have so much, and we'll just very clear. So, uh, we have let me start with uh, Dr. Shah. The topic one is rheumatic disease. Current very recent women's health in Dr. Shifali can Uh, with that, uh, do you think that uh, like what happens to the activity? Seronegative rheumatoid arthritis, they, uh, they fare well. 
in compare in comparison to the sero positive or the anti ccp positive patients but there is no data as to the titer is high and rheumatoid factor or anti ccp that has any correlation with the uh, bad pregnancy that okay. happens so uh, that's very clear that the majority of the patients they have remission but dr vinson what happened during uh, postpartum period and during lack uh yes sir i think that is also important like look at for the patient uh, has a because of the immune tolerance during uh, this pregnancy but uh, there is a study then uh, which suggests that uh, postpartum period there may be flare of rheumatoid arthritis so we should be very cautious in these uh, rheumatoid arthritis patient uh, there has been a series of patient from norway where they have found that they, if patients are there uh, like postpartum up to 24 months almost 2 years so chances of uh, flare of rheumatoid or new rheumatoid diagnosis is increase in those years so we should be uh, observing these patient postpartum and uh, patient who are already on uh, disease modifying drug for uh, rheumatoid arthritis so we can give some safer drug like uh, sulfasalazine and all add on or with or with or without steroids if there is a flare and uh, just suppose to that like rheumatoid we have a uh, two thirds of the patient has uh, better prognosis with the pregnancy while actually is opposite to that so there is more two thirds of the patient has exacerbation during uh, pregnancy but rheumatoid has better prognosis and postpartum there is exacerbation okay. what about lactation is it uh, that period is little different for patients with rheumatoid or it's uh... uh, yes sir but uh, lactation also there is an increased uh, chances of exacerbation because with lactation there is increase a hormone called lactin uh, synthesis which is a pro inflammatory uh, state so this hormone also causes increased uh, flares of rheumatoid so postpartum period with lactation chances are more so there are some advocacy that uh, uh, if someone has a more a major flare uh, breast feeding should be taken care of but still uh, for uh, fetus and all and uh, newborn uh, uh, breast feeding should be continued Uh, but clear is their postpartum as well as lactation uh doctor very just tell us about like we know that uh, during the pregnancy the patients are well controlled but can we anticipate that and we can improve the outcome uh, in the postpartum period or how can we improve the outcome uh, for these kind of patients i think the best way to do outcome is to uh, plan for conception till the visit is finished Yeah. We should minimize the drug therapy before the plan of conception, which is just pre-fetal pregnancy lactation, and we should we should have a multidisciplinary approach to minimize. Because we, uh, if the patient is already in active stage, they become pregnant, they, have, they find that there are more chances of having hypertension, ED, premature deliveries, more for gestation age babies, and there are more chances of having severe infection. All these things can be prevented if they plan for conception till the disease is under control. Uh, that is quite clear. Uh, Dr. Kapoor, can you just tell us how to treat active rheumatoid with various uh, biomarkers and biological uh, agents, etc. Right now, yes, uh, Dr. Himmel, that's right. Um, we should plan that. I mean, it is recommended that around six months uh, remission should be there before we plan the pregnancy. But nowadays, I mean, because the fertility is low and infertility rate is increasing. so we say that i mean whenever i see a patient who is in age group uh, who requires uh, pregnancy uh, we want to put the patients within 3 months in remission for that what i do is uh, we put the patient on the methotrexate hydroxychloroquine and corticosteroid for 3 months if patient is not in the orbit and increase the dose every 2 months and if patient is not ready for remission i usually prefer now the tofotamib to be added on the combination therapy uh because of the various reasons which i can tell but i mean uh, i want a within 6 month patient should be in deep remission and we can be able to stop the steroids once that happens i shift the patient to on to the sulfasalazine for 2 months if patient remains uh, in remission after the treatment and uh, topotenum has been stopped uh, then we start planning for the pregnancy and patient conceive once patient is conceived as uh, everybody is saying that i mean patient goes into remission so usually for Uh, for two months or three months, I do not give uh, uh, sulfasalazine. I give hydroxychloroquine and corticosteroid and intraarterial injection in between because 
Although, I mean, we have a safer drugs which are available to us, but still I feel that, I mean, organization is going on and there is a lot of apprehension minds of patients as well as gynecologists uh, um, also. So usually I do not give for three months. And after that, that if patients say, well, we have it, I'm not getting of drugs which are available to us, uh, which we give. For example, I mean, sulfasalazine is very good drug which is, uh, can safely be given to them. Corticosteroid or intraarticular steroids can be given to uh, these patients. And even if the patient does not uh, uh, comes into remission with uh, uh, with consultation with the patient, we can use technical also in this, this point of patient because that is safe in pregnancy. And if patient is still not in uh, remission or is just flaring up, then we have choice of giving uh, TNF alpha blockers to uh, deep uh, second trimester. And before the third trimester, it can be given. Although cetrolizumab is not available in India, but I mean, theoretically speaking, it can be given throughout the pregnancy also. The other option which I give to these patients is before going for the limit, uh, uh, for the pregnancy, time that is up to six months or one year, patient does not require any medicine. So if patient is zero positive, has high disease activity, not controlled by and requiring which is it, uh, and as well as uh, corticosteroid, I give them rituximab up front, and so patient goes into deep remission and they uh, can take care for the uh, pregnancy. So these are the strategies which I employ for treatment of uh, in, in pregnancy. So can you tell us which drugs are big no for you know pregnancy if the patient is taking that in rheumatoid? Yeah, I mean, we divide these drugs into four categories and uh, moderate and severe fetal risk the medicines are there, for example, we took say So how early after delivery can you reinstitute the methotrexate in case, you know, the patient was requiring that? I think uh, the message is very clear that uh, the disease activity does improve during pregnancy, but in the postpartum period, there is a relapse. And there are certain drugs which are not to be used, which have been mentioned very clearly. And how to treat also has been mentioned very clearly. Now let's go to the other disease, which is lupus. Uh, and let's find out what is the effect of lupus on pregnancy and vice versa. For that, let me invite uh, Dr. Shefali. Uh, can you tell us the effect of lupus on pregnancy and vice versa? And because of the inflammation, the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis is disturbed. So they have a lot of uh, patients cannot conceive. In this, uh, so uh, first of all, when to plan pregnancy in these uh, in patients of lupus? So they uh, first of all they should be in remission, and uh, generally, if any patient has uh, nephritis, that is a bad prognostic sign, and uh, uh, the patient should be on hydroxychloroquine, and that should not have been stopped. 
So, and there is a big no to there. Uh, there is a big no to four or five conditions where uh, lupus patients should not get pregnant. One is that if they have a creatinine of more than 2.8, and if the proteinuria is more than 0.5 grams, and if the cardiac involvement is there, or there is severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. probably pick up uh, uh, this condition earlier we are more aware of increasing immunosuppression and dealing with these complications so as far as the, uh, the complications for the fetus are there we have all kinds again small birth weight babies IUGR abortions and of course with patients who are low and la positive we always are scared of encountering the neonatal lupus syndrome so uh, besides this, we have new disease activity indices which are uh, tailor-made for pregnancy like you have the uh, SLE dye, we have the SLEP dye which, uh, uh, which is only for uh, the pregnancy. So lupus activity index for pregnancy. So there are different indices which look into disease activity of lupus during pregnancy. And uh, what is more important is that uh, once these patients they come to you, it is very difficult for us to establish the diagnosis of a lupus flare because there are certain physiological changes that take place sure. in the lupus pregnancy like the complements. The complements normally decrease in lupus whereas in pregnancy the, they increase. So one level, one reading will not tell you or will not differentiate so serial readings are required. And uh, practically, it is uh, not easy to differentiate uh, flare from uh, uh, the uh, the eclampsia. So they are the practical problems that we keep on encountering. So you mentioned uh, very briefly about the autoantibodies which should be done. So let me call now Dr. Heyman. Can you suggest a workup for these patients, a preconceptual workup for patients with lupus? Preconceptual assessment is important to assess the risk of pregnancy as well as a fetus. And they, that takes into consideration various factors. You know, what is the activity of the disease before they are planned for conception? What is the organ involved in this? And what is the severity of organ involved? If the organ involvement is very severe, in fact, it's a contraindication for the pregnancy. Then we can have various autoantibodies to analyze it, like anti-row, anti-la, anti antibodies. Again, the age of the mother is important because more the age uh, worse is prognosis. If there is past history of bad offspring outcome, this is again a bad pronostic uh, marker of uh, pregnancy outcome. Similarly, if there is any history of use of any psychotropic drug uh, before pregnancy, taking all these factors into consideration, uh, pregnancy is divided into three profiles, so like low risk profile or moderate risk profile or high risk profile. Depending on which monitoring can be, sequential monitoring can be decided and therapy can be decided. So let me now come to how do we treat uh, patients who got arthritis or cutaneous manifestations during uh, uh, you know, pregnancy in patients with lupus. So Dr. Shafali, can you just throw some light on that? What, how to treat arthritis and cutaneous manifestations in lupus patients? Yeah. We generally give hydroxychloroquine in these patients and steroids. And the only other drug which we can give is sulfasalazine. So we generally don't give anything else. So is hydroxychloroquine safe and is the safe for, you know, dose is there like for... Yes, absolutely. We yeah. continue the same dose uh, which the patient is generally having. But the only thing which we have is steroids which we can increase. So that is the only thing which we give for musculoskeletal involvement. Nothing else. 
Okay, uh, Dr. Ghansham, does it uh, change the management of the patient with rupsus nephritis, like, uh, you know, the drug profile and uh, how would you manage such patients of lupus nephritis in pregnancy? Uh, yes, sir. lupus nephritis, like uh, kidney involvement and brain involvement, these are the major hormone involvement and that can be fatal to these lupus patients. And Dr. Shefali already told that uh, monitoring these patients are difficult in pregnancy state. Like proteinuria and all, these are common in third trimester. A lot of protein uh, uh, secretions also changes, ESR, CRP monitoring. But still, we should do the monitoring first to manage this patient. So, ideally recommended is uh, uh, around 8 to 12 weeks, we should have ultrasound of these patients uh, to see the fetal uh, well-being. And we should have a monthly and this uh, uh, management should be a multidisciplinary approach. So there should be involvement of a experienced obstetrician, there should be involvement of a rheumatologist and a nephrologist who do look uh, lupus nephritis patient and maybe a later part a new nephrologist will be a good thing to look after because some patient who has anti rho and la positivity they can develop a complete heart flop. So these patients may need a regular uh, echocardiogram uh, during later part of the pregnancy, almost two to four weekly to see that uh, if there is a complete heart block and they may need a pacemaker. So regarding monitoring, every monthly we should have a, a urine protein uh, checking uh, followed by we should also do uh, routine examination and every three monthly we should do complement levels, we should do urea creatinine and creatinine maybe every monthly we should do. Regarding care of uh, disease per se, like uh, we have already talked, uh, it may be a uh, lupus uh, or a nephritis flare or a kidney flare or it may be a non-kidney flare. So non-kidney flare like mucocutaneous or a musculoskeletal involvement is there. Uh, that can be taken care by hydroxychloroquine and maybe a steroid. Uh, ideally in early phase, it should be less than 20 milligram per, key, 20 milligram per day should be used because uh, high dose of steroid may also lead to uh, clap palate and other deformities. While lupus uh, nephritis, if developed in pregnancy, especially sometimes these uh, patients may have a flare of uh, RPGN or rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis. So that may need a kidney biopsy, uh, which can be done in maybe a second trimester. First and third we should avoid. And if there is a lupus nephritis, RPGN, uh, we should take a decision that uh, how to treat that also is a difficult decision. But sometime taking care of uh, cyclophosphamide is a uh, cytotoxic drug, but still uh, seeing patient condition, we may have to use cyclophosphamide also, second trimester. Otherwise, uh, routine care will be uh, doing, uh, giving a hydroxychloroquine and uh, steroid on a lower dose side. And uh, these pregnancies should be elective uh, pregnancies. Patient should be explained and they should be in remission ideally three months at least three months of remission because a lot of patient may be on ACE inhibitors and all. So these antihypertensives also has to be stopped at least three months back. So ACE inhibitors will be a contraindication for pregnancy. So if you have a multidisciplinary approach, we can take better care of and better outcome of pregnancy. That's very important multidisciplinary approach where it improves the outcome. So uh, Dr. Kapoor, is there any, uh, like you have a personal information about uh, whether B cell therapy is, can be used in pregnancy in patients with lupus uh, nephritis? So uh, what is said, basically the literature says that it should be avoided, but since it's a larger molecule, although the, uh, there is, uh, you know, the drug profile can be found in the uh, placenta, but normally there is no effect actually. 
So uh, this comes, uh, let's come to the next question now. And uh, we were discussing with Dr. Shefali during the lunchtime about the contraception, which is an issue which basically we don't discuss with our patients, especially with lupus. And I believe it's a major issue. And uh, uh, Dr. Shefali, can you just throw some light on that? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody who is deep, not yet finished, Kapoor, you want to add something? One is a complicated in the way that when the patient has the uh, going for cyclophosphamide or some uh, these kind of directory, then uh, the own quality or own to so there is a good amount of data which is coming up that we should give uh, DHA to patients so that uh, the follicles goes into the efficient uh, state. More importantly. People are advocating is that for the go for the preservation of the uh, eggs also. Awesome. That uh, I mean, uh, whenever they go into remission, they use that. So these mm. things are coming up in the literature, and uh, in India probably we are not looking this aspect very well. So uh, we all are aware that you know the antiphospholipid may complicate pregnancy, and uh, so Dr. Kapoor, can you tell us about what are the practical tips which we should be doing to take care of this? And uh, very good. Then there are yeah. two types of patients comes to me for the apla with the apla. That is one are asymptomatic. They have apla positive because gynecologists ask them to do so. Those cases they are asymptomatic. It is patient wanting to become pregnant. My advice is that. I mean, if it is really positive and two times it is positive and IgG level high, that will be easy. So, I mean, if the two anticoagulants are uh, I then I mean, I prefer that we, although there is no recommendation that like that, but I'm um, happy. The second group of patients are those who have uh, uh, atrial or uh, arterial or venous thrombosis mm -hmm. there and they become pregnant or any pregnancy problem. So in these conditions, whenever they become pregnant, uh, we recommend that they, they should be on therapeutic as well as aspirin, uh, should be given to them, them and we, we give uh, exaprim 40 mg twice a day, we for kg 40 weeks, we given to them, we can give the delta pregnant also. We preserve uh, funda present, we don't use it often, uh, but I mean sometimes we have to use it when the patient has a uh, uh, different injury. That will be of fundaplexin. And uh, we continue uh, this kind of 
intelligent collectively and 24 hours before we stop heaven and seven days before we stop oxygen so that we should go for oxygen uh, whatever so the regenerative system patient put back on the earth again for those who have arterial venous the other is uh, in the background where we see losses there or morbidity is there there are two kind of uh, those who have uh, um, fetal loss in those cases collected that means pregnant pregnant i prefer to use it looking also it is although it is not recommended uh, in uh, in, uh, in the guidelines but i mean i prefer it and i have given that uh, after that uh, pregnancy is continued for 6 weeks postpartum also very important that i have lost two patients and like that during the postpartum the shorter duration patient third group of patients are those who have uh, pet or eclampsia related or they have iugr this this patient also we give aspirin uh, in pregnancy along with hydroxychloroquine if there is bad prostate is there uh, we may give uh, low molecular weight heparin there is that that and cesarean section is taken if six and so that some also for the regarding the delivery you can So this is the broad guideline. Yeah, so those are the things which we should follow. So thrombocytopenia is a very common finding, in, especially in pregnancy. And there could be multiple reasons, and one of them could be due to antiphospholipids also. And it is usually sometimes difficult. So, Dr. Ghansham, can you tell us how to treat uh, severe thrombocytopenia during APS? Uh, yes, sir. I think uh, literature suggests that 25 to 30 percent of the APLA syndrome may have a thrombocytopenia. and uh, late trimester like after 20 weeks and all help syndrome and all they also come into picture and they also comes with thrombocytopenia so if uh, like sle with apla syndrome is there uh, complement level crp level may help us in diagnosing that it is active sle and ap uh, active apla syndrome uh, thrombocytopenia will be issue although uh, thrombocytopenia is common but usually it's not very severe Uh, most of the time it's around 50 to 80000 90000 is the platelet count and they usually don't bleed so it's more of a thrombotic disease apla syndrome and the bleeding is less uh, likely but still because platelets are less you have to do some procedure like uh, epidural anesthesia and all delivery time so you need to uh, improve the platelets so recommendation is steroid so we can use low dose steroid and if it is severe thrombocytopenia like uh, less than 20000 or someone has active bleeding so there even uh, methylprednisolone pulse can be given or in very severe cases iv ig can also be tried uh, as a rescue uh, procedure uh, but it's common and these will be the uh, depending on how severe it is we can give it and uh, although apla syndrome as a steroid is not a drug of choice only in thrombocytopenia and maybe a catastrophic apla syndrome may require steroid otherwise uh, like dr sanjeev already said uh aspirin and uh, low molecular weight heparin or uh, unfractionated heparin will be a good choice i think that was a very fruitful uh, you know discussion and there are many issues which we have left because of paucity of time but we can discuss over tea or something thank you so much i'm extremely thankful to our esteemed panelists and moderator for this wonderful panel discussion we will proceed to our next session for that i would like to invite chair persons on stage first i invite dr aradhna singh ma'am as chair person dr aradhna is professor and founder head department of rheumatology and clinical immunology sms medical college jaipur she has received many prestigious national awards including excellence awards for academics and sn parikh memorial oration award She has many publications in various reputed national and international journals. Next, I invite Naval Mendiratta sir on dais. He is senior consultant rheumatologist, Fortis Memorial Research Institute, Gurgaon. Doctor Naval. Next, I invite Doctor Arvind Kumar sir on stage. 
Dr. Arvind is editor of book Post COVID Clinical Issues and Management, which has been published recently. He has more than 100 publications in various indexed national and inter international journals. He has received many prestigious awards, including Atal Swasth Bhusan Samman 2019. Next, I invite on stage Dr. Survi Vyas, Madam, to deliberate on the topic Imaging Modality in Common Rheumatic Diseases. I request esteemed chair, uh, chairpersons to kindly introduce the speaker for this talk. So, uh, uh, welcome Dr. Sundi. She is the additional professor of radio uh, in the department of radio diagnostics at AIMS New Delhi. And I would like to just introduce by saying uh, one or two sentences that we here in AIMS for our all, all diagnosis related uh, issues for in dermatology, we always go to Dr. Sundi Vyas. So, I found many, many, many departments. Over to you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Arvind, for the kind introduction. And I thank all the organizers also for giving me this opportunity, especially Dr. Uma Ma'am. So the topic that I have been given uh, stays true to my speciality, that is imaging modalities uh, to be used in rheumatology, how, when, and what. So this talk is going to be a brief outline on what imaging modalities we have in our armamentarium and how we can pick and choose among them to ensure the best clinical outcome. So whenever the question of imaging comes, there are a few questions that our rheumatology colleagues ask from us. So the important question is whether actually there is an inflammatory process going on. If it is going on, what are the sites and extent of involvement in the body? If the pattern of involvement can give a hint towards a specific diagnosis, and when the patient is on treatment, whether there is a response to treatment, which can add on to the clinical parameters, and if there is any complication. So based on these questions that are asked, there are this list of indications that we see commonly whenever we have a requisition for an imaging, that is to establish and confirm the diagnosis, monitoring disease activity, response to treatment, and identifying complications. In addition to these indications, there is a very important indication that is for outcome assessment of new treatments and research, which we are fortunate to be a part of an institute where research is given so much importance that we have to take into consideration this indication also. So coming to the first modality is radiography. So radiography, even when we are talking about a musculoskeletal involvement or a chest involvement in patients of rheumatology, it remains the most common modality that we come across. The low cost and easy availability helps definitely, but it shows a limited usefulness in evaluation of specific types of ILDs. Let us look at examples by looking at these radiographs. The first radiograph at the top shows areas of reticulations, as well as some ground glass-like haze. In addition, there is cardiomegaly and filling up of the pulmonary bay. So it would suggest that there is an interstitial process going on, whereas the radiograph at the bottom, in addition to these findings, show an area of consolidation with a suggestion of breakdown in the left suprahilar location. Let us look at what the CTs of these patients revealed. So these are the CTs at the corresponding similar timings. The first one showed without doubt the possibility of a fibrosing interstitial lung disease by demonstrating subpleural reticulations, cysts, bronchiolectasis, as well as some larger confluent cysts in both the lungs. It also shows the predilection of disease for the subpleural and posterior dependent locations. Whereas when we look at the second radiograph for which the CT was done, 
It reveals peribronchial areas of consolidation with centrilobular nodules with a relatively larger area of consolidation. So this was because of a presence of tuberculosis in a patient of SLE. So that is how radiography kind of builds on which CT would help us in obtaining a specific diagnosis. When we are looking at musculoskeletal indications, the problem arises that we are trying to take a single dimension image of a 3D structure. So because of superimposition of structures as well as poor sensitivity in evaluation of subtle changes or early changes of disease, radiography has definitive limitations. In addition, the first and the foremost changes that is synovial thickening, synovial effusion as well as bone marrow edema, these changes cannot be seen on radiographs and thus it stays as a limitation. In early disease, a radiograph can look absolutely normal or there can be just a suggestion of periarticular osteopenia which can further progress to a relative diffuse osteopenia. More extensive disease is easier to see on radiograph by means of the typical findings in inflammatory arthritis, be it rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, so on and so forth, and presence of deformities and typical joint destruction changes can also help us in evaluation of bone loss. Similar to the peripheral joints, the central joints, that is the uh, axial skeletal evaluation, is also kind of limited by means of radiography because the changes lag by many years when compared to the modality of choice that is MRI. Still, it is helpful in quantifying bony abnormalities. The second modality that we have is ultrasonography. Ultrasonography is more like an office practice modality and its availability widespread in both teaching as well as non-teaching institute and as an OPD procedure helps in uh, obtaining a immediate diagnosis. There are difficulties and limitations for ultrasound also. There is a definitive learning curve for musculoskeletal ultrasonography. It requires experience, it requires time and it the major limitation is that not all areas of the body are amenable and accessible to an ultrasound evol evaluation. For example, the median and lateral aspects of the metacarpophalangeal joints or the axial skeletals, these are definitely not evaluated as easily as the peripheral skeleton. However, it still remains good for evaluation and aspirations of joint effusions, uh, ultrasound guided injections, and evaluation of tenosynovitis and complications like ganglia. So let us look at a few examples. A normal synovium is seen as a thin hypoechoic layer of high, uh, soft tissue around the, around the bones and the joints. It measures less than 2 millimeters. However, in, 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 in presence of inflammatory arthritis, this soft tissue appears to be more thickened, which if we put a color box, may show presence of internal as well as periarticular uh, vascularity in presence of uh, active disease. In addition to the synovium of the joint, tenosynovial thickening is also very well appreciated on ultrasonography as a hypoechoic line around the tendons. These are the flexor tendons which are showing hypoechoic tenosynovial inflammation. In addition, presence of synovial fluid and synovial effusion also helps us in identifying the abnormalities. Moreover, presence of erosions which are seen as bony irregularities in the outline of the bony contour seen on two planes are suggestive of erosions. There are definitive extra-articular uses of ultrasound. The primary among them are vascular uh, in the form of Doppler evaluations of accelerated atherosclerosis in these patients. Newer modalities like elastography and contrast-enhanced ultrasound have also given a clue to various possibilities like uh, degenerative disease of the tendons, tendon ruptures, fibrosing tendonitis, and adhesive capsulitis. Another important extra-articular use of ultrasound is in lung ultrasound evaluation. Now, this is a relatively newer use of ultrasonography 
where predetermined sites, so there are 10 sites described in the lung ultrasound score. So 10 predetermined sites on both the sides are evaluated in supine as well as sitting position. And the number of B lines are evaluated. In addition, the irregularity of the pleural surface and the shredding of pleura are also evaluated based on which a score of lung ultrasound is obtained. Now, it has been shown by various literature that this lung ultrasound score shows a very good correlation with clinical parameters and as well as the HRCT modified Warwick scores. These are a few examples of the work that was done in our department where we can see this irregular plural line as well as these comet-shaped B lines. These number of B lines are then calculated for the entire to obtain a global score. The next modality is CT. Now, CT is like the workhorse modality, not just for evaluation of musculoskeletal abnormalities, but also for chest evaluation. It is definitely superior to plain radiographs because it has a higher contrast resolution and it has 3D imaging capabilities. Moreover, newer techniques like dual energy CT, microfocal CT, low dose and ultra low dose CT have definite implications in current times. They are the modality of choice in evaluations of fractures, subluxations, along with evaluation based on MRI. Let us look at a few examples of dual energy CT, how it helps in evaluation of gout. So these are the plain images. This is a non-contrast dual energy image of the SI joint, which shows presence of these erosions with a hyperdense material due to gouttophaceous gout. These are the color-coded images, which we obtained from the dual energy data set, which helps in quantifying the disease extent. Another application of dual energy CT has been recently published and it has shown that even in inflammatory arthritis in small joints like uh, PIPs and DIPs, use of dual energy CT with contrast, iodinated contrast, can give us images which help in evaluation of synovial thickening as well as bone marrow edema as given in this image. The next modality as part of CT is the contrast CT evaluation. Now, contrast CT evaluation is done in definitive niche indications like uh, in presence of infections or if there are vascular abnormalities which are suspected. The common findings that we see in vasculitis are vessel wall narrowing, wall thickening, presence of delayed phase enhancement. The only thing is that there is a significant overlap among findings of various vasculitis. Still, the kind of involvement, morphology, and the presence of aneurysms or absence of aneurysms and other associated features like parenchymal involvement, renal involvement, they can help in getting to a correct diagnosis. Another advantage of CT is that the various recon kind of images that we get would be easy to understand the abnormality as can be seen here in a case of renal artery stenosis in a Takayasu disease. So these are other recons, these are coronal recons which can serve as a framework for further evaluation by vascular intervention where this uh, focal narrowing of the renal artery has been opened up and stented to obtain an optimum result. A definitive indication is the CT chest in ILD and infections. Uh, the protocol differs because of the kind of, uh, uh, the kind of um, patient presentation. For evaluation of ILD, it is the IPF protocol that is recommended, that is non-contrast HR, that is high resolution scan with an MA of uh, that is uh, 100 to 240. Uh, the FOV is to include only lungs and the recommended kind of uh, scan is a full inspiratory scan. An expiratory scan is added as and when required to show presence of areas of air trapping which show exaggeration on the expiratory scan. A prone scan can be done to show areas of subtle involvement and to differentiate dependent densities from early ILD like in this case. This looked like early ILD changes but on prone scan it disappeared completely to show that these are actually dependent age-related densities and not true uh, changes of early ILD. 
Reduced dose CTs, they have a definitive indication in follow-up of ILD. However, they are not recommended as the primary um, first line investigation when the first scan is done for uh, extent and uh, pattern evaluation. Let us look at a few more examples. These are two images to show the typical patterns of UIP and NSIP in axial lung window images. These are examples of complications wherein we can see multiple enlarged necrotic lymph nodes in a patient of tuberculosis. This is another example of pulmonary parenchymal tuberculosis where we can see multiple centrolobular areas with areas of consolidation. Now comes the MRI. MRI, because of its superior soft tissue contrast and no ionizing radiation, plays a very important role and it forms the modality of choice in specific conditions, like in musculoskeletal conditions where bone marrow edema and involvement of the synovium in the form of either synovitis or effusion, it forms the modality of choice. However, it has long imaging times, expensive and limited availability. Let us look at a few examples. This is the same radiograph that we saw earlier, a case of early disease, absolutely normal, not even osteopenia. But when we look at the MR images, we can see definitive areas of marrow edema, not only in the along the metacarpophalangeal joints, but also along the various uh, wrist bones. In addition, we can see the synovial proliferation around the metacarpophalangeal joints. These are the sequences. I will not go into the details. Suffice to say that contrast-enhanced images uh, are considered to be the gold standard, but the recent literature suggests that the information provided by the fat-saturated T2-weighted images is as good as contrast-enhanced images. But whenever we are thinking in terms of infections, then yes, contrast-enhanced MRI is the modality of choice. These are a few other examples where we can see erosions on T1 weighted images. This is the T2 stir image, which shows this very beautiful abnormality in the form of synovial hypertrophy along the tenosynovium. And this is an area of enhancement due to the presence of inflammatory panis in a case of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, in the axial skeleton also, MRI helps in evaluation and differentiation between fibrosed chronic changes of sacroiliitis with presence of sclerosis or to differentiate between active synovitis, which can be seen as areas of bone marrow edema as well as synovial effusion as can be seen on these cases. Another very important role of MRI is in distinguishing between inflammatory versus infection, presence of definitive collections, marrow edema, as well as soft tissue involvement of the surrounding musculature are definitive signs that this is actually an infection and not an inflammatory pathology. So which MRI is to be done well? In JRAs, a whole body MR can be done to look for total joint count. However, the absolute evaluation of small joints cannot be done on whole body MR. So that is not indicated. In early diseases, a contrast enhanced MRI, it shows a higher sensitivity. For subtle changes, assessment of destructive bone changes can also be seen on T1-weighted MR images. MR can also demonstrate neural compromise as well as uh, complications in the form of atlanto involvement in uh, inflammatory arthritis. And it forms a additional modality in, with CT. This is an... This is a new uh, indication for MRI, which is the lung MRI. This is part of the work that was done in our center, where uh, various sequences, various MR sequences were compared with the modified Warwick scores as obtained on HRCT. And we found that non-radiation modality like MRI in patients who have an ILD, who have an established diagnosis of pattern of ILD, they show a very similar Warwick scores and very similar findings in terms of honeycombing as well as ground glass opacities on various MR sequences. So these are examples from a 42-year-old lady who has systemic sclerosis, where the CT demonstrates ground glass opacities and microcysts, and similar changes can be seen in MRI as well. Yeah, this is the last two slides, sorry. Uh, this is uh, MR angiography representative slides. Uh, I would just like to say that there are two kinds of MR angiography, non-contrast as well as contrast. What we need to remember is non-contrast MRI can include the almost the entire body 
But when we are looking for contrast MRI, it is essential that because the FOV is limited, so the entire torso and limbs are not evaluated. So what we have to do is split the examination and make it a small parts of series with multiple injections of contrast to obtain a larger area of interest. So if we are interested in evaluating the entire thorax and abdomen, a non-contrast MRI is what we would be, we would be recommending. I would skip over the nuclear medicine slide. Uh, the only advantage is that it gives an overall picture of the abnormality. Uh, the take home message is that we need to understand what we are looking for. If it is early disease, if it is bone marrow edema, or if it is differentiation, then a particular modality has to be weighed against the other so as to achieve the maximum benefit for the patient. Thank you so much for a patient. Thank you so much. Sir, so actually that is what formed the basis of various MR studies. Cellular NSIP on HRCT presents as more ground glass predominant disease, but it has been seen on histopathological analysis that even early fibrosis appears very similar. So early fibrosis can also present as ground glass opacity on an HRCT. And this formed the basis of MR studies where it has been shown that delayed post-contrast enhancement is what differentiates between the two because fibrosis by its very nature leads to a delayed enhancement, whereas an active inflammatory component would lead to an early phase enhancement. So the post-contrast MRI chest that is obtained, it is done in phases. So there is an immediate early post-contrast factor phase followed by a 4 minute and 10 minute post contrast images. So it has been seen that the 10 minute post contrast images are the ones which are correlated with the fibrosing NSI, fibrotic component of the disease. Sir, uh, uh, we are running short of time so we will not take any further questions. So can Thank I you. Uh, person to invite next speaker? Thank please? you so much. Uh, I'm I'm extremely thankful to Survi ma'am for uh, this inform uh, informative talk. Uh, now I invite Dr. Uh, Lalit Dugal sir on stage to deliberate on glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis prevention and management. I request respected chairpersons to kindly introduce Dr. Lalit sir. Thank you, Chairperson. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uma for giving me a topic which I initially I thought was pretty straightforward. However, uh, as, you, as we would see, it turned out to be pretty complex, along with uh, a lot of uh, aband abundant uh, knowledge gaps, as we would uh, see here. And uh, the problem is that there are very few trials which are uh, coming now or guidelines. Perhaps by the end of the year, we'll uh, be seeing more of them. And I would now actually give a simplified uh, kind of an overview of this particular topic, and I hope to keep everybody awake up there. Uh, 
we all know that glucocorticoids are the most uh, prescribed drugs with the most potent immunosuppressive and anti-inflammatory uh, uh, properties. And they are the most common cause of secondary as well as iatrogenic osteoporosis. I think we know what osteoporosis is defined by the WHO classification of a BMD of more than uh, of less than minus 2.5 compared to a normal mean. Uh, the prevalence of use worldwide has been shown in some studies to be 0.5 to 0.9 percent, coming up to 2 percent. And uh, a lot of these patients are on long-term treatment. That means more than or uh, three months at least, with associated problems such as fractures, which are clinical, or maybe diagnosed on radiography. Uh, and out of these, less than 15% are actually on anti resorptive or anti osteoporotic treatment. So you can see the wide gap between what is understood and what is being treated. So it is, uh, like I said, it is less understood, underdiagnosed, and undertreated. The need of the R is awareness and education of the caregivers. Let's start with this story, which will continue all along the talk of a 40 year old uh, premenopausal lady who was diagnosed with a moderately severe lupus with no com comorbidities on hydroxychloroquine along with tapering st uh, steroid dosages from 20 to 2.5. This was the expected dose later on. Now, the questions are do we start anti osteoporosis treatment in this lady? Any additional tests that are needed, for example, DEXA or the FRAC score? Let's briefly run through the pathophysiology of this particular condition. Uh, they are known to induce imbalance in bone modeling, osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. They actually cause uh, what is known as apoptosis of osteoblasts and osteocytes, leading to thinning of the bone, and that leads to an increased fracture risk, which I'm showing here is independent of the BMD. That is important because you can, it, it's important from the treatment point of view where you can start treatment of at a much higher BMD than otherwise in primary osteoporosis. And secondly, because of this, you might need additional tools such as RIPE, which we're going to talk about. The bone loss uh, is maximum in the first few months of uh, uh, treatment and then plateaus off uh, annually. And as we all know, its greatest effects are on the trabecular bone, that is vertebral and, uh, and the vertebral and the femoral neck. The problems are that, you know, uh, a huge lot of patients are on it, and it has been seen that the, the, the vertebral fracture risk is almost three times those uh, on uh, compared to those who are not on any treatment, and about twice the, the hip fracture risk. Long uh, longitudinal studies, large number of longitudinal studies have shown that a dose of 7.5 milligram or more per day is associated with increased vertebral and fracture and hip fracture to the tune of two uh, twice compared to a 2.5 milligram dose. It's not the total, it's not the daily dose, but importantly, the cumulative dose also is very important. More than a one gram dose is also associated with increase in vertebral and hip fracture. When you combine the two, the, um, the, the chances of fracture multiply. Other mechanisms include uh, induced muscle atrophy through the protein synthesis and, and hypocalcemia through the GI and renal absorption, as we all know. Uh, this particular topic is a little controversial, I'm not going to talk about it, disease specific. Now, let us just recapitulate what are the modalities that we use for screening. We all know about the DEXA scan, which gives an idea of the bone mass at both the lumbar uh, bone at the trabecular as well as the uh, cortical bone. The T-score and the Z-score are used uh, uh, depending on the uh, age of the patient, the cutoff being around 40 years. Hip and lumbar spine are used for assessment of uh, fracture risk and monitoring treatment. The peripheral DEXA is not est an established uh, uh, arm, at least as far as uh, uh, GIOP is concerned. Next, we come to FRAX, which is a computer-based algorithm, which uh, is used to pre predict a 10-year osteoporotic fracture in, in patients who are 40 years or older. It can include both BMD and without BMD. Uh, the, uh, if, if the uh, GCs are in a, a fairly decent dose of 7.5, you need to have a multiplication factor. Important thing is if the T-score is between minus 1 to 2.5, then the FRAX score perhaps might help in deciding uh, the treatment. Uh, the problem that it uses only the hip BMD and cannot be and can be used only for untreated patients. Now this is the uh, BMD and the FRAX that is uh, uh, that is shown in our hospital where we combine the two. This picture clearly illustrates and it makes it very simple for us to start or to uh, not to not to give treatment. This is a uh, uh, an online score which can be used very easily <clears throat> when you combine FRAX with BMD. There are certain charts where you can use FRAX without BMD in men and women, where you uh, use what are known as the clinical risk factors uh, that we will discuss. Other modalities such as single energy X-ray absorptiometry, quantitative CT, biochemical markers have less predictive capacity and are not the routine uh, modalities being used uh, for following up or for screening. Trabecular bone score and uh, high resolution peripheral quantitative CT scan could be the new tools for the future. 
This is how we assess, uh, assess fracture risk, again, based on the ACR uh, 2017 guidelines, based on prior osteoporotic fractures, presence or, uh, and the BMD scores, as well as the FRAC scores. Uh, and along with that, the dose of uh, steroids that is being used in patients who are less than 40 years of age. Now, how, the, how do we assess the fracture risk initially? Uh, an ad adult patient, uh, as soon as possible, certainly within six months, you should do what is known as a clinical fracture risk assessment that includes use of glu glu uh, glucocorticoids, presence of any frailty, fractures or falls, uh, systemic conditions such as patients on thyroid or parathyroid disorders, uh, uh, malnutrition, low body weight, and, uh, and, uh, least, and smoking alcohol. Last but not the least, a good clinical examination to elicit tenderness over the spine. So if an adult of less than 40 years with history of osteoporotic fractures and other risk factors, a BMD should be done as early as possible. Adults more than 40 years, a FRAX and a BMD should be done when you're starting patient on steroids. Now let's come to our patient. On the first visit, uh, no anti-osteoporosis treatment was required as, uh, uh, and no DEXA scan was required as, a, as, as the patient had a below fracture risk threshold. Reassessment uh, at uh, 12 months includes, uh, again, the clinical risk, uh, fracture, fracture risk assessment. Patients who are less than 40 years of, of age with moderate or high risk of uh, osteoporotic uh, fracture risk, dose of more than 30 milligram per day, patient who is more than 30 years of age, or a cumulative dose of more than 5 gram would need a BMD 2 to 3 years, if not earlier. Those who have never been treated and are more than 40 years of age would need a FRAX and a BMD. Those on osteoporotic treatment, uh, would would again or with moderate to high risk uh, uh, osteoporotic uh, uh, risk factors would probably need a BMD every two to three years as also those who've completed the tre osteoporotic treatment. Now our patient, what happened to her at six weeks? She had a massive worsening with malar rash, fever, chest pain, a high slid eye, was put on mycophenolate along with prednisolone with 40 milligram per day. A DEXA scan was done which showed osteopenia. The question now is do we start anti-osteoporosis treatment in her? Now, let us look at this uh, chart, which is so beautifully shown from Hoshberg, which I've taken from there, which shows the three uh, lineages that I was talking about. Uh, uh, as far as the osteoblasts and osteocytes are concerned, the most important thing is increasing apoptosis with uh, st uh, steroids. And uh, as far as the osteoclast is concerned, the most important thing is increasing the, uh, the rank L ligand uh, expression. So the first drug that I'm going to talk about, first group, are the bisphosphonate, which inhibits anti uh, osteoclasts, and that, that, that's why they call as anti-resorptive agents. In mice model, they've also been shown to promote osteoblasts and osteocytes. The second are the, the parathyroid derivatives, that is the teriparatide and the newer one called abaloparatide, which uh, increases the osteoblast survival, thereby increasing the strength of the trabecular and the cortical bone. And it acts, acts perhaps through the WNT pathway also. Then uh, is the drug which is now being increasingly used called denosumab, which decreases the expression of rank li uh, ligand. By that we mean that uh, rank ligand is important in the uh, maturation of the primordial uh, stem cell uh, into uh, the osteoclast, and that's where uh, the inhibition of denosumab occurs. Then we talking about calcitonin, not much used, excepting for probably analgesic effects on the spine, at uh, got osteoclastic effects. We have raloxifene, which is an SCRM, uh, which is again not very commonly used, but has got but has got uh, promotes osteoblastic activity and inhibits osteoclasts. And finally, the newer drug, which is now uh, being approved, called as romosozumab, a tongue twister, which is which is actually an anti-sclerosing drug, which helps to increase the WNT pathway, leading to increase in the osteoblastic pathway. So this these are the current treatments which I've just talked about. Oral bisphosphonates reduce fracture risk at both the vertebral and non-vertebral level. IV bisphosphonates, zolidronic acid is found to be superior to residronate and BMD benefits but not in fracture. Teriparatide and denosumab have been found to be uh, effective in reducing the fracture risk both at the vertebral and the hip level and they increase the BMD. Teriparatide is uh, definitely found to be superior to bisphosphonate. And raloxifene I was saying uh, was, can be used in selective cases of postmenopausal women where other therapies couldn't, cannot be used. The new uh, treatment we just talked about, the abaloparatide and remersizumab, these drugs have been found to be uh, uh, superior to, in fact, superior to uh, teriparatide in clinical trials. However, their use in GIOP has not yet been established, approved for uh, postmenopausal osteoporosis. Now, the important question is, where, where would I prevent or treat and with what? Lot of gray areas, no guidelines telling us clearly, excepting perhaps the ACR. We started with uh, our uh, Indian Journal of Rheumatology guidelines in 2011, but you've got no further updates after that. So, but uniformity across guidelines are 
patients needing more than three months of steroids prior fragility fractures irrespective of age sex and gc dose should be started on anti uh, osteoporotic treatment and with a bmd measurement every three to six months first line oral bisphosphonates second line iv bisphosphonates or teriparator and denosumab uh, teriparator and denosumab can be used upfront in patients who got very high risk chances of of uh, of, of, of fracturing and uh, these drugs as per the recent uh, studies and uh, reviews are probably could, uh, going to be the standard of care in, in the future when we have the uh, RCTs coming in. Other characteristics are important such as menopausal status, renal dysfunction, costs and most important the patient preferences to a daily uh, subcut in injection versus maybe a six monthly one. So the patient who needs uh, more than 2.5 milligram per, per day for uh, three months should be on calcium and vitamin D supplements along with, <coughs> like, excuse me, along with lifestyle modifications. Uh, those at low risk need no further treatment. Those at moderately high risk, women of childbearing potential should be given oral bisphosphonates and maybe second, and second line could be teriparatide, not the others. And those who are not of childbearing potential or men more than 50 years, oral bisphosphonates followed by any of these that I've shown. So our patient should be started on anti-resorptive treatment because the daily dose, as we calculate, would be more than 7.5 with an estimated cumulative dose of more than one gram, used longer than three months and, and a low BMD, not osteoporotic. And the choice of this uh, agent to in, our, in her would be an oral uh, bisphosphonate. The final question is, is it possible to stop treatment? At one year, our patient was asymptomatic. At 15 months, she was off prednisolone. Uh, can, can we stop treatment in her? And when can we stop? Preclinical evidence uh, has shown that there is some degree of reversibility due to the recovery of osteoblasts and on discontinuation of the steroids. It is also dependent on long-term impact of steroids on osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Daily and cumulative dose that have been repeatedly stressing are important because they will determine the uh, treatment of anti-osteoporosis treatment to, uh, for on GC discontinuation. The higher the dosages, the longer the time would, would, you, would you take to, to stop the anti-osteoporotic treatment. Studies have, have not studied, have not seen age, sex, and other fracture risks. So this is a, a certain thing which has to be seen for the future. So based on expert opinion and, and in vitro studies, if a cumulative exposure is more than one gram, you can afford to stop treatment after three to six months. More than a gram or approaching five grams up to 18 months, or when the fracture risk is low as determined by the BMD. Primary osteoporosis, you have to continue as per the guidelines of primary osteoporosis treatment. Therefore, in our patient, we could start, stop at six months because she was a younger premenopausal lady, had no other risk factors, though she had a, a, a cumulative dose of uh, probably needing more than one gram. So what are the future goals? We need more tools for patients at risk because even now, both the uh, BMD and the, and the FRAC score do not give a comprehensive picture. We need uh, advances as for a specific potent drugs from, for cost uh, uh, constrained countries such as ours is concerned. We need additional studies to look at the geographical differences, ethnicity, and also certain uh, subgroup of patients who have got variable bone density such as those with low body mass, recent fragility fractures, looking at effect in children which I've not discussed at all because there are very few, uh, lit very lit little literature on it and most of the children who are not uh, osteoporotic would probably be given only calcium and vitamin D and importantly look at fe fetal safety because as, as I had shown, most of these drugs cannot be given uh, when the patient is planning pregnancy. Uh, another thing is that some patients would need bone sparing effects by reducing inflammation. By, what, by that I mean that there's excessive inflammation and the, and the dose of steroids given to these patients would perhaps reduce inflammation more than causing, that, uh, causing damage to the bone. And there are certain steroids uh, such as deflazacort and maybe liposomal prednisolone which are said to be less injurious to the bone. And finally, we need more clarity on when to stop treatment uh, based on the uh, dose-related uh, persistent uh, 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 reduced uh, uh, density in, in these patients after, GC dis after uh, discontinuing uh, glucocorticoids. And perhaps the newer guidelines coming by the end of the year would, would answer some of these questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Take one question.
So you talking about two things. Number one, you're talking about a combination therapy. Uh, well, there have been studies to show that there will be no superiority when you combine, uh, uh, say, uh, a bisphosphonate maybe with a deriparatide versus deriparatide alone. However, uh, another important question which you could have asked was combining denosumab with teriparatide, which a lot of the orthopedic surgeons are doing. Uh, there are no studies in GIOP, but there are some guidelines for primary osteoporosis, so I can't comment on that. The second part was uh, sequential. Well, there has been a very interesting study to uh, suggest that uh, if you're using denosumab over, over a period of four years, Versus when you're using teriparatide initially, followed by denosumab over the next two years, the results on at least of the neck of the uh, femur are much better than combining denosumab after the patient has failed bisphosphonate. It, it makes logical sense because the anti-resorptive effect has already been, been full when you're adding, uh, you know, uh, drugs such as denosumab. And that's why, you know, uh, combining maybe a, a sequential, maybe teriparatide followed by denosumab would be better than either giving bisphosphonate followed by dis, uh, denosumab. Thank you. Uh, I am extremely thankful to our uh, chairpersons and speaker for this enlightening session. Uh, we will proceed to our next panel discussion, which is on the topic inter uh, interstitial lung diseases associated with connective tissue disorders and interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features. For this, I would like to invite panelists on the dais. First, I invite on stage Dr. Priyanka, Associate Professor, Department of Radio Diagnosis, Ames, New Delhi. Next, I invite Dr. Anand Mohan, sir. Dr. Anand is currently HOD of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine, Ames, New Delhi. He has received many honors and awards, including prestigious UK. Commonwealth Fellowship 2008-9 in Chest Medicine at NHS Trust UK. He has numerous international and national research publications and uh, book chapters. Next, I invite Dr. Sunil Atri, sir. Dr. Sunil is Senior Consultant Physician and Rheumatologist, Hindu Rao Hospital and NDMC Medical College, Delhi. Sir has served as President of Delhi Rheumatology Association and has multiple publications in reputed national and international journals. Next, I invite Dr. Avishek Kumar, sir. Dr. Avishek has done his DNB rheumatology from Army Hospital, New Delhi, and is currently working as consultant in the same hospital. He has many publications in uh, national journals and is also author of many book chapters. His most notable publication is on stem cell transplant in syst uh, systemic sclerosis in India. Now I invite uh, Dr. Vimlesh Dhar Pandey, sir, as a moderator for this panel discussion. Um, at outset, I'm thankful to Dr. Uma for asking me to be the moderator. I have a sore throat. Uh, I'm also thankful to Professor Malvia for feeding a lot of questions that I'm going to put up to the panelists by the number of articles he sends early in the morning. So it was the last week's questions that he had sent. One most important thing is that I am thankful to Dr. Tejas Suri. Dr. Anant Mohan had an emergency call from Hyderabad and he had to move to Hyderabad. And he was uh, uh, you know, very sorry, but he said, let me ask Tejas. And Dr. Tejas chipped in at 6.30 PM. Warm welcome to Dr. Tejas Suri. It is not easy uh, to come as a last person towards this meeting. To the audience, I would be posting three questions and that would be, you know, the panelists or yourself can take up these questions at the end of this deliberation. Dr. Uma Kumar has clearly asked to finish me, finish this topic in 30 minutes. So this is the first case, a 52-year-old female who presents to a pulmonologist with dry cough, decreased exercise tolerance. She has 30-pack years of smoking history. She notes some joints in which are painful in the knees and the fingers, and which are four in number. Her PFTs are there. Her HRCT shows UIP pattern. Her CRP is four milligram per liter, and CCP is positive. So what do you consider? These are the options. We'll be taking up these questions later on. There's another question. Which of the following should be communicated to a patient with RA and a newly diagnosed ILD? 
these are the options we'll take up these options for a female who's black recently diagnosed systemic sclerosis with digital ulcers positive anti tumorous one antibody which of the following should be performed to screen systemic sclerosis associated ild and this is the question these are all relevant because this is what we see in a day to day practice may i start with dr sunil athri how common is ild in rheumatic musculoskeletal diseases There's another question that I always feel: Is RA ILD a rheumatologist fault? You have been treating a patient of RA, and over the period of time, he develops ILD. do you feel that you are at fault this is the evidence of 10% of the patient and the garden ttd and the thing that you know and then initially they are communicating to most of the time when they visit the neurologist that time it often your that and they are most of the patients are so what do you suggest how we can prevent it or how we can pick up early ild should we just focus in rheumatoid arthritis joint or we should focus beyond joints while we are managing the patients and further uh, gas exchange in the form of dsg you have to look in that part also and various exercise test evaluation 6 minute walk test you have to see and then the patient even uh, the gold standard in cardiopulmonary exercise testing 
So if we come on to the clinical assessment in these patients, the most important thing is the cardinal features in which these patients in history is they are having progressive breathlessness along with persistent non-productive cry. And uh, along with other features of malaise and weakness. So these two important things we have to keep in mind. At times they are and this persists for pretty a long time and uh, maybe some acute presentation when there is associated infections are there. And these patients, the chances of uh, they are having very less chances of hemoptysis. Then coming on to the general physical examination, as we all rheumatologists are aware of various subtle signs which we are supposed to take and it should be percolated among all the physicians that we should look for all those signs in the form of mechanic hand, patient virus, virostomia, then patient have deformities of rheumatoid, aritis, scleritis, Raynaud's phenomena, then puffy fingers, then erythema nodosa, then patient may have patient of palsy along with that classical skin lesion of the sarcoid. So you have to look for all these subtle signs so that you can pick up the patient of CTD and then you can pick up for ILD at the earlier. Then on, as far as the examination is concerned, clubbing is again, it's not a very common feature in CTD associated ILD. Of course, if the patient is having idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, then 30% of the patient, they can have clubbing. Then on examination of the chest, classically, they are having bilateral velcro veils. It could be that it may be variable from person to person, but if you do with electronic stethoscope and when you look at the, uh, on the laptop, that it's again very irregular wave formations and then those can be picked up from the back. And so the important thing is that if you pick all these things in the early stage, in the form that if you are doing the history properly, taking the history, and if you are doing the assessment in the form of pulmonary function test and if you are having a uh, fixed period walk test and HRCT. You can pick the disease much earlier. So what I want to convey is every CTD patient, once we are come across that, you should try to find out interstitial lung disease when they are coming to you in the first time. Thank so you. And what screening is required for at least, uh, at least 12 months. And yeah. if there is any problem in these settings, then it should be repeated every six months. Very clear in your message. The uh, good physician is what is required to pick them early. Dr. Abhishek, controversies again. ILD may be the first manifestation of CTD. How strongly you believe? Some experts believe that the ILD may be the only manif manifestation of CTD. How strongly you believe? And other than systemic sclerosis, none of the connective tissue disease or RA has uh, ILD as a you know classification schemes or diagnosis schemes. So what is the problem there? if CTDs are so common and very important in terms of mortality and morbidity, why are we not putting that as a classification or a diagnostic criteria? First of all, sir, <coughs> our first question is that uh, ILD may be the first manifestation that sir has already told that around 20% of the patient they will have uh, ILD as the first manifestation. And if we go through the literature and you see those uh, articles from the respiratory journals, when they have evaluated ILD and they look for the cause of the ILD, around the 15 to 20 percent of the patients, they have later on turned out to be any connective tissue disease. And the next question that some experts believe ILD is the only manifestation that is again uh, that you know quite a controversial thing, because here we have to differentiate between using a classification criteria and a diagnostic criteria. So. Any patient who have an ILD, and I presume by this question that this patient has another serological marker of uh, CTD, but not any other clinical manifestation. So, if you go by this, this patient does not fulfill even the criteria for an undifferentiated connective tissue disease. Patient may fulfill that criteria for uh, uh, other entities which has been you know, slowly evolving like uh, IPAP, CTD, ILD or maybe UCTD, ILD. But for the purpose of diagnosis, possibly yes, you can do that, but not for the purpose of classification. And next piece, like CTD current classification schemes other than system sclerosis, if we see the prevalence of CTD, uh, ILD in CTD, apart in RA, that is around 30-40%. 
and uh, if you see in system, uh, uh, I mean SLE, it is around 2 to 30 percent, and and after SSE, the most common is which will be having uh, ILD is uh, inflammatory myositis, certain. But still, the prevalence is not as high as system sclerosis, and we just see the classification criteria which has been recently been uh, given by EULAR and ACR uh, for inflammatory myositis. Even when they uh, formed this uh, collaboration uh, of multi-speciality collaboration and we were surprised to know that there is not a pulmonologist in that collaboration. And the reason being that, uh, that, that myositis per se and all those clinical features of dermatomyositis and myositis being demonstrated by other means, maybe a biopsy or this, that these two are sufficient enough to give you a diagnosis. That ILD per se does not give you additional advantage in having an increasing the sensitivity or specificity of the criteria. Thank you, Dr. Vishen. And, and that's, that's why we have pulmonologists with us. The ULAR may not have, and we have also a radiologist with us. So, Dr. Tejas, very basic. If you get those CTs, so what are the ILD patterns in musculoskeletal disease that you come across? Uh, does they make any, you know, uh, viewpoints regarding clinical management? And how often should you do HRCT? Baseline after one year or three years to repeat PFTs, ECO, six minute walk test, the pits falls and advantages. When do you do BAL? When do you do ultrasound? And uh, the previous speaker was uh, speaking about the ultrasound of lung. So is it a good modality when Dr. Priyanka can also highlight uh, the usefulness and the important question, when do you want to do histopathology? Because we do not do histopathology. We don't come to you asking for a biopsy. And that must be something which must be irritating you why we do not ask and what we should do uh, that we should improve. And any biomarkers you specifically look that will give a clue to anticipate. Multiple questions you can take one by one. Okay, uh, thank you so much for these questions and let's take them one by one. So, coming to the first question, the common patterns of ILD in uh, the connective tissue diseases. So, uh, we know that uh, there are several different uh, patterns of ILD which are initially defined histologically, but now there are radiological correlates. So, we have uh, histopath and radiology correlation and based on that we have certain patterns of ILD. Which are uh, different, which are initially defined as idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, but similar patterns are seen. Some of them are seen commonly in connective tissue diseases. So the most common uh, uh, the uh, patterns which we come across in our practice, as uh, Dr. Priyanka Mam can also elucidate, are uh, uh, the NSIP patterns, non, which is non-specific interstitial pneumonia. We also have usual interstitial pneumonia pattern UIP. We have organizing pneumonia pattern and uh, we also have LIP pattern. So these are uh, three or four common patterns which we see in connective tissue diseases. And in fact, uh, the different connective tissue diseases may have uh, different types of uh, histopathological appearances which are more common in that particular CTD. For instance, uh, I would say that overall NSIP may be the most common pattern in uh, connective tissue diseases and particularly in systemic sclerosis. Uh, again, NSIP OP overlap may also be encountered in uh, uh, any of the connective tissue diseases, but commonly in uh, myositis. And then we have uh, RAILD, in which we can have UIP and NSIP both are equally common. And then one particular, uh, one unique pattern uh, in Sjogren syndrome which we get is LIP. So these are the common patterns and. Uh, as far as do we want histopathology to diagnose these patterns, so I'll just skip the second question because uh, the third question is related to what I was talking to. So uh, basically when you have a defined CTD in a patient, we know the CTD is diagnosed, the criteria are fulfilled, then we usually do not need a histopathology for the diagnosis of IOD. However, uh, as had been mentioned that can uh, CTD, can lung involvement be the only manifestation of CTD. So this is a million dollar question, but then to, we don't have an answer for that, but we are trying to find an answer for that. So we have a new, uh, not new now, but in 2015 we had a new criteria called IFAB, uh, which is interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features. 
in that particular situation often we do end up doing histopathology because here we don't have a defined CTD and we have many differential diagnoses. In fact, histopathology may give us a clue that it may be uh, uh, connected to CTD. I would agree with Tejas. Uh, one point I want to highlight here is that histopathology may not be required in this particular subset of patients of CTD because radiologically there are several studies and the recent most study was by Chang et al in our radiology journal where they have shown the correlation between the radiological features and with histopathology in idiopathic ILDs at least which uh, correlated up to 90%. So most of the histopathological correlates are uh, visible non-invisibly on radiology. So maybe that's why the histopathology is uh, very rarely done in this subset of patients. Also, as we interpret the CTs uh, upfront when we see a pattern, say UIP, it is. And even in the uh, radiological step of interpreting that as UIP, the first step is to rule out a CTD. And then only we tend to reach again looking at the clinical features whether it's smoker or not and all those things to label it ultimately into an idiopathic form. So that's why a pattern uh, once we get uh, there are several features also on CT. I would uh, enumerate three main features on CT which are uh, which have shown a very high predictive value for those features being associated more likely with the CT DIT and those features are presence of exuberant honeycombing. So by exuberant honeycombing we mean that the involvement is in, of the honeycombing in the lower lobe is seen which is involving more than 70% of that area of fibrosis. So that is called as exuberant honeycombing and this particular feature has shown to be very highly sensitive and specific for a CTD associated ILD of a UIP versus any idiopathic or smoking related ILD. Second feature is the presence of involvement of the upper lobes only in the anterior corner sign. So that is called as the anterior upper lobe sign where we get the involvement of this honeycombing and fibrosis in the upper lobe only in the anterior segments, anterior subpleural regions. So that is one more feature and the third feature is called as straight edge sign. So by straight edge sign that is we mean that the involvement of the ILD suddenly stops at the lateral edge in the lateral parts of the lung parenchyma, the lateral um, segments of the lower lobes and the middle lobes, lateral segments, those are less likely affected by this fibrosis process. So these three features have shown very high sensitivity, specificity and positive likelihood ratios of up to 3.2 to 4 in those studies uh, to predict that this ILD for this feature would represent more of a CTD associated ILD over an idiopathic ILD. So radiology as uh, has also shown, these all features uh, correlate very uh, highly with the uh, um, ILD being uh, secondary to a CTD rather than an idiopathic form. And regarding the patterns, once again, uh, this has highlighted, but I would say that in RA, UIP patterns uh, are more, uh, also UIP versus NSIP in RA has uh, shown us again, um, it has prognostic implications, right? So even if uh, our patient has a UIP, it is bad prognosis as compared to if he has an NSIP pattern. And whereas systemic sclerosis more uh, oftenly shows us the uh, NSIP pattern. And in myopathy, IIN, we uh, get more of NSIP, OP overlap type of patterns more frequently. It brings to another question. So we have a joint count for rheumatoid. So when you see CT, you also have the activity index versus a chronicity index that we usually see in say lupus nephritis, kidney biopsy. So can you uh, give us an information about? We have several uh, scoring systems. By scoring systems, uh, we mean there is a severity score is given and an extent score is given. So in the, like the standard body score which is used in uh, measurement in the CTD ILDs, uh, so by severity score, we measure the abnormality, extent of that abnormality in the given segment of the lung. And we enumerate how many number of segments are affected by that particular abnormality. So that abnormalities are that we take into consideration are crown glass opacities, fibrosis. By fibrosis, we measure the presence of subpleural thickening, we measure the reticulation, presence of traction bronchiectasis, 
those teachers are evaluated uh, individually in those segments and a combined scores are given. That's how uh, severity assessments are done. This is a visual, this, this is a semi-quantitative, like an operator-based uh, subjective assessment of the uh, extent and severity. We do have uh, softwares available now. Uh, there are two uh, major software, this is Caliper software, which is uh, a deep learning based software, which uh, machine learning based software basically, uh, which is applied on the scan and it automatically highlights the regions uh, and calculates the extent and uh, amount of fibrosis upfront and gives us a numerical value of the extent of involvement. These softwares are also available. These are all three third party softwares which have to be incorporated in our tax system for evaluation, uh, a quantitative evaluation, a computer aided method basically. The other softwares are also named like in bio softwares and all, which are all on the, uh, obviously at the investigational stage. One of them is just the caliper, which is come up for the uh, commercial use. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Priyanka. Priyanka. So, so we move forward. forward. So this is for the audience, uh, IPAF-like presentation, and autoantibody present HRCT shows ILD, but there's some amount of nail fold capillary changes, puffy hands, uh, but not skin thickening. And this is how they may progress over a period of time where you can see a lot of changes. And this is what Dr. Priyanka was highlighting, that the disease may develop over a period of time. So the question is, when do you use antifibrotics, especially, uh, you know, we are very good in immunosuppressants, rheumatologists, but we are not as good as using antifibrotics. Dr. Tejas, your viewpoints. When do you want to use antifibrotics? ILD or IPAP in general is treated with glucocorticoid as the first line glucocorticoid or immunosuppressant agent as the first line treatment. Because when we want to treat these patients, our first aim is to have an improvement in their condition. So uh, these drugs at times may help in stabilizing and at times may even improve the condition of the patient and reverse the uh, pathology in some instances. Like organizing pneumonia may improve with immunosuppressant. So coming to antifibrotic, why antifibrotic? Antifibrotic as a drug cannot improve the efficacy, whereas uh, immunosuppression can. Now, uh, we must understand that uh, when we talk about the pathophysiology of connective tissue disease IOD, there is uh, inflammation which is going on, but then there is also uh, aberrant healing with fibrosis. And this fibrosis may be irreversible, is actually usually irreversible. So, uh, this is where uh, the antifibrotics come into the picture. So, we have had the advent of these drugs over the last 10 years, initially in IPS. We know that these uh, drugs are pleiotropic, that is, they have multiple mechanisms of action and they prevent uh, development of fibrosis by acting against uh, platelet derived growth factor, vascular endothelial growth factor, etc., fibroblast growth factor. So basically, these drugs are not as first line in CTD IV unless the patient is already in uh, extensive fibrosis. Rather, these drugs are to be added in a condition known as progressive fibrosing IV, where uh, the disease is born into a situation where the fibrosis is uh, a dominant picture or uh, there is uh, more than, say, a certain degree of fibrosis in the HRCT where so either they can be used alone or they can be used in combination with immunosuppression in such cases. Thank you. To our rheumatologist, do you do an environmental antigen, you know, as a trigger for worsening CTD ILD? And to Dr. Tejas also, your viewpoints. If a patient is a known case of, say, systemic sclerosis ILD, when would you do this test? And so we can start with Dr. Vishek. Actually, sir, there are studies that were uh, used that all those uh, areas where air pollution, pollution is high. high. I mean, autoimmune disorders are found to be more prevalent in the cleaner areas. But exactly in pointing certain things, we don't know what are in the environment. And other things in environment which cause ILD are certain things like drugs and all those things which we can control. Okay, so we have to, can we can have a control or some advices for the patients only on those things which we are conclusively we can say that this is the thing which is going to either precipitate or either it is going to worsen 
But as we know, this even in the battle agencies so of promoter are threatening their smoking and these things are playing an important role. So here again, uh, there is one more important factor which is has been implicated. So, so whatever uh, I mean, known things are there. We have we do screen for that, but uh, other things are still in that at research level. So nothing much we do about that. Thank you. Yes, so uh, I also agree that uh, we do not routinely do these tests in, uh, when we have a definite diagnosis of CTD ID. However, in cases of IPAP where we suspect uh, that hypersensitivity in monitors may be a comorbidity, we may want to go for a ABN or other antigen factor. So, this is the last question to the panel. We will be having a quick news about when do you treat and when do you do not treat when you see a patient of CTD ILD? So, what you know, things you look upon these in the HRCT uh, that makes you, compels you to treat or not treat? Symptoms. The patient is having severe symptoms and six minute walk test is going on in oxygen saturation and uh, then uh, FBC fall is more than 10% and DNC fall is more than 50%. Significant fall is there and the patient is deteriorating and there is more uh, matter happening in the cases they are more than 30 percent and they are falling into more than six years category. Those are the patients that you have to plan for the treatment in this situation. What are Vishay, your view point? Uh, I would say that there are a lot of uh, a few randomized controlled trials only in system gastrosis, not in other diseases, but uh, there are no definitive guidelines. Yeah for treatment decisions. But they into a clinical ILD and subclinical ILD, depending upon the HRCT report. If the patient has a subclinical ILD, it's defined as having a maybe less than 10% of the lung milk involved and normal in the FBC and BLCO. And then you have to look for uh, other features which are predisposed patient to develop IAD. Like in systemic flux, it can be SPL70 uh, antibodies or diffuse cutaneous disease or rapidly pro progressive systemic disease. Then possibly even in these patients, even if the patient has no symptoms, we can choose to treat. And in the other subject, when the patient has clinical IAD, then we should definitely treat all these patients. And so, I think we should treat all patients of CTD ID. When I say we should treat all patients of CTD ID, I mean we need to do certain basic things like smoking cessation, we want to give them vaccinations, prevent infections, etc. But then, if we talk about specifically about drugs, so as we have two broad categories glucocorticoid immunosuppressants as well as antifibrotics. So, the role of glucocorticoid immunosuppressants may be there as we feel. Based on clinical profile, young patient, female patient, rapidly progressive dyspnea or progressive symptoms with uh, documented decline in SCD1 or DLCO or CT picture suggestive of uh, inflammatory IRD with GGO predominant IRD. These are some of the markers which may guide us. So, initial, uh, we may not treat all patients who come with very mild disease. Similarly, if a patient comes straight away with uh, extensive fibrosis, we again may not want to treat with glucocorticoid. We suppose extensive UIP pattern, we may straight away treat with antifibrotics in that case. So uh, we have to have a nuanced approach of about whom to treat and how to treat. So so the the how do you digest? Guess? I was going to ask this question. If I detect a very early form of an IND in a CTD patient in terms of presence of brown glass opacities in the lower zone, will it be treated or not? And extent is like less than 10%. Uh, I just want to say that most of the trials, like the SSP IND trial, they have in fact uh, treated very early IND. However, if the SPC BLCO is all normal, uh, we can uh, observe these patients for a while because some patterns like OP may go into spontaneous remission also. One more thing, uh, yeah. where in the follow up CTs do show progression in terms of formation of reticulations, even though the ground is bad, then we are left with. Actually, the fibrosis element in lot of patients. Whenever we decide not to treat the patient, it is very important that patients should be under careful follow-up. 
So uh, finally, we have to decide the adverse effects of the treatment versus the likely benefit. So if we don't treat, we should monitor them at three months with repeat PFT and plus minus imaging if required. One more, one one more thing I would like to add here is that uh, even if the patient has a sub clinical involvement less than 10 percent of ground glass involved in uh, CT scan, if there is a high risk factor like an anti MDS side antibodies, in those patients they are likely to have you know more prevalence of rapidly progressive ILD, then you go aggressive and treat those patients. Thank you, Dr. Vishay, because that's why I wanted, wanted to, to differentiate, differentiate that, that not ILD, or not all the ILDs are the same, some ILDs are worse. Some ILDs can you know, go on you know, as a slow uh, process. Thank you, panelists, uh, for giving your excellent viewpoints. Thank you once again. Thank you, sir. Moving ahead, I would like to invite chairpersons for next session. First, I invite Dr. Rajiv Gupta, sir, on stage. Sir is currently Head of the Rheumatology and Clinical Immunology in Medanta Hospital, Gurgaon. He, he was among the international reviewers of Kelly's textbook of Rheumatology, 7th edition, and member of International Advisory Board of 20th edition of Davidson textbook, a textbook of Medicine. Next. Raji. Next, I invite Dr. Anu Dabar, ma'am, on stage. She is consultant rheumatologist and uh, consultant rheumatologist in Gitanjali Medical College and Hospital Udaipur. She has done her DM rheumato rheumatology from uh, Jipmer Puducherry. Ma'am, please come on stage. Next, I invite Dr. Shalu Gagneja, ma'am. Presently, she is uh, head and senior consultant department of rheumatology at Primus Super Specialty Hospital, Chanakapuru, New, uh, New Delhi. She has numerous national, national and international journal publications to her credit. Now I invite on stage Dr. S. Karthik sir to deliberate on the topic IgG4 related disease. Dr. Karthik. I request cha respected chairpersons to introduce Dr. Karthik sir. Dr. Karthik is currently working at Army Hospital Research and Research. 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 Uh, it is a difficult disease to diagnose and treat, so we hope at the end we'll have some clearance as to how to manage this disorder. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, at the onset, I would like to uh, thank Professor Uma Kumar and the organizing committee for considering me for this talk on IgG4 related disease. So, over the next uh, 15 minutes, I will be talking in the following heads. This will how the talk will proceed. And uh, it's the disease of the 21st century. The first report of IgG4 related disease came in NEGM in 2001 from a Japanese group which had a few patients with sclerosing pancreatitis or also known as autoimmune pancreatitis type 1 who were found to have raised IgG4 levels. So over a period of uh, in the next decade, it came to be known that a lot of other uh, organ involvements are also there which have got high serum IgG4 uh, levels. And a lot of eponymous uh, diseases like Mikulix, uh, Kutner's tumor, and Riedel's thyroiditis, uh, which were discovered in the previous century, were actually, in fact, uh, IgG4 related disease. And uh, very soon, in a very short period of time, they could actually define what is IgG4 related disease and what is the characteristic features of them. So basically, you need to have one uh, tumefactive mass associated with raised serum levels of IgG4 and tissue infiltration of IgG4 plasma cells. And there is a characteristic histopathology about which I'll be discussing it in detail as we proceed. So a typical patient of IgG4 related disease would be a middle-aged to elderly male 
and we also would have uh, uh, common organs which are involved. These are the lacrimal glands, the major salivary glands, pancreas, and retroperitoneum. Of course, a lot of other organs have also been described, and these are the typical organs which are involved. And uh, there is a male preponderance for these diseases, except for uh, head and neck involvement, where there's a female preponderance, or almost an equal ratio between the males and females. And we have the uh, Indian study by Dr. Duggal from Gangaram, who had actually almost an equal male to female ratio, and the average age was around 40 in their uh, cohort of about 70 patients. So, what are the dysfunctions leading on to the involvement of these structures. So in head and neck region, we got meningeal involvement and we got the varied neurological complications. Uh, depending on the site of involvement, you can have uh, multiple cranial neuropalsies uh, from basilar meningitis. You can have the pituitary involvement with pituitary dysfunction, both anterior and posterior pituitary with endocrine deficiencies. We can have uh, orbit and cavernous sinus involvement with, again, uh, uh, involvement of extraocular muscles and uh, inhibition of extraocular movements and also multiple cranial nerve palsies and proptopsis and orbital pseudotumor. We can have uh, the characteristic in, uh, involvement of lacrimal gland and the salivary glands leading on to the sicca symptoms which are quite prominent in these patients. And you can have sinus and nose involvement with pro quite a destructive process which can resemble uh, GPA or granulomatosis with polyangitis or even malignancy. Then you can have thyroid gland which can grow to enormous proportions and cause pressure symptoms in renal thyroiditis. So in chest and abdomen, you can have uh, constrictive pericarditis, fibrotic pleura. You can have uh, stenosing mediastinitis with all the major vessels uh, and uh, airways compromised because of the involvement, uh, because of extensive fibrosis due to IgG4 related disease. And of course, pancreas is a prototype organ which has been described before and you can have both exocrine deficiencies leading on to weight loss and malnutrition and you can have endocrine pancreatic failure leading on to diabetes. And you can have chronic hepatobiliary failure also. So renal involvement is also well known. You can have a tubular interstitial nephritis type of picture or you can have a membranous glomerular nef nephropathy. And you can have retroperitoneal involvement leading on to hydronephrosis and which can lead to a renal failure due to obstructive uropathy. And you can have a mesentric fibrosis. Again, it's a more of a stenosing uh, uh, kind which has got a chronic abdominal pain. And you can have the uh, iota and the large vessels involved in more of a periiotitis type of fashion and you can lead to aneurysms and inflammatory abdominal and thoracic aneurysms. So before we come to how to diagnose, I would slightly dwell upon IgG4, what is unique about this uh, particular immunoglobulin. So as we all know, immunoglobulins, uh, immunoglobulin G is the most commonest immunoglobulin and uh, it's found in grams, about 6 to 16 grams per liter. And IgG4 is the least common of all the immunoglobulins. We got about points. It's got a wide variation in the general population, a 0.01 to 1.4 milligram per milliliter. Uh, and, uh, but in an individual person, it generally the concentration remains static. So there are few characteristics of IgG4 where uh, in the CH domain, there is a less stimulus of the FC gamma receptor and the complement activation. It doesn't have a classical inflammatory function compared to other immunoglobulins. And uh, as with all immunoglobulins, it is released from plasma cells. One of the characteristics of IgG4 is it can have intra-chain and interchain disulfide bonds between the uh, inside the heavy chain and also between the heavy chains. And it can also bind with constant region or FC-FC uh, region, rather crystallizable region of both uh, heavy chains. Uh, and it can bind with other IgG4 antibodies. And there is something called FAB arm exchange, where you got the antigen binding arm 
So you can have a divalent IgG4 molecule which is reacting to two different antigens. One, the basic problem with this uh, FAB is exchange is that it's not able to form immune complexes. So there is no downward escalation of the inflammatory cascade or the common effects of immunoglobulins which we see. So how, what is the trigger of IgG4 is exactly not known. One is you can have an autoimmune process which is going on. So a lot of uh, targets have been uh, found like uh, carbonic anhydrase, annexin, laminin and all. And they lead to autoantigen presentation and activates the immune system. You can have a molecular mimicry which is going on. Uh, carbonic anhydrase of uh, H. pylori has shown to have similarity with uh, our carbonic anhydrase and this can lead trigger the autoimmune process. And infectious agents can trigger the innate immunity leading on to the activation of a T cell dependent B cell activation leading on to IgG4 process. So by and large, it has uh, been known as a TH2 type of reaction uh, involvement, T e helper cells 2, and they got the prototype cytokines of IL-5, 4, and 13, which triggered the formation of uh, IgE from B cells, and also IgG4 production from B cells. And T regulatory cells, especially follicular T regulatory cells can also produce interleukin-10 and they can lead on to IgG4 production. So finally, what happens is with all this uh, cascade, you will have accumulation of all the plasma cells and some amount of eosinophils leading on to the tumefactic enlargement of the affected organs or sites. And later on, you can have fibrosis and organ dam damage and dysfunction. So there are two ways the T cells help the B cell activation in IgG4 related disease. One is you got a T follicular helper cells predominantly in the lymph nodes and germinal centers where they secrete IL-4 and probably IL-10 also. And they stimulus the B, stimulate the B cell to form uh, IgG4 positive plasma blasts and possibly IgE plasma blasts also. So there is a, a class switch which is happening. And this proliferation of T follicular helper cells and B cell expansion leads to lymphadenopathy or, uh, in IgG4 related disease. And you can have the raised tissue and serum IgG4 and even IgE levels. And you got long living plasma cells which continue to secrete IgG4 and they might be refracted to treatment with rituximab. So another T cell which has to be found to be more uh, contributory to the pathogenesis is activated CD4 E cells, which are of the cytotoxic variety. And they activate the B cell and they also form, uh, the, with the B cell help, they also get activated. And they form, with the help of uh, interleukin 1 beta, TGF beta and interferon, they increase the fibroblast proliferation. And this leads to the fibrotic component of the IgG4 related disease. And of course, the damage which is there. So both the infiltrate is there and the characteristic fibrotic pattern is because of this. So the characteristic pathologic findings are the dense lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate and the obliterative phlebitis, which takes place in IgG4 related disease. And the characteristic fibrotic pattern is the storyform fibrosis or a world-like pattern which is seen in IgG4 related disease. All three might not be present. You might have one, two or three depending on the organ involvement. So characteristic imaging features are you can have a paraventricular soft tissue shadows or soft tissue encasing large vessels like iota. And uh, we have got a classification criteria for IgG4 related disease where we got an entry criteria which specify the characteristic organ. The most important thing is the exclusion criteria where we should know ki when it is not IgG4 related disease. And later on, we go to the inclusion criteria. It's a complicated weighted criteria. I'm not discussing the details. Uh, one more important thing is how important is this measurement of serum IgG4 in these patients? Up to 40% of people can have normal IgG4. Its level increases proportionate to the number of organs which are involved. 
And there's always the tissue serum paradox. You can have a disproportionate increase in the tissue IgG4 levels and serum does not show that much of increase. In case of high IgG4 levels, it can, especially with multi-organ involvement, it can be used as a biomarker. And the fall in IgG4 corresponds to the uh, regression in the disease. And you can have false positives in various other conditions like ankylosative vasculitis, bronchiectasis, and chronic inflammations, even chronic fungal infections. And uh, we, uh, so we cannot use IgG4 to rule in disease or rule out the disease. And we should have the other features of histopathology and the clinical and radiological features. The important thing is when it is not IgG4, when there is fever, there is no objective response to glucocorticoids clinically. And there, generally there are no cytopenias or characteristic autoantibodies in IgG4 related disease like ANCA or uh, ESDNA, anti-Smith uh, are generally not there. And uh, if you got a radiological suspicious of malignancy or a rapid radiological progression, it's a very insidiously progressive disease. So we should think that it's not IgG4 related disease. Massive splenomegaly, again, is not a characteristic of the same. Histology, when you got a predominantly neutrophilic infiltration, any suspicion of malignancy, presence of granulomas, necrotizing vasculitis, prominent necrosis, then we should think, again, before labeling the patient as having IgG4, even if the serum IgG4 levels are very high. Yeah, yeah. I'm just... Uh... Uh, there is a simpler diagnostic criteria which has got clinical radiological features. Uh, serological diagnosis raised IgG4 and we need to have uh, increased proportion of IgG4 uh, plasma cells compared to the IgG4 positive cells, at least more than 40%. So there are various phenotypes. Broadly, we got two major phenotypes, that is the proliferative subtype and fibrotic subtype. Or proliferative is generally seen in glandular and epithelial tissues and fibrotic is generally seen in the retroperitoneum and extra organ involvements. And that is generally has less tissue as well as serum IgG4 level rays that is more refractory to treatment compared to the proliferative subtype. So management is uh, watch, which watchful waiting is not... Uh, common possibility in IgG4 because a lot of damage has already occurred by the time the patient reaches you. Unlike in uh, sarcoidosis, we can have watchful waiting in some people. Early initiation of treatment, glucocorticoids, generally at 0.6 milligram per kilogram per day for four weeks and taper later on at five milligram per week is commonly followed. And if there's no response in those four weeks, uh, then we should rethink our diagnosis. And there is a risk for relapse if you got very high IgG, depending on basic serological, demographical, glucocorticoid, dosage used, involved organs, number of organ involvement, in peripheral blood cells, I just skipped this. And uh, in refractory cases, that is people who initially respond to glucocorticoids, but later on they recur again, there is a role for uh, rituximab and possibly other DMATs, though they have not been found to be as successful as prednisolone. And a lot of uh, supportive care is required for obstructive symptoms which are there or a mass effect which is there because of IgG4 related disease. So this is the future of IgG4 management. Probably it will be a targeted therapy which can target either the cell with the cell markers, basically NAV B cells, plasma cells, and all, or the cytokines secreted by the cells like uh, IL, uh, six inhibitors in tocilizumab or IL-1 beta. And prob the future lies in probably a targeted therapy with uh, uh, different therapies for different phenotypes. So with that, to conclude, it's a tumefactive disease with increased serum and tissue IgG4 levels. It's got a very insidious course. Doesn't progress rapidly, but a lot of damage has already occurred by the time patient re reaches you. You should recognize the phenotype of the patient and they're all steroid responsive. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Great presentation. As we are short of time, we'll not take up questions. We'll go to the next. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. sir. Now, now I invite on stage Dr. Colonel Vinay Kumar Singhal, sir, to deliberate on the topic interpretation of common immunological investigations in rheumatology. 
I request esteemed chairpersons to introduce Dr. Vinay. Good afternoon, everybody. It has been a long day, and I can see fatigue on the faces of many of you. And this topic was supposed to be with Dr. Rajiva, but something conspired between Dr. Rajiva and Dr. Uma, and it came to me. So uh, I try to finish it in time. I think it is an important topic because none of the immunological tests are without false positive and false negative. If we don't interpret them correctly, then we may believe that a person with false positive test actually has a disease and we may treat it wrongly. Similarly, if we have the test is false negative, we may wrongly exclude the disease. So this I'll be discussing uh, following uh, antibodies, rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP, ANA, ENA, complement levels, antiphospholipid antibodies, ANCA, and if time permits, ESR and CRP. Now, rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP can be taken together. Their sensitivity is almost equal. Rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP sensitivity of about 70%, but specificity for CCP is 90 to 96%, very specific, so it is a better test and more expensive test also. Now, if, uh, what if RF and anti-CCP are a positive in a patient who meets the criteria for rheumatoid arthritis? We don't need these tests to diagnose a case. Diagnosis uh, we can make even without these antibodies. But if uh, a patient is meeting the criteria, they have prognostic value. RF and CCP positive means it is more severe disease. They may require more aggressive treatment. It may be an erosive disease if anti-CCP is positive. Now, if the patient doesn't have symptoms, firstly, we should not be doing RF anti-CCP in an asymptomatic patient. But if we do and they come positive, we should never treat them. This may mean that patient is having probably preclinical RA, which, is, which does not require treatment. But at the same time, if both RF is positive as well as anti-CCP is positive, the patient is very likely to develop rheumatoid arthritis later on. Chances may be of the order of 90 to 100 percent. So we should watch him carefully. Now, if patient is asymptomatic, we do rheumatoid factor as a part of body checkup maybe, and it comes strongly positive. Then what do we do? We exclude other causes, which may be like autoimmune disorders. All autoimmune disorders can be RF positive, chronic infections, miscellaneous conditions like malignancy, they can all have rheumatoid factor positive. If we don't find them, then we ignore the rheumatoid factor. That means it is not important. It may be present even in healthy pe people. Now, second antibody is ANA. It is very sensitive test, sensitivity close to 100%. So if it is negative, it is very rare to have SLE. It, mainly for SLE, it is very sensitive. But specificity is low, just about 60%. And weak positive, one in 40, one in 80, we consider weak positive, which have lot, uh, many healthy individuals, 32% here and 15% here, may have weak positive ANA. But strong positive ANA is uncommon. So strong positive is much more important than weak positive. Now, if we do the test in an asymptomatic patient, it should never be done as a part of body checkup, but it is done very often like this, and it may come positive. Then what do we do? If it is low positive, we ignore it. It may be present in many normal individuals. But suppose it is strong positive and patient does not have symptoms. Strong positive, chances of having autoimmune disease are quite high. Then in those cases, if it, then we evaluate for the presence of any underlying autoimmune condition. And if we don't find any condition, then we also look for 
other non rheumatoid conditions like hashimoto grave disease hepatitis etc because these conditions uh, also may have ana positivity now suppose patient uh, may now sometimes to save money many people do ena without doing ana it is quite common to do like this it should not be done why because ena can also be false positive we don't do ana ena may be false positive because the antigen on the slide may get denatured and it may become false positive and we may be misled so always ana should be done before doing ena second ena can be negative even when ana is positive this we know, we all know that ena can be negative and ena can be positive with so many other conditions and even in lupus ena may be negative because ena is much more sensitive than ena now suppose patient has one or two features of systemic connective tissue disease and ana comes positive that means he definitely has some underlying connective tissue disease either either it is undifferentiated connective tissue disease or definite connective tissue disease typically there are six enas enas are extractable nuclear antigens because they could be extracted and earlier there were only six enas nowadays we call we call them sometimes ana profile and we do battery of 10 or 20 tests also in many labs these enas was anti ssa ssb scl70 rnp nt sm and nt jo1 now these we have already evaluated the patient and we know which disease patient is likely to have like even say we suspect systemic sclerosis for diagno diagnosing systemic sclerosis even ana positivity is not a must ana is positive in only 85% cases so before uh, uh, doing ena we already know that patient is likely to be having systemic sclerosis and then we do ena then these investigations have confirmatory importance or prognostic importance now suppose anti centromere and anti centromere antibodies come positive so this confirms our diagnosis and we know that patient will less likely to develop ild and more likely to develop ph similarly anti scl70 positive means more likely to develop uh, ild it can develop ild ph both anti rna polymerase means patient can develop scleroderma renal crisis and then there can be other antibodies like uthrnp pmscl qoth they can be associated with diffuse ild with uh, uh, diffuse scleroderma with ild now suppose patient has features of sjogren syndrome nt ro and la come positive now this can be positive with sjogren as well as subacute cutaneous lupus neonatal lupus and congenital heart block there are three antibodies nt ro 60 antiro 52 and anti la usually all three are present together but what if anti ro 60 it is again 60 kilo dalton protein is positive and anti ro 52 is negative does it mean different it still means that patient may be having sjogren syndrome but alone as anti ro 60 is more common with sle if all three are present it is more likely to be sjogren syndrome if anti la is positive it it can it usually does not happen but sometimes if anti la is positive this doesn't indicate sjogren syndrome it can happen in uh, say liver diseases like uh, uh, chronic biliary cirrhosis etc now coming to anti smith bodies anti uh, rnp antibodies these are always taken together the reason is both these antibodies are for same antigen which are anti spliceosomes Lysosomes are the antigens which supplies the messenger or pre-messenger RNA to messenger RNA. They remove redundant nucleotides from pre-messenger RNA. If they don't remove it, then messenger RNA will be defective and protein synthesis will be defective. Now both are against lysosomes, but if they are under low molecular weight lysosomes, then they are anti-Smith. Then disease will go will go towards SLE. If they are against higher molecular weight lysosomes like 68 to 70 kd then it is u1 rnp it will go towards an mctd it has to be positive in high titer to be called mctd but uh, in sle anti smith is quite specific about 20 30% patients will have it but its specificity is uh, is specific city is there but sensitivity is low now anti ds dna antibodies we all know we do it by elisa positive in 78 to 80% cases specificity is about 70% it's a high titer in active lupus neuritis and its level 
sometimes may fluctuate with disease activity, not always. If the patient during active disease is, has higher level, which comes down with treatment, that means it can be used to measure the activity of the disease. Next are antiphospholipid antibodies. These can be primary, secondary. Uh, secondary can be with associated autoimmune diseases. They can be present with antiphospholipid syndrome fe uh, uh, features or without them. There are three subtypes. Now, here is significance of titer. When we do this, we all know titer has to be more than 1 in 40 GPL or MPL for anti-cardiolipin antibodies. Then only it is significant, low titer can happen with uh, viral infections also. Significance of repeating, all these should be repeated after three months. If after three months they become negative, then it is not antiphospholipid syndrome. It was probably because of viral infections. If two or three are positive, if two are positive, here they are high risk patients. And if only LSE, LSE is positive, that means it is more thrombogenic than alone as anti cardiolipin or beta 2 glycoprotein. If they are positive without symptoms, we usually do not treat them unless some other condition, conditions are there which are thrombogenic, which make the patient more thrombogenic than usual. Next is the complement level. There are three pathways we know, classical pathway, lectin pathway, alternate pathway. Most important is the classical pathway. This is used by all, uh, uh, all systemic rheumatic diseases, vasculitis, etc., mostly by SLE. Now here, uh, this uh, C1Q attaches to the in, uh, immune complex and activates C2, C3, C4. So level of all these, they become low during active disease, active SLE. But uh, uh, sometimes only C4 may be uh, low and C3 may be normal. When this can happen, one, it can happen if C4 deficiency is there. Secondly, in angioedema, when C1Q is low, C3, C4 are activated, but somehow they don't need to form a membrane attack complex. So C, uh, in those conditions, C3 may not fall, but C4 may fall. So in uh, angioedema, only C4 may be low. Lactin pathway is low efficiency. These, uh, C3, uh, in this, uh, C3, C4 usually do not fall. Alternate way pathway, this can be in some patients with SLE can also take, over this, take on this pathway, but it can be in rheumatic fever, post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. They may utilize this pathway. Here, C3 in a way can be self activated and it does not require C4. So, in this, only C3 will be low, C4 will not be low. But most importantly, C3, C4 both will be low in lupus, in many patients, not in all. If uh, during activity, when we see the patient, if they are not low, then they are not correlating and they may not be used for seeing the activity of the disease. Now coming to ANCA. ANCA, this is C-ANCA. This slide is showing C-ANCA, cytoplasmic, and this is perinuclear. This black thing is nucleus, around it is the uh, inflorescence. Here it is in the cytoplasm. C-ANCA corresponds with PR3. This corresponds with MPO. Now, uh, we uh, uh, gold standard for ANCA is ELISA and not the immunofluorescence. Like unlike in SLE, SLE, SLE gold standard is immunofluorescence because that is more sensitive. Here, ELISA is more sensitive, so that is gold standard. And we need to do both the tests, ELISA as well as immunofluorescence, because then the specificity increases. Now. Uh, if ELISA, uh, and these both are positive, and the patient has GPA, then we don't need the biopsy. They are so specific that it will be positive in more than 95% of the patient will have the disease. So biopsy will not be required. If only one is positive, then we need to do the biopsy for confirmation. Uh, ESR and CRP, we all know ESR and CRP main difference is ESR changes slowly. Over a period of weeks, it goes up, and over a period of weeks, it comes down. While CRP changes rapidly. CRP goes up in a matter of few hours, and it comes down in one or two days. So both are uh, um, uh, uh, markers of inflammation, but ESR is much cheaper than CRP. In certain conditions, we may need to do CRP. And what are those conditions like when we suspect infection? Infection 
uh, 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 ESR will not change fast, but CRP may go up and after treatment it may come down fast. So for infection, we may need to do CRP along with ESR. Similarly, in say SLE relapse, in SLE relapse, it is believed that CRP doesn't rise very much. If it rises very much, then it goes in favor of infection, more than five times of normal. And, uh, but again, we must know that none of these things are sacrosanct. In aortoarthritis, we need to do both, ESR and CRP both to see for the activity. And if we need to see the response to treatment, CRP changes faster. If we give steroid pulse in a disease and we want to see whether it is working or not, we do CRP in place of ER, ESR, or we do both of these. If there is extreme elevation of ESR, say more than 100 millimeter, we should suspect these conditions. But if none of them is there, then we just ignore it and repeat it after three months. And if after three months it doesn't come down, we again evaluate the person. But it does not always indicate that person has a serious disease. Sometimes ESR may be raised, it may come down on its own. To conclude, we should know which immunological tests are present in which condition. This is important, but interpret them only in clinical context. Thank you. I've finished before time. Thank you, sir, for such a comprehensive to the topic. I think there's no scientific questions, and we can move on to the next session. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you. First, I invite Dr. Vivek Rana, sir. Dr. Vivek is currently working as consultant in the Department of Medicine at Baba Sahib Ambedkar Hospital, New Delhi. Next, I invite on stage Dr. Kiran Seth, ma'am. She is consultant rheumatologist, Metro Hospital, New, uh, Noida. Next, I invite Dr. Nikhil Gupta, sir. Dr. Nikhil is currently working as Senior Consultant Rheumatologist at Sant Parmanand and Saroj Super Specialty Hospital, Delhi. He has more than 70 publications in various national and, national national and international, international journals. Now, I'd like to invite Dr. Neera Jain, sir, to deliberate on the topic post-COVID systemic autoimmune inflammatory diseases. I request respected chairperson to introduce Dr. Neera, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Professor Dr. Uma Kumar for this uh, kind invitation. It's really a privilege and honor to be speaking at uh, JLN Auditorium of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, which is a dream for everyone in, the, in India, at least. I would also like to thank uh, Professor Dr. Vedh Chaduvedi, sir for uh, sitting here and uh, for encouragement. And uh, any talk in this pandemic can't be finished without talking about COVID, you know. And since this is the last medical talk before Dr. C.S. Yadav takes over, so COVID needs, uh, still COVID needs a lot of attention. And uh, you all will agree that uh, uh, we all are facing a lot of problem in our clinical practice. Patients are presenting with classical lupus symptoms, classical rheumatoid symptom. But the dilemma continues in our mind whether it is, uh, is it a classical lupus, it's a classical rheumatoid, classical SPA, any vasculitis. But since COVID is uh, like in our mind, uh, COVID everyone is asking this question. And even the patient is asking, so uh, thank you chairpersons, I will start my talk now. So as you all know that COVID has caused unprecedented hardship in the 21st century with more than 150 million infections uh, all over the world. And I was just five minutes checking my uh, internet and it's almost 51 crore people have been affected in the uh, world over with 65 lakh deaths. But even uh, rheumatology, though it may be a budding field or uh, uh, is a nascent field, but we are very much concerned about post-COVID issues because various immunological phenomena have been described during the course of the infection and this infection has also triggered autoimmunity and rheumatological illness have been described following resolution of acute infection. This is very important. So what are the key questions in our mind? What is the molecular mechanism behind that uh, triggering autoimmunity? What are the genetic, do we have some genetic predisposing factors? 
are autoimmune or an auto inflammatory response associated with various variant different in sars cov2 and what is the nature of sars cov2 pathogen which is associated with molecular patterns that triggers autoimmunity i will try to answer most of my uh, key questions so we all know that viral infections are known to have a complex relationship with autoimmune diseases especially lupus rheumatoid arthritis sjogren syndrome celiac disease and multiple sclerosis and lot of autoantibodies have been reported in patients with covid-19 in different frequencies especially anti leukemic antibodies which is present in almost you know 35.6% in the uh, literature search so far and anti ro ssa is rheumatoid factor almost 19% lupus anticoagulant and antibodies against interferon so yeah definitely genetic predisposition has been uh, shown which involves human uh, hla polymorphism and some non hla genes as well female gender had a have little predisposition age being more common in reproductive age due to effect of estrogens definite some family history of autoimmune disease leads to trigger of this illness and individual history of autoimmune is definitely a, a strong factor and presence of autoantibodies as such as anti nuclear antibodies so i will just briefly touch upon what happens exactly in sars cov2 if you can see this uh, sars cov2 virus uh, the main receptor which involves is ac angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor so once the virus enters the membrane and touches the ac2 receptor there is a surge of nf kappa beta and nlrp3 uh, antigens and ultimately what leads it leads to over expression of ace over expression and ultimately leading to increase in viral load increase in viral reservoir and which leads to cytokine storm increase in reactive oxygen species tissue damage extra follicular b cell uh, productions and auto antibodies and simultaneously decrease in interferon leads to decrease in antiviral macrophage activity and decrease in nk cell activity which ultimately leads to increase in infection i won't go in detail because paucity of time to ultimately what happens is there is an increase in thrombosis lymphopenia is a main factor transitory decrease in this sentinel uh, effect and this, if you see the last part this once the infection settles down there is an increase of lymphocyte and this is known as immune reconstitution uh, of an unregulated immune response and which is one of the major factor for autoimmunity so what i did was that since uh, this pandemic has been going for 2 years i thought i will search the literature and uh, i found few studies they have searched almost 1900 articles in this study and out of this 90 articles were very relevant and they did put a, a lot of search like vasculitis lupus rheumatoid uh, uh, scleroderma into in the, into the search items and what they found was that every organ involving from top to bottom if you see giant cell arthritis sarcoidosis systemic sclerosis focal aortitis rheumatoid arthritis reactive arthritis everything you name it and it was present in their search uh, items so clinical spectrum of autoimmune related manifestation covid-19 may be divided into organ specific and systemic autoimmune and inflammatory conditions cutaneous vasculitis itps transverse myelitis gbs are more of an organ specific systemic vasculitis multi system in inflammatory syndrome i won't touch into detail about mis i will be restricting to rheumatological illness and sle so if you divide into three different items this uh, on the left hand left hand side panel if you see it's more of vasculitis nk associated vasculitis cutaneous vasculitis iga vasculitis pan polyarthritis nodosa anti gbm disease was more common in musculoskeletal reactive arthritis axial and peripheral sp is rheumatoid arthritis and in uh, ctd is inflammatory myopathy lupus sarcoidosis systemic sclerosis was more of reported so this is the gist of their studies they did and if you see the uh, the the fourth column from the bottom days after covid-19 infection the uh, uh, coming up of autoimmune rheumatic disease even after settling down of infection 3 to 4 weeks later there was a surge in immunological response so what they found was that most common new onset rheumatic disease was vasculitis and arthritis and this we all are facing in our day to day practice and i think everyone will agree with me so i will start one by one what is initial presentation vasculitis initially we started seeing lot of in 2020 early we started seeing lot of patient with acral skin lesions skin veins and lot of covid-19 involved toes were reported the photos were coming on whatsapp what is it what is it then we came to know that is probably covid-19 uh, possibility then cerebral and gi vasculitis maybe dic or a systemic thrombosis was the mechanism for primary vasculitis all vessels small medium and large were mostly reported subsequently in fact in children kawasaki disease was one of the most common vasculitis disease which was encountered in post covid 19 and this is just a one slide about kawasaki disease is this kawasaki disease post covid 19 same as the classical kawasaki disease? no there are some differences 
this classical uh, this covid 19 post kawasaki disease was in more in older patients there was a higher rate of cardiac involvement with myocarditis and pericarditis and many patients went into covid uh, kawasaki disease shock syndrome with macrophage activation lower platelet counts they were more resistant to ivig treatment and they have a lot of initial gi and neurological involvement <clears throat> and the most common vasculitis was anka social vasculitis and all phenotypes of a we were reported and most patient had kidney and lung involvement so whenever there was a patient with covid 19 and kidney injury so you need just need to check the urine analysis and if you find rbc cast or a dysmorphic erythrocyte there should be a strong suspicion of vasculitis and ultimately anca should be done but one thing was very clear that there was less of diffuse alveolar hemorrhage in covid 19 positive patients then there were case reports of cutaneous vasculitis presenting with palpable purpura hemorrhagic bulla or arteriocardial vasculitis large vessel involvement was reported with aortitis and gcs and commonly the thoracic and abdominal aorta was reported the etiology was not clear many cases were reported with iga vasculitis pan and anti gbm disease but one thing was very sure that most cases responded to well to standard immunosuppressive treatment and had resolved or improved on the uh, late, uh, follow up uh, management this is very important articular involvement so there were a lot of cases were reported during the prodromic phase during the active phase and the recovery of sars cov2 infections so what was the mechanism possibly molecular mimicry between some viral lipidopes and the synovial membrane so first in our watch was that what happens in prodromic or an active phase definitely it was a short term limited does not lead to chronic joint involvement and many times they were associated with hepatitis virus parovirus enterovirus rubella and definitely there was some molecular mimicry between viral epitopes and synovial membrane the other scenario was articular symptoms which happened after the resolution of sars cov2 and most of these patient belong to this group and mind it these patient definitely fulfilled the classical classification criteria of rheumatoid arthritis or spondyloarthropathy possibly the ra triggered by the virus probably through the production of rheumatoid factor or anti ccp and definitely induced antibody they differed from the normally found ra was definitely not was not clear the third second group in arthritis was spondyloarthropathies and it is involved this group involving inflammatory rheumatic diseases involving the joint of the axial skeleton even the anthesial involvement peripheral joint and most common and characteristic initial symptom reported in this patient was chronic back pain and in the buttock pain and reactive arthritis uh, in last 3 uh, months i have seen three patients with uh, presentation with reactive arthritis and it was definitely a sterile arthritis that occurred after 1 to 4 weeks of a genito urinary or a gi bacterial infection the mainly it is mono or oligocular arthritis can present as balanitis and they all responded well to nsaids or short courses of steroid or a local intraarticular injections and another important uh, uh, cases reported were was idiopathic inflammatory myopathies myalgia was the most prevalent constitutional symptom reported in literature in almost these 1900 articles searched and muscular injury which was defined as presence of myalgia and a ck of more than 200 was documented in almost 10% of hospitalized patient by covid 19 and increased level of ck was definitely associated with a covid 19 severity and one thing which i observed that inflammatory myopathies happened more in patients who had moderate to severe covid 19 who were more, who were more had the hospitalization rather than mild covid and the clinical spectrum of muscle damage due to sars cov infection varies from asymptomatic ele elevation of ck to a very severe rhabdomyolysis few cases of rhabdomyolysis has been reported in literature and what was the mechanism possibly there was a direct viral muscle invasion maybe immune complex deposition in muscles and there was probably some release of myo myotoxic cytokines and damage was due to homology between probably a viral antigen and a human muscle cell lupus this is like the most talked after uh, disease in uh, patients with covid 19 definitely it was because of induced developed and auto antibodies like ana anti ro ssa and anti phospholipid and they were with presentation was almost similar like a classical lupus fever fatigue arthralgia and in patient with sars cov2 infection thrombocytopenia was little unusual they didn't drop below 1 lakh pleural effusion was detected by chest ct and kidney injury was more associated with severity of illness and management like management didn't differ it was like similar to a standard classical uh, lupus management with uh, methylprednisolone hydroxychloroquine chloroquine even few patients received rituximab during covid cyclophosphamide and plasmapheresis and some reported some even got ivig 
What were the other autoimmune diseases reported? Sarcoidosis, antiphospholipid syndrome, and what was the timing of autoimmune manifestation? This is important for the like postgraduates here. The type of immune-related manifestation could be linked with the severity of COVID uh, infection, and more than 50% of cases of articular disease like RA, SPN, reactive arthritis appeared in patients with mild COVID. And more than 50% of inflammatory myopathy cases occurred in patients with severe and critical COVID-19. And definitely, IIM and SLE presented predominantly during the acute phase of SARS-CoV-2, while the rest presented after the acute phase settled and into the recovery period. And what are the differentiating features and approach to management? The clinical presentation is similar to what occurs with other autoimmune diseases unrelated to COVID. And cases of inflammatory myopathies and lupus were more reported in women. SPA, reactive arthritis, and vasculitis occur more in men. And patients were treated with similar management as their non-COVID counterpart. And I just put a few slides on what happened to the uh, prevalence and clinical outcomes of COVID-19 in patients who already had an autoimmune disease. So this was a big systematic review and just published uh, recently in September 2021 by uh, Akiyama. And see, on the left side of the panel, there is a, there is a, there is a class of patients who had a pre-COVID immune landscape, but they, were, they already had a pre-existing immune-mediated disease. Plus, they were on targeted immunosuppressive therapy. So once they got a COVID-19 infection, so what happened to the COVID-19 severity and what happened to the underlying autoimmune mechanism? So definitely effects of infection on pre-existing immune disease state or a new onset disease was affected. Their autoimmune flares were noted. So why? Because they, they probably acquired newly acquired auto autoantibodies or an immune-mediated disease like MISCC or in GBS. And another, another important entity is long COVID. So uh, this is very important. Probably you had an underlying autoimmune disease, you were on immunosuppressant, then you got COVID. So maybe like both affected each other, probably COVID went haywire or the, your underlying autoimmune disease went haywire. So uh, this study, what they showed that the prevalence of COVID-19 in autoimmune disease was around 0.011%, 0.011%. And those who were on glucocorticoid, they had increased risk of COVID-19 and its severity outcomes. Conventional synthetic DMARs, biologic DMARs, or a targeted synthetic DMARs. Out of these, those who were on conventional synthetic DMARD had a higher chances of COVID-19, and probably some and those patients who were on anti-DNA therapy had a reduced risk of a severe COVID-19 infection. And this slide, I have specifically put what were the immunosuppressant therapy used in COVID-19. Hydroxychloroquine, we all know, had a lot of hype. Colchicine was used, tocilizumab was used, anakindra was used, but no guidelines supported their uh, practice uh, recommendation. And last two slides on COVID, long COVID-19 and rheumatology. This is what we have to face. We are still not sure. I will be finishing two slides last year. The most common or unknown is yet unidentified population symptom who persisted after recovery from both severe and mild COVID-19. So this is very important. Possibly long COVID, the etiology is an end organ damage or a persistent ocular viral infections, or there is an exacerbation of underlying comorbidities like occult autoimmune or autoinflammatory disease state. And probably we still don't know what is the exact mechanism. So can we predict? Yeah, definitely there are some uh, genes which can predict whether you can have a post-COVID-19 post rheumatic illness. So these are few case reports like encarcerated vasculitis after COVID-19. Then there were case reports with rhabdomyolysis, posthumian crescenti glomerulonephritis. Done, 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 ma'am. Yeah, done. I know. So in the nutshell. So in the nutshell, the, uh, it's a new onset uh, rheumatic disease uh, is uh, rare. Very deliberate, very good. No. But I, uh, I like to ask a question, Dr. Neeraj. Yeah. I was working in a COVID-dedicated hospital with 500 patients at the time yeah. it did with us. And we encountered situations where the patients were absolutely doing fine. And next day when you come to the lab, the patient is gone because of thrombosis. Because primarily it is an endotheliitis and yeah. we have a planned thrombosis. So what I want to know is, first of all, you said vasculitis. So is there any time interval which you notice the vasculitis usually occurs after this much time of the, so the, the patient? Yeah, the, that's what the study I quoted, the biggest and study. And how to differentiate? Because, because I, I, have I have seen, seen this uh, uh, thrombogenic potential is there for some around 6 to 12 weeks. So how do, because the treatment is different. So how do we know this patient is going into vasculitis or it's a plan? That's what, what I was trying to... Uh, yeah, like that is very important because very, we lost quite a few patients. Sir, actually, it is, we are still not sure whether they had some I underlying know. autoimmune yeah. disease going on and the COVID just triggered it off. Yeah. We're still not sure or just COVID has per se caused the thrombosis to occur. 
So I think it's a big uh, gray area. Yeah, and I, I think, think probably, uh, maybe Dr. Uma Kumar, who had seen thousands of patients of COVID, may throw some light. But uh, even in, uh, in Gangaram, we had a big uh, COVID-19 ward. And we, we saw a lot of patients and few patients with uh, sudden death. Yeah. So we could, could not, not uh, uh, come across the, what was the cause of sudden death, actually. So probably some cardiac mechanism, cardiac, 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 cardiac uh, no, myocarditis or uh, uh, some endocarditis, probably. Uh, no, uh, what, what I was thinking was we had quite a few slides on vascular lipase. So it is not possible to go in for biopsy and all those things in each and every patient. I, I don't think, think it tells us that maybe here we are in vascular lipase. So in a normal OPD or a normal scenario. We need to keep, keep our eyes open, open whether like okay. we need to follow them, what, what happened actually. So that's why I put a slide on long COVID because yeah, we will be facing for another year or two or three years. Yeah, we are just I'm entering sure the fourth actually. wave also now. So it's just an eye opener for us also. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. 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 And I'm sorry I don't introduce you because there was nothing written <laughs> here. No, but I think everyone knows you. Everyone knows you. Everyone knows you. So you, do, you do not need any introduction. Thank you. Now I call upon Dr. Pio Piazza. Who is the chairman and head of department of orthopedics and joint replacement at Primus Super Specialty Hospital? Who gave his deliberation? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Oma. Thank you, Delhi Rheumatology Association, for invite. And this uh, lecture is basic lecture. And. Uh, Yeah, sure. After working 22 years at Ames, then two years at Gangaram Hospital, now I am working in Primus Hospital. I am president of one association as well. So there is a confusion about the management of rheumatoid arthritis, but I am very clear about it. I have not uh, written demand even to a one patient in my life. So what I feel we need you more than you need us. It is very simple. So it is an integrated teamwork and we are part of that team. About the joint replacement, in Western world it is increasing at the growth rate is around 10%, but in India it is more like 30%, three times more. It is all, these are the all factors. I will not mention in detail because all you are bored since morning. So, but one thing is that uh, this replacement surgery, it is considered to be costly, but it is not costly. It is because it is a one-time expense and you save the recurring cost. If you compare in this HIV management, liver, kidney disease management in this graph, they are very costly. It is one time and your day-to-day -day cost is saved. So, and cross, uh, processes cost is less than one lakh. It is nothing. So, uh, before offering the joint replacement, find out the exact source of pain that is most important. Sometimes we are confused. Knee ke pain hai. It may not be of arthritic origin. It may be because of tendinitis, bursitis, or it might be coming from the hip joint, referred pain, or even from the spine. So find out exact source, then offer him uh, whatever you want. So knee and hip joints, they are most commonly replaced joint because results are excellent. You change the quality of life patient tremendously. And osteoarthritis is the most common cause. And uh, it is really satisfying surgery. It has revolutionized the life of the patient. And about the survival, why it is most popular? More than 90% survival for 20 years. It, is, it means it is a lifetime surgery. And why joints are replaced? Pain is the most common factor for which joints are replaced. Sometimes pain is not much, like uh, quality of life because of stiffness and deformity. Patient cannot lead life in these deformity. So sometimes pain becomes secondary and deformity and stiffness, if these things has affected day-to-day -day life, then joint replacement should be offered. And but in uh, our country is really unique in every aspect. Sometimes patient comes with these gross hip joint damage, but you can see the face of the patient. He is squatting cross. He is not in pain. So do not offer joint replacement to him. And uh, uh, we should try to preserve the uh, joint as much as possible. What I feel natural joint, but it is definitely sometimes they are replaced. And expectation of both the farmers, they are not saying we are India, we are unique country. 
So uh, why inflammatory arthritis is different? Because overall uh, nutrition level of the patient immunity is also compromised. And the tissue uh, like bone and ligament, they are all fragile in the inflammatory arthritis. So when we are operating, we are careful, we are more gentle in hammering the um, component and releasing the soft tissue. So we have to be more careful in your patient. But these patients are more satisfying than the degenerative arthritis patient. Uh, now, once you have decided you have to operate the patient, that uh, precautions you have to take patient to patient. Most of the time, it is same precautions. But rarely, in the unique situation, you uh, patient may need different protocol. Which implant you have to use? About the implant, uh, it is now 15 minutes uh, lecture, not the 20 minutes, okay? So more than 150 types of implant is available in the market. And you can imagine uh, how we might be, or patient might be confused. 150 type ke joint available hai. So only, honestly speaking, one thing is important. Choose any, Indi uh, except Indian implant. I have no faith in Indian biomaterial, frankly speaking. Choose any good implant from the, you know, the which countries. Then it is the surgical skills which matters for the joint replacement. Implant comes secondary and infrastructure, so it should not get infected. Even infrastructure is secondary. I will uh, uh, give an example later on. So uh, now about the fee point about the joint replacement. In a half joint replacement, one uh, medial condyle of uh, tibia and femur, they are replaced. And pro the, basically they are shaved off. What we do and the prosthesis is glued over that. So, but uh, this is not uh, uh, commonly done in India. It uh, results are not good. And in wherever this is a unique compartmental arthritis, we offer them non-operative treatment. Even HTO, high tibial osteotomy is better. So I am not in favor of uni most of the time. Even this meta-analysis says, says the same thing. What is done in total knee replacement? So both condyle, they are shaped off and prosthesis is glued over that. And total hip replacement, the femoral component and acetabular component, uh, both are changed. Uh, now about the total knee replacement, foundation is three most important component. Soft tissue balancing, joint has to be properly balanced. The stiffness of medial and lateral sleep, they have to be equal and anterior and posterior. All three dimensional, all the four direction, joint has to be balanced. That is most important step. Second comes proper bone cuts. Third, proper gluing, cementing. I have seen more big surgeon doing live demonstration surgery. They do good surgery, but they do not give respect to the cementing. If you do not give respect to the cementing, everything is fine. Joint will fail within five years. It will not fail early like two, three years. But if you do it properly, it will last more than 20 years. Uh, so this is how the joint is replaced. Uh, I will not go into the detail. Chal raha hai, uh, video. Nahin. So it is uh, brief about the how we do total knee arthroplasty. As I told you, surgeon is the most important. Then comes the infrastructure. Lastly, the processes. And about uh, it is not the ordinary orthopedic surgeon job. Surgeon has to be dedicated, trained, and skillful, honest as well. That is most important. Sometimes we offer treatment, we offer the processes which is costlier. And we have our motive about the costlier process. It is true in every field. So, uh, and uh, basically results are with lower cost processes, but you are offering high, higher cost. I have seen in practice, I have seen at times even in private practice. So, honesty is also important for the good result. Proper infrastructure and proper patient selection. So this lecture is very close to my heart and I am delivering it for last 15 years. And uh, this highlights the market forces in every field it is there. In orthoplasty, it is very much there. And malpractices, or you can say it is wrong practice just to earn a little more money. And we have uh, this also highlight our unique practice, how we do it differently from the other surgeon. And it is, uh, this is also done by only handful surgeon, what we do. So we do with the mid approach, we do not cut the Q tendon. If you do not cut the Q tendon, 
only five, seven surgeon in the country, they use this approach, not cutting the Q-tendon. If you do not cut Q-tendon, there are two advantages. Patient can do SLR second day, full. Second, tracking of alignment of patella is better. And other thing is that we use cruciate retaining knee. We do preserve PCL, we do not cut, send uh, box cut in the center and do minimum release. If you do minimum release, patient will be happy, natural and confident from the second day of surgery. It is done by only handful surgeon. But most of the surgeon, they do it differently because that is more easier. Our, our practice is little tougher. It needs, you have to work only in 2-3 millimeter where they get more than 5 millimeter space. So you should have good control over your saw. That is most important. So what are the advantages? I, call, I say in my OPD, no need to call physiotherapist at home. Do yourself. We teach them and it is we give in writing on there. If they call themselves, we have no problem. And we do not give any blood to any patient because hardly blood loss is there if you do it differently. And less post-operative symptom, more natural joint and more natural feeling and early recovery. Every other patient go up and down the stair before the discharge. We discharge in four days. As I told you, it is the surgeon which matters most. We have uh, matters most. We have done 218 joint replacement at Leh Ladakh. And each and every joint was successful. There is a queue. Dr. Uma knows that. Long queue over there. Uh, last October, we did 42 joint replacement. We left around 15 joint replacement over there. And uh, this our work has been appreciated in BMJ award nomination. Uh, uh, Ladakh work. We also go to one village in uh, uh, Dasmal. We have done 89 joint replacement and all successful. It means it is the surgical skills which are most important. Other things are secondary, they are important, but quality of surgery most important. So my big no, as I told this, I give this lecture to uh, practice, my big no to all these things, because these things benefit for implant company, hospital and surgeon, not to the patient. So I always speak against my big yes, this is good for the patient. So uh, about the it is uh, about the joint replacement for the patient general it is very satisfying surgery and because more than one million joints they are replaced every year and rarely any complication and uh, overall as I told you it is a lifetime procedure if you do at the age of 50 if you do below the 50 age it can uh, patient may need revision but revision can be done very easily in a skilled hand and there is a no age limit for the surgery. After the skeletal maturity in the young and in elderly, if they are willing to go lead good quality of life and they are fit, it can be offered. And only five days duration patient start from the second day and in three, four days they go for walk up and down stairs and uh, uh, up and down, as I told you. I will, so overall rehabilitation is faster. Why, why we do up and down stairs in three days? Because we preserve the PCL. So other surgeons, they start walking, but they do not allow up and down stairs. So sound practice is also, we never give blood, as I mentioned, because blood loss is minimum, except in bilateral total replacement. How patient is benefited? It is the pain goes, deformity goes, even range of motion improve. And all the activity patient can resume, except high impact activity like these. Uh, it, and these activities have to be avoided. Otherwise, even these activities like swimming, no high impact. Patient go for swimming, hiking, cycling, all these activities are allowed. Sexual activity, once you are comfortable, it can be done usually after four weeks. So there is a uh, uh, few points about the market forces. Uh, we have two minutes. There is a only one letter difference between hype and hope. Only one letter. So many things came with the towering claim. Either they disappear or they withdrawn from the market. It is routine in every field. So it is surveyed thousands of drugs, many interventions, many components. They are useless to the society. Just deliver to earn more money. So it is dollar driven degradation. So about the navigation robo. So these things overall conclusion is cannot replace the surgical skills because there are more than two dozen steps in total knee arthroplasty. These things do only few steps and each and every step is important. 
and it has to be good for the good long term result. These are the various designs. They are hyped, as I mentioned, mobile bearing it with the runaway processes, came with the towering claim, disappeared. Now nobody used it. Uh, gender needs, it is for the female came, uh, company came, but it is also disappeared. For. So these are the overall messages. Management of arthritis is teamwork. Orthopedician has only surgical role. We do not write demand. Rheumatologist had the medical management. Orthopedician should not uh, hesitate to take care of uh, rheumat. I always take care, opinion, and defer them. And orthopedician should try to preserve the joint. Do not offer them uh, early joint replacement. Result are excellent provided. Uh, basically, excellent surgical technique is the secret of success. All designs gives a good result. And be cautious, beware of newer design and hype by market forces. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yadav, for a very deliberate, very good uh, deliberation. I was just wondering, like the initial 15 years, like when the patient is suffering from osteoarthritis, do you think uh, it's the domain of a rheumatologist or the orthopedician or, or hand in hand, like we should manage this the is patient's osteoarthritis? osteoarthritis? Yes. Basically, the thing is that uh, uh, when I sitting in the OPD, I see X-ray, how X-ray is damaged. Then I see the gait of the patient. Sometimes it's a bad gait. So bad gait is not good for the spine as well. And the activity of patient like walking has limited significantly. All these things, once they are correlated, we offer them definitely joint replacement. And patient is above 50. If uh, the role of rheumatologist like in the initial, in, initial uh, uh, osteoarthritis, osteoarthritis can be treated by you and by us as well. But uh, inflammatory, we should not treat them. I am very clear about it. Orthopedic should not treat the inflammatory uh, or degenerative. We can treat both. But sir, like what it uh, seems to be degenerative in the initial phase, but if the correct evaluation is done, sometimes like we find out the other things and become yeah. like one. In one. 11 and it's all uh, that's why I, I mentioned we should not hesitate to take opinion of rheumatologist when we feel something is very very encouraging uh, like sitting here in the August gathering of rheumatologist your last slide was really very encouraging and I think rheumatologists and orthopedicians they really do good uh, you know to the yeah. patients and that is really very important so we both are friends not the yeah. enemy <laughs> 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 from the audience. So I, I think we should call it a day because we have really a very tiring day. Whole day we were sitting in. Thank you, Dr. Yadav. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you, you, thank you everybody. Thank you, Dr. Yadav. Boss Dr. Chaturvedi is sitting there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful discussion. I am thankful to chairpersons for successfully conducting this session. Before formally ending this session, uh, this uh, entire scientific program with vote of thanks, uh, I would like to recite few lines by Ramdhari Singh Dinkar. And uh, I think these are very appropriate for role of doctors during COVID crisis. वसुधा का नेता कौन हुआ भूखंड विजेता कौन हुआ अतुलित अतुलित यश क्रेता कौन हुआ नौ धर्म प्रणेता कौन हुआ जिसने ना कभी आराम किया विघ्नों में रहकर नाम किया नाउ आई कॉल अपन स्टेज डॉक्टर दानवीर सर एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर एम्स रोमेटोलॉजी फॉर प्रेजेंटिंग वोट ऑफ थैंक्स Thank you, Israel. Uh, very good evening to all. Myself, Dr. Danir Badu, would like to express my gratitude to all the esteemed delegates and faculty members to be the participant and contribution for this uh, Rheumatology Update 2022 to make a great success of this event. I extend my gratitude to our chief guest, Dr. Randeep Guleria, to take time out from his busy schedule to grace the event. A special thanks to DRA for providing this opportunity to uh, make this event. I also extend my sincere thanks to pharmaceutical companies which has contributed this and without this it has been, would not have been possible to organize such a big event. 
लास्ट बट नॉट द लीस्ट आई वुड लाइक टू एक्सप्रेस माई ग्रेटिट्यूड टू सपोर्टिंग स्टाफ सच एज लेब स्टाफ ऑफिस स्टाफ ऑडिटोरियम स्टाफ सैनिटेशन स्टाफ प्लीज एक्सेप्ट माई डीपेस्ट थैंक्स थैंक यू i thank all the faculty and delegates and thank you for your patience we have extended our time limit but thank you everybody for participating thank you thank you so much